Section 1 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Marshal Turenne. Henri de la Tour d'Auvergne, Vicomte de Turenne, esteemed after Napoleon, the greatest of French generals, was born September 16, 1611. He was the second son of the Duc de Bouillon, Prince of Sedan, and of Elizabeth of Nassau, daughter of the celebrated William of Orange, to whose courage and talents the Netherlands mainly owed their deliverance from Spain. Both parents being zealous Calvinists, Turenne was, of course, brought up in the same faith. Soon after his father's death, the Duchess sent him, when he was not yet thirteen years old, into the Low Countries to learn the art of war under his uncle, Maurice of Nassau, who commanded the troops of Holland in the protracted struggle between that country and Spain. Maurice held that there was no royal road to military skill, and placed his young relation in the ranks as a volunteer, where for some time he served, enduring all hardships to which the common soldiers were exposed. In his second campaign, he was promoted to the command of a company, which he retained for four years, distinguished by the admirable discipline of his men, by unceasing attention to the due performance of his own duty, and by his eagerness to witness and become thoroughly acquainted with every branch of service. In the year 1630, Family circumstances rendered it expedient that he should return to France, where the court received him with distinction, and invested him with the command of a regiment. Four years elapsed before Turenne had an opportunity of distinguishing himself in the service of his native country. His first laurels were reaped in 1634, at the siege of the strong fortress of Lamotte in Lorraine, where he headed the assault, and, by his skill and bravery, mainly contributed to its success. For this exploit, he was raised, at the early age of 23, to the rank of Maréchal du Camp, the second grade of military rank in France. In the following year, the breaking out of the war between France and Austria opened a wider field of action. Turenne held a subordinate command in the army, which, under the Cardinal de la Valette, marched into Germany to support the Swedes, commanded by the Duke of Weimar. At first, fortune smiled on the Allies, but ere long, scarcity of provisions compelled them to a disastrous retreat over a ruined country in the face of the enemy. On this occasion, the young soldier's ability and disinterestedness were equally conspicuous. He sold his plate and equipage for the use of the army, threw away his baggage to load the wagons with those stragglers who must otherwise have been abandoned, and marched on foot while he gave up his own horse to the relief of one who had fallen, exhausted by hunger and fatigue. These are the acts which win the attachment of soldiers, and Turenne was idolized by his. Our limits will not allow of the relation of those campaigns in which the subject of this memoir filled a subordinate part. In 1637-38, to 38, he again served under La Valette in Flanders and Germany, after which he was made lieutenant general, a rank not previously existing in France. The three following years he was employed in Italy and Savoy, and in 1642 made a campaign in Roussillon, under the eye of Louis XIII. In the spring of 1643 the king died, and in the autumn of the same year, Turenne received from the queen mother and regent, Anne of Austria, a marshal's baton, the appropriate reward of his long and brilliant services. Four years a captain, four a colonel, three Maréchal du Camp, five a lieutenant general, he had served in all stations from the ranks upward, and distinguished himself in them not only by military talent, but by strict honor and trustworthiness, rare virtues in those turbulent times, when men were familiar with civil war, and the great nobility were too powerful to be peaceful subjects. Soon after his promotion he was sent to Germany to collect and reorganize the French army, which had been roughly handled at Dudlingen. It wanted rest, men, and money, and he settled it in good quarters, raised recruits, and pledged his own credit for the necessary sums. The effects of his exertions were soon seen. He arrived in Alsace, December 1643, and in the following May was at the head of 10,000 men, well-armed and equipped, with whom he felt strong enough to attack the imperial army and raise the siege of Fribourg. At that moment, the glory which he hoped for, and was entitled to obtain, as the reward of five months' labor, was snatched from him by the arrival of the celebrated Prince de Condé, at that time Duke d'Anguien, to assume the command. The vexation which Turenne must have felt was increased by the difference of age, for the prince was ten years his junior, and of personal character. Condé was ardent and impetuous, and flushed by his brilliant victory at Rocroy the year before. Turenne, cool, calculating, and cautious, unwearied in preparing a certainty of success beforehand, yet prompt and striking when the decisive moment was come. The difference of their characters was exemplified upon this occasion. Merci, the Austrian commander, had taken up a strong position, which Turenne said could not be forced, but at the same time pointed out the means of turning it. 
Condé differed from him, and the second in command was obliged to submit. On two successive days, two bloody and unsuccessful assaults were made. On the third, Turenne's advice was taken, and on the first demonstration of this change of plan, Mercy retreated. In the following year, ill supplied with everything, and forced to separate his troops widely to obtain subsistence, Turenne was attacked at Mariendal, and worsted by his old antagonist, Mercy. This, his first defeat, he felt severely. Still, he retained his position and was again ready to meet the enemy, when he received positive orders from Mazarin to undertake nothing before the arrival of Condé. Zealous for his country and careless of personal slights, he marched without complaint under the command of his rival, and his magnanimity was rewarded at the Battle of Nordlingen in 1645, where the center and right wing, having failed in their attack, Turenne, with the left wing, broke the enemy's right, and falling on his center and flank, threw it into utter confusion. For this service, he received the most cordial and ample acknowledgments from Condé, both on the field and in his dispatches to the Queen Regent. Soon after, Condé, who was wounded in battle, resigned his command into the hands of Turenne. The following campaigns of 1646, 47, and 48 exhibited a series of successes, by means of which he drove the Duke of Bavaria from his dominions and reduced the emperor to seek for peace. This was concluded at Munster in 1648, and to Turenne's exertions the termination of the Thirty Years' War is mainly to be ascribed. The repose of France was soon broken by civil war. Mazarin's administration, oppressive in all respects, but especially in fiscal matters, had produced no small discontent throughout the country, and especially in Paris, where the Parliament openly espoused the cause of the people against the minister, and was joined by several of the highest nobility, urged by various motives of private interest or personal pique. Among these were the Prince of Conti, the Duc de Longueville, and the Duc de Bouillon. Mazarin, in alarm, endeavored to enlist the ambition of Turenne in his favor by offering the government of Alsace and the hand of his own niece as the price of his adherence to the court. The Viscount, pressed by both parties, avoided declaring his adhesion to either, but he unequivocally expressed his disapprobation of the cardinal's proceedings, and, being superseded in his command, retired peaceably to Holland. There he remained till the Convention of Ruel effected a hollow and insincere reconciliation between the court and one of the jarring parties of which the Fronde was composed. That reconciliation was soon broken by the sudden arrest of Condé, Conti, and the Duc de Longueville. Turenne then threw himself into the arms of the Fronde, and, at the head of 8,000 men, found himself obliged to encounter the royal army, 20,000 strong. In the battle which ensued, he distinguished his personal bravery in several desperate charges, but the disparity was too great, and this defeat of Rettel was of serious consequence to the Fronde party. Convinced at last that his true interests lay rather on the side of the court, then managed by a woman and a priest, where he might be supreme in military matters, than in supporting the cause of an impetuous and self-willed leader, such as Condé, Turenne gladly listened to the overtures of accommodation, and passed over to the support of the regency. The value of his services was soon made evident. Twice, at the head of very inferior troops, he checked Condé in the career of victory, and again compelled him to fight under the walls of Paris, where, in the celebrated Battle of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, the prince and his army narrowly escaped destruction. Finally, he re-established the court at Paris, and compelled Condé to quit the realm. These important events took place in one campaign of six months in 1652. In 1654, he again took the field against his former friend and commander, Condé, who had taken refuge in Spain, and now led a foreign army against his country. The most remarkable operation of the campaign was raising the siege of Era, which the Spaniards had invested, according to the most approved fashion of the day, with a strong double line of circumvallation within which the besieging army was supposed to be securely sheltered against the sallies of the garrison cooped up within, and the efforts of their friends from without. Turenne marched to the relief of the palace. This could only be effected by forcing the enemy's entrenchments, which were accordingly attacked, contrary to the opinion of his own officers, and carried at all points, despite the personal exertions of Condé. The Spaniards were forced to retreat. It is remarkable that Turenne, not long after, was himself defeated in precisely similar circumstances under the walls of Valenciennes, round which he had drawn lines of circumvallation. Once more he found himself in the same position at Dunkirk. On this occasion, he marched out of his lines to meet the enemy, rather than wait, and suffer them to choose their point of attack, and the celebrated Battle of the Dunes, or Sand Hills, ensued, in which he gained a brilliant victory over the best Spanish troops, with Condé at their head. This took place in 1657. Dunkirk and the greater part of Flanders fell into the hands of the French in consequence, and these successes led to the Treaty of the Pyrenees, which terminated the war in 1658. When the war broke out afresh between France and Spain, in 1667, 
Louis XIV made his first campaign under Turenne's guidance and gained possession of nearly the whole of Flanders. In 1672, when Louis resolved to undertake in person the conquest of Holland, he again placed the command under himself in Turenne's hands and disgraced several marshals who refused to receive orders from the Viscount, considering themselves his equals in military rank. How Le Grand Monarch forced the passage of the Rhine when there was no army to oppose him, and conquered city after city till he was stopped by inundations under the walls of Amsterdam, has been said and sung by his flatterers, and need not be repeated here. But after the king had left the army, when the princes of Germany came to the assistance of Holland, and her affairs took a more favorable turn, under the able guidance of the Prince of Orange, a wider field was offered for the display of Turenne's talents. In the campaign of 1673, he drove the elector of Brandenburg, who had come to the assistance of the Dutch, back to Berlin, and compelled him to negotiate for peace. In the same year, he was opposed, for the first time, to the imperial general, Montecuculli, celebrated for his military writings as well as for his exploits in the field. The meeting of these two great generals produced no decisive results. Turenne returned to Paris in the winter, and was received with the most flattering marks of favor. On the approach of spring, he was sent back to take command of the French army in Alsace, which, amounting to no more than 10,000 men, was pressed by a powerful confederation of the troops of the empire, and those of Brandenburg, once again in the field. Turenne set himself to beat the allies in detail before they could form a junction. He passed the Rhine, marched 40 French leagues in four days, and came up with the imperialists under the Duke of Lorraine at Sinsheim. They occupied a strong position, their wings resting on mountains, their center protected by a river and a fortified town. Turenne hesitated. It seemed rash to attack, but a victory was needful before the combination of the two armies should render their force irresistible, and he commanded the best troops of France. The event justified his confidence. Every post was carried sword in hand. The marshal had his horse killed under him and was slightly wounded. To the officers, who crowded round him with congratulations, he replied with one of those short and happy speeches which tell upon an army more than the most labored harangues, With troops like you, gentlemen, a man ought to attack boldly, for he is sure to conquer. The beaten army fell back behind the Neckar, while they effected a junction with the troops of Brandenburg, but they dared attempt nothing further, and left the Palatinate in the quiet possession of Turenne. Under his eye, and, as it appears from his own letters, at his express recommendation as a matter of policy, that wretched country was laid waste to a deplorable extent. That transaction went far beyond the ordinary license of war, and excited general indignation even in that unscrupulous age. It will ever be remembered as a foul stain upon the character of the general who executed, and of the king and minister who ordered or consented to it. Having carried fire and sword through that part of the Palatinate which lay upon the right or German bank of the Rhine, he crossed that river. But the imperial troops, reinforced by the Saxons and Hessians to the amount of 60,000 men, pressed him hard, and it seemed impossible to keep the field against so great a disparity of force, his own troops not amounting to more than 20,000. He retreated into Lorraine, abandoning the fertile plains of Alsace to the enemy, led his army behind the Vosges Mountains, and crossing them by unfrequented routes, surprised the enemy at Colmar, beat him at Mulhausen and Turkheim, and forced him to recross the Rhine. This is esteemed the most brilliant of Turenne's campaigns, and it was conceived and conducted with the greater boldness, being in opposition to the orders of Louvois. I know, he wrote to that minister, in remonstrating, and indeed refusing to follow his directions, I know the strength of the imperialists, their generals, and the country in which we are. I take all upon myself and charge myself with whatever may occur. Returning to Paris at the end of the campaign, his journey through France resembled a triumphal progress. Such was the popular enthusiasm in his favor. Not less flattering was his reception by the king, whose undeviating regard and confidence, undimmed by jealousy or envy, is creditable alike to the monarch and his faithful subject. At this time, Turenne, it is said, had serious thoughts of retiring to a convent, and was induced only by the earnest remonstrances of the king, and his representations of the critical state of France, to resume his command. Returning to the Upper Rhine, he was again opposed to Montecuculli. For two months, the resources and well-matched skill of the rival captains were displayed in a series of marches and countermarches, in which every movement was so well foreseen and guarded against that no opportunity occurred for coming to action with advantage to either side. At last, the art of Turenne appeared to prevail, when, not many minutes after he had expressed the full belief that victory was within his grasp, a cannonball struck him while engaged in reconnoitering the enemy's position, previous to giving battle, and he fell dead from his horse, July 27, 1675. The same shot carried off the arm of St. Hilaire, the commander-in-chief of the artillery. "'Weep not for me,' said the brave soldier to his son. 
it is for that great man that we ought to weep. His subordinates possessed neither the talents requisite to follow up his plans, nor the confidence of the troops, who perceived their hesitation, and were eager to avenge the death of their beloved general. Loose the piebald, so they named Turenne's horse, was the cry, he will lead us on. But those on whom the command devolved thought of anything rather than of attacking the enemy, and after holding a hurried council of war, retreated in all haste across the Rhine. The Swabian peasants let the spot where he fell lie fallow for many years, and carefully preserved a tree under which he had been sitting just before. Strange that the people who had suffered so much at his hands should regard his memory with such respect. The character of Turenne was more remarkable for solidity than for brilliancy. Many generals may have been better qualified to complete a campaign by one decisive blow. Few probably have laid the scheme of a campaign with more judgment, or shown more skill and patience in carrying their plans into effect. And it is remarkable that, contrary to general experience, he became much more enterprising in advanced years than he had been in youth, of that impetuous spirit which sometimes carries men to success where caution would have hesitated and failed, he possessed little. In his earlier years, he seldom ventured to give battle, except where victory was nearly certain, but a course of victory inspired confidence, and trained by long practice to distinguish the difficult from the impossible, he adopted in his later campaigns a bolder style of tactics than had seemed congenial to his original temper. In this respect, he offered a remarkable contrast to his rival in fame, Condé, who, celebrated in early life for the headlong valor, even to rashness, of his enterprises, became in old age prudent almost to timidity. Equally calm in successor and defeat, Turenne was always ready to prosecute the one, or to repair the other, and he carried the same temper into private life, where he was distinguished for the dignity with which he avoided quarrels, under circumstances in which lesser men would have found it hard to do so, without incurring the approach of cowardice. Nor must we pass over his thorough honesty and disinterestedness in pecuniary matters, a quality more rare in a great man than it is now. End of section one. Section two of Great Men and Famous Women, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn, Charles Twelfth of Sweden. Charles Twelfth of Sweden, by General John Mitchell, 1682-1718. Charles Twelfth, against whom it's been made a fault that he carried virtues to extremes, was born at Stockholm on June 27, 1682, during a storm that rived the mighty oak and made the ambitious ocean swell and rage and foam to be exalted with the threatening clouds. Astrologers observed that the star called the lion's heart predominated at his nativity and that the fox was on the decline. Omens and prodigies, well suited to announce the birth of a prince, who was himself a living tempest. Charles' infancy has nothing very remarkable. His education was strictly attended to, and he proved an attentive scholar. He acquired considerable knowledge of history, geography, mathematics, and military sciences, and became perfectly familiar with several languages, though he never, after his ascension to the throne, spoke any but Latin, Swedish, or German. The gallant Charles Stuart, the same who afterward led the king across the Duna, was his instructor in the art of war, and is said to have communicated to the young prince much of the fiery spirit for which he himself was distinguished. In his fifteenth year, Charles ascended the throne, and, contrary to usual assertion, already evinced considerable ability and application to business, though no particular predilection for military affairs, unless his bear-hunting expeditions may be so considered for they were more than faint images of war, being attended with great danger. No arms were used in these encounters. The sportsman was provided only with a single doubly pointed stick and a cast net, like the one perhaps used by ancient gladiators. The object of these fierce combats was to capture and bind the bear, and to carry him in triumph from the scene of action. Charles was, it seems, a great proficient in this dangerous sport. At the age of 18, Charles was obliged to take the field against the four greatest powers of the North. Forced to contend with small means against vastly superior foes, he made genius and courage supply the place of numbers. Heroism was never more nobly displayed 
than by this gallant monarch and his followers. What men could do was done. For nine years he triumphed over constantly augmenting enemies. And when the unconquered lord of pleasure and of pain fell at last, crushed by the weight of masses, fortune more than shared with his innumerable adversaries the honor of his overthrow. It was the Polish campaign of 1703 that Max Emanuel of Wittenberg, then only fourteen years of age, joined Charles. When introduced, the king asked him whether he wished to go to Stockholm for a time or to remain with the army. The prince, of course, preferred the latter. Well then, said Charles, I will bring you up in my own way, and immediately placed the boy, tired as he was from his journey, on horseback, and led him a long and fatiguing ride. From this period to the Battle of Poltawa, Max continued to be his constant companion, shared his dangers, and attended him in all his adventures, many of which border almost on the fabulous. The affectionate kindness evinced by Charles toward his pupil could not be surpassed. When the boy, as sometimes happened, was worn down by sickness and fatigue, the monarch attended him with parental care, and when on one occasion he fell speechless from his horse and his recovery was despaired of, the king never left his couch till he was pronounced out of danger. The adventures they encountered together were endless. On inspecting the regiments before the opening of the campaign of 1706, they rode 500 miles in six days, were never in bed, and hardly ever out of the saddle, and frequently reduced to milk and water as their only nourishment. Alike to Charles was tide or time, moonless midnight or matin prime. Having, on another occasion, lost their road and escort during a stormy night, they arrived in the midst of a tempest before the town of Tusha. Neither calling nor firing brought anyone to the gates. The king at last dismounted and sought for an entrance, while the prince held the horses in the pelting rain. An entrance having at last been discovered, they took possession of a hut in which was a fire. The king threw himself, booted and spurred, on a bundle of straw, and fell fast asleep. The prince, less hardy, took off his boots, filled them with straw, and placed them by the fire. While sleeping, the flame caught and consumed the valuable gambados. The prince was next day obliged to get a pair of peasant's boots, in which he rode about for eight days, a proof that the princely wardrobe was but slenderly furnished. And yet the camp was not without its gaieties either, for while the headquarters were wintering at Rawitz, the town became the scene of great festivities, balls and parties, succeeding each other as rapidly as battles had done before. Charles was usually present, and was always very polite, but made only a short stay, and retired as soon as he could. During the stay of the army in this place, a fire broke out and consumed several houses. The king flew to aid in extinguishing the flames. He ascended to the top of a house that was already on fire, and continued working till the building was sinking under him. He escaped with difficulty, was thrown down by one of the beams, and for a moment believed to be dead. It was discovered two years afterward, says Bardili, that the place was set on fire by an incendiary bribed by Augustus II to slay the king of Sweden in the confusion. And a man actually came forward and denounced himself as the intended assassin, declaring that some unknown power had prevented him from stabbing the king when he got near his person. Charles said the man was mad, and sent him about his business. Napoleon would have sent him before a military commission and had him shot, as he caused the student at Schonburn to be shot. We regret that we cannot give a sufficient account of the Duke of Marlborough's visit to Charles' headquarters at Altrastad, for what Voltaire says on the subject is but an idle fable. That the English general should easily have penetrated the views of the Swedish conqueror, which the latter took no pains to conceal, is sufficiently probable, but that the conversation between two such men should have turned principally on the king's large boots, which, as Voltar says, Charles told Marlborough he had not quitted for seven years, is of course a mere puerility. Besides, we find from Max's memoirs that Charles was not so coarse in his dress as is usual represented, for his clothes were made of fine materials. He always wore a plain blue coat with gilt buttons, buff waistcoat and breeches, a black crepe cravat, and a cocked hat, a waist belt, and a long cut-and-thrust sword. 
He never disfigured himself by the full-bottomed wig of the period, but always wore his own brown hair, combed back from his forehead. His camp bed consisted of blue silk mattress, pillow and coverlid, materials that would have suited even a dandy guardsman. The invasion of Saxony occasioned great uneasiness at Vienna, Charles's arrival being considered alike dangerous to the Catholic states of the empire and to the success of the Grand Alliance. It happened under these unpleasant feelings that at a party the Swedish minister, Count Strahlinghalm, proposed his master's health as a toast. An imperial chamberlain, a Count Zabor, a magnate of Hungary, refused to drink it, declaring that no honest man ought to drink the health of a Turk, the devil, and of a third person. The Swedes struck the offender, and swords were drawn, but the adversaries were of course separated. The ambassador demanded satisfaction for the insult, and Zabor was arrested and sent in irons to Stettin, and delivered up to the Swedes. Charles instantly set him at liberty, simply desiring him to be more guarded in his speeches for the future. The Saxon nobility, Ritterschaff chivalry, have been taxed to aid in defraying the Swedish contributions, applied to Charles, claiming their privilege of exemption from all taxation, except that of furnishing horses for the chivalry engaged in defense of the country. Had the Saxon chivalry, said Charles, acted up to the duties to which they owe their privilege, I should not have been here. The king of Sweden left Saxony and set out on his Russian expedition at the head of 43,000 men. Of these, 8,000 remained in Poland, so that he undertook the march to Moscow with only 35,000, a force amounting to about one-fifteenth part of the army which Napoleon set out on a similar expedition. The Russians followed the same system they afterward employed against the French, retiring and laving waste the country. The difficulties the Swedes had to encounter, in consequence of bad roads and want of provisions, are almost incredible. The soldiers were forced to contend not only against the enemy, but against the localities also. Roads for the advance of the army had to be opened through forest and morasses before the least progress could be made and it often happened that a league a day was the greatest extent of a march gained after immense toil. But nothing checked the adore of these gallant soldiers. The Russians attempted to defend the passage of rivers and swamps that impeded the march of the foe. Their efforts were vain. No superiority of numbers, no strength of position, could arrest the indomitable valor of Charles and his troops. And the actions performed during this march would be deemed absolutely fabulous, were they not recorded on authority which cannot be doubted. During the severe winter of 1709, the army suffered dreadfully from want and cold. When, early in spring, the thaw set in, the whole of those flat countries were overflowed, and long marches had to be made through complete inundations, by which quantities of stores were lost, and the powder greatly damaged. It was, as we now find, in consequence of the losses thus sustained, that Charles accepted Mazeppa's proposal of marching into the Ukraine. Finding his army too much weakened to penetrate further into Russia, and not wishing to fall back upon Livonia, which he thought would look like a retreat and encourage his enemies, he determined to march to the south, and there await the supplies and reinforcements which his generals were to bring up. The loss of the convoy, which General Leeuwenhaupt was conducting to the army, rendered further delay necessary, and obliged the king to undertake the siege of Pultawa in order to gain a firm footing in the country, and to secure the supplies which the place contained. The Swedish battering train was weak, the powder not only bad from having been frequently injured by the wet and dried again, but very scarce besides. Still, courage and energy were making progress when, June 27th, on his very birthday, Charles, in repulsing a sally, was struck by a musket ball that entered his left foot, above the root of the toes, and went out at the heel. The king continued in the field for an hour afterward, giving his orders as usual, but when he retired to his quarters, the leg was so much swelled that the boot had to be cut off, and the wound had so unfavorable an appearance as greatly to alarm the attendants. Charles behaved heroically, as usual. He held his leg to the surgeon with his own hands, 
nor did a single groan escape him during the terrible operation which the cutting away of some of the fractured bones rendered necessary. At one time his life was despaired of, and a general panic seized the army. But though the wound proved decisive of his fate, the unhappy monarch had what may well be termed the misfortune to recover. The foe drew near. The Tsar, well aware of the importance of Pultawa, advanced to his relief with an army of 80,000 men, besides 40,000 irregulars, Kalmuks and Tartars. He brought 150 pieces of artillery along with him, even with this vast superiority, and after the training of a nine years' war, the Russians did not venture to attack the Swedes, but drew closer and closer around them, till they began at last to entrench themselves within a league of the king's camp. Charles' illness gave them but too much leisure. A hostile fortress on one side, a hostile army on the other, nothing but a victory could save the Swedes, and on the morning of the 8th of July, only ten days after Charles had been wounded, they marched out to battle. Their whole army did not commit to 20,000 men, 4,000 of whom were left in the trenches and with the baggage. Their artillery consisted of four field pieces, and their powder was so bad that it did not, as Count Poniatowski and Lewenhop both affirm, throw the musket balls more than 30 yards from the muzzles of the pieces. And yet these brave soldiers balanced fortune even against such overwhelming numbers. Three out of seven Russian redoubts were taken. On the left wing, the cavalry were victorious, and it is really difficult to say what the result would have proved had Charles been able to exert his usual energy and activity. Certain it is that errors were committed, which could not have happened under his immediate command, for the cavalry of the left wing did not follow up their success, and the cavalry of the right wing lost their direction and took no share in the action. The king, who was carried on a litter between two horses, was present in the hottest of the fire, and exerted himself as much as possible for a man in such a situation. A shot broke the litter, and the wounded monarch was for some time left alone on the ground. A life guardman brought him a horse, and he endeavored to rally the yielding troops. The steed was shot under him, and Gierta gave his own, and died the Russian slave. Having assembled and reformed the remnants of his broken host round the forces which had been left for the protection of the baggage, the fainting monarch was placed in Count Piper's carriage and conveyed toward the Turkish frontier. The exertions of the wounded Charles to rally his army at Poltawa contrast singularly with the total want of any such exertion displayed by the unwounded Napoleon at Waterloo. We take this want of exertion for granted, because had any been displayed, the world's echoes would have rung with praise bestowed upon the heroic effort. The first result of the Battle of Pultawa, its ultimate results are only now becoming apparent, was the entire destruction of the Swedish army, the famished and exhausted remains of which were some days afterward obliged to lay down their arms on the banks of the Dnepr, which they had no means of crossing. With this battle, which opens a new era in European history, the history of Charles XII may be said to end for his subsequent career was only a succession of disappointments. His poor and thinly peopled country could not afford him the means of recovery from a single defeat. On his arrival at Bender, the king learned of the death of his sister, the Duchess of Holstein, and he who had calmly supported the loss of his fame and his army yielded to the most impassionate burst of sorrow, and was during four days unable to converse with the most intimate attendants. A proof of how unjust are the accusations of want of feeling so often brought against him. His long stay in Turkey is certainly evidence of obstinacy, or of that pride which could not brook the thought of returning, a vanquished fugitive, to his native land, which had done so much for him, and which his best efforts had failed to protect from unjust violence. In Charles's high and double countenance, it is seen at once that he was endowed with the glance that took their thoughts from others at a single look. He knew the worthlessness of his enemies, and it is doubly galling to the generous and the brave when fortune, in her base fancies, obliges them to succumb to mean and malicious adversaries. And such was the fate of Charles. His defeat was no sooner known than Denmark, Poland, and Saxony again flew to arms. 
Hanover and Prussia joined the unworthy league against the fallen monarch, who had been so dreaded and was therefore so much hated. For Charles had injured no one. He was the aggrieved from first to last. His return to Sweden, the defense of Stralsund, the invasion of Norway, call for no particular attention. He was killed at the siege of Frederick's Hall in Norway on November 30th, 1718, under circumstances that long gave currency to the belief that he had been assassinated. Schott and Bardili positively assert the fact, but we are on this point disposed to agree with Voltaire, who, to save the honor of his countrymen, as positively denies it. After evening service, the king went out as usual to visit the trenches. He was attended by two French engineers, Migret and Sequier. A heavy fire was kept up by the enemy. Near the end of the boya, or zigzag, he kneeled down and leaned against the parapet, looking toward the fortress. As he remained motionless for a long time, someone approached and found him perfectly dead, a ball having entered his right temple and passed through his head. Even in death, the gallant hand had grasped the hilt of his sword, and this probably gave rise to the belief in the murder, which was afterward confirmed by Sequoia's own confession. But this confession was only made while the pretended criminal labored under an attack of brain fever and was retracted as soon as he recovered. Thus fell, in the thirty-sixth year of his age, one of the most extraordinary men that ever acted a part on the great stage of the world. Endowed by nature with a noble person, a frame of adamant, a soul of fire, with high intellectual powers, dauntless bravery, kingly sentiments of honor, and a lofty scorn of all that was mean and little, he became, from the very splendor of these gifts, perhaps one of the most unhappy men of his time. Less highly gifted, he would have been less hated and less envied. Of humbler spirit, he would have been more pliant and might possibly have been more successful. End of section 2. Read by calmdragon.net Section 3 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jennifer Painter. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. John, Duke of Marlborough, by L. Drake, 1650-1722. About noon, on June the 24th, 1650, John Churchill, afterward Duke of Marlborough, was born at Ash in Devonshire. His school days were soon over, for his father, Sir Winston Churchill, having established himself at court soon after the restoration of Charles II, was anxious to introduce his children early into life, and obtained for his son the situation of page of honour to the Duke of York at the same time that his only daughter, Arabella, became maid of honour to the Duchess. While at school, young Churchill had discovered in the library an old book on military subjects. This he read frequently, and conceived such a taste for a martial life that he longed to distinguish himself as a soldier. The Duke of York held frequent reviews of the guards. Churchill had not long been his page, before the Duke noticed his eagerness to be present on these occasions. Pleased with this indication of military ambition, the Duke suddenly inquired one day, "'What can I do for you, Churchill, as a first step to fortune?' The page threw himself on his knees before the Duke. "'I beseech your Royal Highness,' he entreated with clasped hands, "'to honour me with a pair of colours?' "'Well, well!' said the Duke, smiling at the lad's earnestness. I will grant your request by and by. And his young favourite had not long to wait before he got the post for which he had petitioned. The youthful ensign, scarcely fifteen years of age, first embarked for Tangiers, and although his stay was short, yet in the sallies and skirmishes with the Moors, he showed that even now he possessed that courage and ability 
which in after years placed him at the head of all the heroes of his time. Before the year in which he left England had expired, he was again in his native country. He then accompanied the Duke of Monmouth to the continent to assist France against Holland. The Prince of Condé and Marshal Turenne, the greatest generals of that time, commanded the French army, so that Churchill had very favourable opportunities of improving his military talent and genius. A French officer, during the siege of Nimeguen, had failed to retain a post of consequence which he had been appointed to defend. The news of its loss was brought to Turenne. "'I will bet a supper and a dozen of claret,' instantly exclaimed the marshal, "'that my handsome Englishman will recover the post with half the number of men that the officer commanded who lost it. Churchill was dispatched with a small company, and, after a short but desperate struggle, retook the post, won the marshal his wager, and gained for himself the applause and admiration of the whole army. Next year, at the siege of Maastricht, Captain Churchill again distinguished himself. At the head of his own company, he scaled the ramparts and planted the banner of France on the very summit, escaping with a slight wound. Louis the Fourteenth was so highly pleased with his conduct that he thanked him at the head of the army and soon made him lieutenant colonel. The Duke of Monmouth afterward confessed to the king that he was indebted for his life on this occasion to our hero's gallantry and discretion. On his return to England, he was made gentleman of the bedchamber and master of the robes to his earliest patron, the Duke of York. At this period, he was captivated by the beauty of Miss Sarah Jennings, daughter of a gentleman of ancient family and maid of honour to the Duchess. Their marriage took place in 1678. The services Colonel Churchill continued to yield the royal brothers did not pass unrewarded. He was created Baron Churchill of Agmouth in Berwickshire, and a friendship sprung up between Lady Churchill and the Princess afterward Queen, Anne, who, when she married Prince George of Denmark, got her friend appointed Lady of her Bedchamber. The day after James the Second was proclaimed, he made his favourite Lieutenant General. The Battle of Sedgemoor, in which the ill-fated Duke of Monmouth with his rebel army was defeated, was won chiefly by Churchill's courage and decision. Till the closing scene of James's reign, there is little stated of Lord Churchill, although it is known that he used his influence with his royal master to prevent the arbitrary system of government the king endeavoured to introduce. Finding the monarch determined to persist in his encroachments, Lord Churchill felt it his duty, however painful, to go over to the Prince of Orange, by whom he was received with distinguished marks of attention and respect and, two days before his coronation, the prince raised him to the dignity of Earl of Marlborough. The affection the earl still felt toward his late benefactor, the ex-king, led him into a correspondence with him. This being discovered brought the displeasure of King William upon him, and for some time he was deprived of all his appointments. At length, a governor being wanted for the young Duke of Gloucester, son of the Princess Anne, the king, as an earnest of his returning favour, conferred this honour on Marlborough. "'Teach him, my lord,' said His Majesty, "'to be what you are yourself, and he will not want accomplishments.' On the accession of Queen Anne, Marlborough was made Captain General, Master of the Ordnance, and a Knight of the Garter. Soon after, he was sent to Holland to aid the Dutch against the French. He was appointed by them Generalissimo of the Forces, with a salary of £10,000 a year. With his army, he crossed the River Meuse and advanced to the siege of Rheinberg. "'I hope soon to deliver you from these troublesome neighbours," he exclaimed to the Dutch deputies, who accompanied him on a reconnoitring party and had it not been for the timidity of the Dutchman, he would have fulfilled his intentions. He, however, took three towns out of the hands of the French, 
and the campaign ended by the taking of Liège. Marlborough soon returned to England, where the Queen created him Marquis of Blandford and Duke of Marlborough, an honour he reluctantly accepted, and chiefly because it would give him more consideration if again called upon to serve his country abroad. In 1703, the Duke was once more in Flanders, leading operations against the French with his usual success. The celebrated Prince Eugene was appointed his colleague, and the first time these two generals met, they conceived that mutual esteem and confidence which afterward rendered them partners in the same glory. At the head of a noble army, the two generals penetrated into the heart of Germany, driving the elector of Bavaria before them, ere his French allies could join him. It would take too much space to describe all the victories and relate the details of the burning of 300 towns, villages and castles. These stern necessities of war were far from pleasing to Marlborough, who grieved to see the poor people suffering from their master's ambition. The elector shed tears when he heard of these devastations, and offered large sums to prevent military execution on the land. "'The forces of England,' replied the Duke, "'are not come into Bavaria to extort money, "'but to bring its prince to reason and moderation. "'It is in the power of the elector to end the matter at once, "'by coming to a speedy accommodation.' "'But the elector knew that Marshal Tallard, "'with a powerful French army, was approaching,' and buoyed up by expectation, replied, "'Since you have compelled me to draw the sword, "'I have thrown away the scabbard.' Prince Eugene had hastened from the Rhine to join Marlborough with a force of 18,000 men, and reached the plain of Hochstadt by the time Tallard joined the elector. As the prince and Marlborough proceeded to survey the ground, previous to taking up their position, they perceived some squadrons of the enemy at a distance. The two generals mounted the steeple of a church close by and, with their glasses, discovered the quartermasters of the enemy marking out a camp between Blenheim and Lutzingen. Charmed beyond measure, they resolved to give battle before the enemy could strengthen themselves in their new position. Some officers, who knew the strength of the ground selected by the enemy, ventured to remonstrate and to advise that no action should be hazarded. "'I know the dangers of the case,' said Marlborough, who had not made up his mind without due consideration. "'But a battle is absolutely necessary, and as for success, I rely on the hope that the discipline and courage of the troops will make amends for all disadvantages.' Orders being issued for a general engagement, the whole army commenced preparations, with cheerfulness and alacrity. Marlborough showed that he was resolved to conquer or to die in the attempt. Part of the night he passed in prayer, and toward morning received the sacrament. Then, after taking a short sleep, he concerted the arrangements for the action with Prince Eugene, particularly pointing out to the surgeons the proper place for the wounded. The forces of the Duke and the Prince formed an army of 33,500 infantry and 18,400 cavalry. They were opposed by a force of 56,000 men. About six o'clock in the morning, Marlborough and Eugene took their station on a rising ground and, calling all the generals, gave the directions for the attack. The army then marched into the plain and, being formed in order of battle, the chaplains performed service at the head of each regiment. The morning being hazy, the French and Bavarians did not even suspect the approach of their enemies and were completely taken by surprise. A large gun boomed forth the signal for the onset and as great a battle was fought as the memory of man ever heard of. A panic seized the whole of the troops which composed the right of the French army and they fled like a flock of sheep before the victorious English, deaf to the threats and entreaties of their commanders, and without observing whither their flight led them. A body of cavalry, the best and most renowned in the whole army, seized with fear, 
hurried away Marshal Tallard with them in their flight, and, void of all thought, threw themselves by squadrons into the Danube, men and horses, officers and troopers together. Some escaped, but the greater portion, who had sought to avoid an uncertain death on the field of battle and honour, found a certain and shameful death in the river. The poor marshal, after vainly endeavouring to stem this torrent of despair, was obliged to surrender himself a prisoner of war, with several other general officers in his company. The defeat then became complete. Of all the infantry the marshal had brought to the assistance of the elector, only two battalions escaped. Eight and twenty battalions were taken prisoners, and ten were entirely destroyed. The French for many years had never sustained any considerable defeat, and in consequence had looked upon themselves, and had been regarded by other countries, almost as invincible. But now the charm was broken. After the battle, when Marshal Tallard was brought into the Duke's tent, the Marshal exclaimed with emphasis, Your Grace has beaten the best troops in the world. I hope, quickly rejoined the Duke, that you accept the troops which defeated them. The news caused great joy in England, except to a discontented party, who considered that, it would no more weaken the power of the French king than taking a bucket of water out of a river. Marlborough's answer, when he heard this, was, If they will allow me to draw one or two such buckets more, we may then let the river run quietly, and not much apprehend its overflowing and destroying its neighbours. Queen Anne, however, as a monument of victory, commanded a splendid palace to be built for the Duke, at her own expense, to be called Blenheim. It would fill a large volume to relate all the victories of the Duke of Marlborough, none of which, however, exceeded the Battle of Blenheim in importance. One, some years afterward, called the Battle of Malplaquet, was a better contested fight, and perhaps ranks next. In truth, after this battle, France never again ventured to meet Marlborough in the field, at three o'clock in the morning of September the 11th, 1709, the confederated troops, for Eugene, with his army, was still with Marlborough, began to raise their batteries under cover of a thick fog, which lasted till half-past seven. When it cleared away, the armies found themselves close together, each having a perfect view of the other. Marshal Villars commanded the French army. He was adored by his troops, who placed unbounded confidence in him, and as he now rode along their ranks, the air rang with, Long live the king! Long live Marshal Villars! The right wing was commanded by Marshal Boufflers. A discharge of fifty pieces of cannon from the Confederates was the signal for battle, which commenced a little after eight. Each army had between ninety and one hundred thousand men, and the battle raged for some time with unexampled bravery. All the duties of a skilful general were performed by Marlborough, and late in the day the French army left the field in the possession of the Allies, both armies having fought with almost incredible valour. The loss of the French was 14,000 men. The Allies, though victory was on their side, lost nearly 20,000. An officer of distinction in the French army, writing an account of this battle, said, The Eugenes and Marlboroughs ought to be well satisfied with us during that day, since till then they had not met with resistance worthy of them. They may say, with justice, that nothing can stand before them, for what shall be able to stem the rapid course of these two heroes if an army of one hundred thousand of our best troops, posted between two roads, trebly entrenched, and performing their duty as well as brave men could do, were not able to stop them one day. Will you not then own with me that they surpass all the heroes of former ages? With his usual humanity, Marlborough's first care at the close of the action was the relief of the wounded. Three thousand Frenchmen who lay on the field shared his attention with the wounded of his own army, 
and he immediately arranged means for conveying them away. Still, next morning, the day set apart for burying the slain, notwithstanding his care, when riding over the field, he saw among the heaps which covered the plain, not only the numerous bodies of the slain, but of the dying also. Nor did he feel only for the sufferings of his companions in arms. The groans of wounded enemies, and the sight of their mangled limbs, equally awakened his compassion. Learning also that many French officers and soldiers had crept into the neighbouring houses and woods, wounded, and in a miserable condition for want of assistance, he ordered them every possible relief, and dispatched a messenger with a letter to the French marshal, humanely proposing a conference to arrange the means of removing these wretched sufferers. By this humanity, the larger portion of not fewer than 30,000 men, to whose sufferings death would soon have put an end, were saved. The officers gave their word that they would not serve against the Allies till they were regularly exchanged, and the common soldiers were to be considered as prisoners of war, for whom an equal number of Allied troops were to be returned. Many, many battles too numerous to mention were gained by this great commander. When he came back to England, at the peace, he for some time distinguished himself as an able statesman, but incurring the displeasure of the Queen, and that of the party then in power, he found his situation so painful that he determined to leave the country till the course of events should again run in his favour. He left Dover without any honours, as a private passenger in a packet boat. But on it arriving off Ostend, as soon as the townspeople knew that the Duke of Marlborough was on board, they made a salute of all the cannon toward the sea, and when the vessel entered the harbour, they fired three rounds of all the artillery on the ramparts. The people crowded round him, and shed tears at the ingratitude of his nation. Some, full of astonishment at the sight of him, said, his looks, his air, his address, were full as conquering as his sword. Even a Frenchman exclaimed, Though the sight is worth a million to my king, yet I believe he would not, at such a price, have lost the service of so brave a man. Marlborough remained at Aix-la-Chapelle till the death of the Queen. On August the 1st, 1714, the day George I was proclaimed, the Duke and Duchess landed at Dover. Marlborough's reception was truly a contrast to his departure. Now the artillery thundered forth a welcome, while thousands of spectators hailed the return of the voluntary exile. Passing on to London, he was met at Southwark by a large body of the Burgesses, who escorted him into the city, and thence, joined by many of the first merchants, the nobility and gentry, he proceeded to St. James's, amid the joyful acclamations of the crowd, Long live the King! Long live the Duke of Marlborough! Old age had now laid his withering hand on the Duke. For nearly two years he continued to enjoy the favour and confidence of the new King, who, on one occasion, said, Marlborough's retirement would give me as much pain as if a dagger should be plunged in my bosom but he soon was obliged to retreat to Blenheim, where he spent six years of declining life among his family and friends. At length, after a violent attack of palsy, the disease from which he suffered, he lay for several days expecting death. Early in the morning of June the 15th, 1722, he resigned his spirit, with Christian calmness, into the hands of his Creator. The Duke was nearly seventy-three when he died. His remains were interred with every honour in Westminster Abbey, but soon after were taken up and conveyed to the chapel at Blenheim and laid in a magnificent monument which the Duchess had erected for this honourable purpose. End of section three. Section 4 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in May 2021. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Section 4. Prince Eugene of Savoy, by G. P. R. James. 1663-1736 Prince Eugene, the most famed of Austrian generals, was the son of Eugene Maurice of Savoy, by the mother's side Count of Soissons, and of Olympia Mancini, niece of Cardinal Mazarin. His father intrigued and was banished from the court of France, and his mother also quitted Paris not many years after, suspected of many vices of which she was very probably innocent and guilty of a thousand follies which were more strictly scrutinized than her crimes eugene was originally destined for the church and according to a scandalous custom then common in france as well as other catholic countries he obtained several benefices while but a child of which he was eager to divest himself as soon as his mind was capable of discriminating between one profession and another. He seems soon to have felt within himself that ardent desire for military service, which is sometimes a caprice and sometimes an inspiration, but Louis the Fourteenth, at whose court he still remained, positively forbade his throwing off the clerical habit, notwithstanding all the entreaties of the young abbe, and by so doing incurred the enmity of one who inherited from his mother no small faculty of hatred at length various circumstances with which he was in no degree connected brought about a change in the affairs of europe that afforded him an opportunity of escaping from the restraint placed upon his inclinations and of turning the genius they had despised against those who had contemned him France and Austria had long been either secretly or openly at strife, but now the dilapidated state of the German Empire, after tedious and expensive wars, together with the combination of external foes and internal insurrection, threatened the nominal successor of the Roman Caesars with utter destruction. The Hungarians in revolt, joined with the Turkish forces which they had called to their assistance, marched into Germany and laid siege to Vienna. Louis the Fourteenth had hitherto taken care to foment the spirit of insurrection and to aggravate the more pressing dangers of Germany, but at this moment, to cover the encouragement he had held out privately to the rebels, he permitted the nobility of his court to volunteer in defence of Christendom, which the fall of Vienna would have laid open to infidels. A large body of young men set out immediately for Austria, among whom Prince Eugene contrived to effect his departure in secret. The famous but unamiable minister Louvois, when he heard of the young abbe's escape, remarked with a sneer, So much the better, it will be long before he returns. The speech was afterward repeated to Eugene, who replied, I will never return to France but as a conqueror and he kept his word, one of the few instances in which history has been able to record that a rash boast was afterward justified by talents and resolution. On arriving at Vienna, Eugene cast away the gown forever, and his rank instantly procured him a distinguished post near the person of the Duke of Lorraine, then commanding the imperial forces. Shortly after he had joined the army, John Sobieski, the valiant king of Poland, advanced to the assistance of the emperor, and the Turks were forced to raise the siege of the Austrian capital. In the campaign that followed against the infidels, Eugene distinguished himself greatly, both by a sort of light, unthinking courage, and by a degree of skill and judgment which seemed to show that the levity he was somewhat too fond of displaying, though perhaps a confirmed habit from his education in an idle and frivolous court, was no true type of the mind within. It was the empty bubble dancing on the bosom of a deep stream. This was felt by those who surrounded him, and promotion succeeded with astonishing rapidity. 
Before the end of three months he was in command of a regiment of horse. Continual battles, sieges, and skirmishes now inured Eugene to all the hardships and all the dangers of war, and at the same time gave him every opportunity of acquiring a thorough knowledge of his new profession and of obtaining higher and higher grades in the service. In the course of a very few years he had been wounded more than once severely, but at the same time he had aided in the taking of Neuhausel, Witzegrad, Gran, and Buda, was the first who entered sword in hand into the entrenched camp of the Turks at Hersan, and had received a commission as lieutenant general in the Austrian service. The storming of Belgrade was the next great event in which Eugene was called to act, and here, in command of a body of reserve, he attacked the walls, after the first parties had been repulsed, and succeeded in forcing his way into the city. The regiments, which had failed at first, now rallied, and the path being open, the imperial forces poured in in all directions, and Belgrade was taken after a most obstinate defence. Victor Amadeus, Duke of Savoy, was shortly after this persuaded by his cousin Eugene to embrace the interests of the House of Austria, and to enter into the great alliance which had been formed for the purpose of depressing France. The vast power which Louis the Fourteenth had acquired, and the evident disposition he displayed to extend that power to the utmost, had armed the fears of all the monarchs of Europe against him. At the same time, the armies which had conquered for him were dispersed, and the generals who had led them to victory had in most instances fallen into the grave. Perhaps these considerations might lead the Duke of Savoy to withdraw from an alliance which promised little support and eminent danger, but he had soon reason to repent of having done so. Marshal Catina, the best of Louis's living officers, was ordered to act against him. The whole of Piedmont quickly fell into the hands of the French, and on August 18th the Duke was completely defeated by the adverse general. Eugene, who was present, though wounded with a spent ball, covered the retreat of the troops of Savoy, but the battle was nevertheless completely lost and influenced for long the fate of Piedmont. After various campaigns in Italy, where little was effected but a diversion of the French forces from his scene of war in Germany and the Netherlands, Eugene prevailed upon his cousin, the Duke of Savoy, to lead his troops into France and to draw the French army from Italy by carrying the war into their own country. The scheme was a bold one, but it proved most successful, and Embrun, Quillestre, and Gap, having fallen, the allied army under Victor Amadeus and Eugene advanced rapidly into Dauphiny. Terror and consternation spread before them, and in revenge for the devastation committed by the French in the Palatinate, they now ravaged the whole of Dauphiny, burning the villages and hamlets, and laying the cities under heavy contributions. The heart of France was open to the invading army, but, fortunately for that country, a severe illness put a stop to the proceedings of Victor Amadeus. Returning to Turin in haste, he left his army to the command of Prince Eugene, but the Italian generals contrived, by hesitation in their obedience and opposition to his wishes, to defeat Eugene's best schemes, so that he was glad, by a rapid retreat, to bring his army in safety to Savoy. Eugene was now created Field Marshal and received the Order of the Golden Fleece, but his gratification at these marks of approbation was bitterly alloyed by a severe defeat which he suffered near Pignarol, in company with his cousin the Duke of Savoy, who madly engaged the French forces in a position where his own discomfiture was a certain consequence. Few movements of any import took place in Italy for some years after this, in which Eugene was concerned. Victor Amadeus, partly from caprice, partly from fear, withdrew from his alliance with Austria, and, once more, signed a treaty of neutrality with France. The imperial troops, 
unable singly to keep the field against the French, abandoned Savoy, and Eugene, though his efforts had proved unsuccessful, was received at Vienna with the highest distinction. The emperor, probably judging rightly in this instance that the prince had failed from his energies being crippled by a divided power, now gave him the sole command of the army opposed to the Turks in Hungary. Eugene immediately found himself menaced by the whole force of the Turkish Empire, but after some masterly manoeuvres he saved the city of Peter Baradin, on which the Ottoman forces were marching, and then, though with very inferior power, approached the entrenchments of the Grand Vizier at Zuta with the intention of forcing him from his camp. At the very moment, however, that the army had advanced too far to retreat, a courier arrived, bearing the emperor's commands to Eugene, on no account to risk a battle. Eugene's measures were already taken. He put the letter in his pocket, attacked the Turks, defeated them completely, left 20,000 Muslim men dead on the field and 10,000 drowned in the Danube, pursued his victory by burning Sarai and securing the frontier line of fortresses, and then returned to Vienna in expectation of reward and honour. The emperor received him coldly, and before the day was over he was put under arrest for disobedience of order. The clamour, however, of the people, and some feeling of shame in the bosom of the proud, weak Leopold, soon caused him to restore Eugene to his rank, and to send him once more against the Turks. Success, however, did not follow the prince through the succeeding campaign, and before the season brought it naturally to a close, peace had been determined on between Austria and the port. Sometime previous to the period of which we now speak, Louis the Fourteenth had endeavoured to tempt Eugene back to his court by the offer of a marshal's rank in the French army, the government of Champagne, and a considerable yearly pension. Eugene, who felt that, however flattering to himself, the offer originated alone in the selfishness of an ambitious monarch, refused it in terms sufficiently galling to the proud king of France. Nevertheless, after the peace of Westphalia, Villars, who was sent as ambassador to Vienna, is supposed to have been again charged with a mission of the same nature to Eugene. The fact, however, is not only doubtful, but very improbable, from the character of all parties concerned. Eugene was not a man to leave himself the possibility of changing. Louis was not a man meanly to solicit where he had once been refused, and Villars was not a man to undertake a mean commission, even for a king. It is probable that the courtesy which the prince evinced toward Marshal de Villars from a sense of his personal merit, at a time when the haughty court of Vienna was mean enough to treat even an ambassador with cold disrespect, was the sole origin of the report. However that might be, Eugene remained for a length of time at Vienna, filling up his inactivity by trifling with many arts and many enjoyments, till at length the War of the Succession, as it was called, breaking out, he was appointed to the command of the army in Italy. At length, a general engagement took place at Luzara, at which Philip of Spain was present. The forces of the French have been estimated at 40,000. Those of the imperial general did not much exceed one half that number. The battle was long and fierce, and night only terminated the contest. Both parties, of course, claimed the victory. The French sang a te deum, but retreated. The imperial army retained their ground. Nevertheless, the fruits of victory were gathered by the French. Their immense superiority of numbers gave them the power of overrunning the whole country, and the imperial court, either from indolence, heedlessness, or intrigue, failed to take any step to support its arms in Italy, so that all which Eugene had taken sooner or later fell into the enemy's hands, and he himself, disgusted with the neglect he had met with, left his army under the command of another, and set out to see whether he could not procure some reinforcement 
or at least some supply of money to pay or provide for his forces. At Vienna he found good reason to suspect that Count Mansfield, the Minister of War, had by some means been gained to the interest of France. But, in the meanwhile, Eugene was appointed Minister of War, and some time after, in this capacity, proceeded to confer with Marlborough on the united interests of England and Austria. This negotiation was most successful, and here seems to have been concerted the scheme which Marlborough afterward so gloriously pursued for carrying on the war against France on the side of Germany and of thus freeing the empire. In a military point of view, also, Eugene's efforts, though supported by no great army and followed by no great victory, were wise and successful. He foiled the Hungarian rebels in their bold attack upon Vienna, checked them in their progress everywhere, and laid the foundation of their after subjugation. Soon after this, Eugene took the command of the imperial army on the Rhine, and after considerable manoeuvring singly, to prevent the junction of the French army with that of the Duke of Bavaria, finding it impossible, he effected his own junction with the Duke of Marlborough, and shared in the glories of the field of Blenheim. Eugene was here always in the thickest of the fight, yet never for a moment forgot that he was called upon to act as a general rather than a soldier. His operations were planned as clearly and commanded as distinctly in the midst of the hottest conflict, as if no tumult had raged around him and no danger had been near to distract his attention. Yet his horse was killed under him in the early part of the battle, and at one moment a Bavarian dragoon was seen holding him by the coat with one hand while he levelled a pistol at his head with the other. One of the imperialists, however, coming up at the moment, freed his general from this unpleasant situation, and Eugene proceeded to issue his orders without the least sign of discomposure. The following year, Eugene returned to Italy, and once more began the war against Vendôme. Notwithstanding all his skill and activity, however, the superiority of the French numbers and the distinguished military genius of their chief prevented Eugene from meeting with any very brilliant success. He surprised various detachments, relieved several towns, was successful in many skirmishes, but he failed in drawing the French out of Savoy and was totally repulsed in endeavouring to pass the Adda. In the attempt to do so, many men and several valuable officers were lost on both sides. The battle was long and furious. Both Vendôme and Eugene displayed all their skill to foil each other, and perhaps so bravely contested a field was as honourable to each as a great victory. Neither, however, could fairly claim the battle as won, for though Eugene failed in passing the river, the French were the greatest sufferers in the contest, and they did not succeed in compelling the Germans to fly, though they prevented them from advancing to join the Duke of Savoy. Eugene, with his wonted reckless courage, exposed himself more than even was necessary, and in the very commencement of the engagement was wounded severely in the neck, notwithstanding which he remained a considerable length of time on horseback, till a second musket ball, in the knee, forced him to absent himself for a time from the field. These wounds probably decided the failure of his attempt, but they did not prevent him from securing his army a good winter quarters and checking all active operations on the part of Vendôme. The next campaign was more successful. Vendôme, after defeating a body of imperial troops at Calemato, was recalled, and the command of the French forces given to the Duke of Orléans and the Maréchal de Marsin, who, with an army of 80,000 men, invested Turin, the last hold of the Duke of Savoy. Eugene immediately marched to form his junction with the Duke, and no longer opposed by the genius of Vendôme, passed the Adige unattacked, crossed the Tanaro and the Po, joined his cousin near Carmagnola, and advanced to the succour of Turin. The French were dispirited, 
and uncertainty and divided counsels pervaded their camp. On September 7th, the Allied army, with less than half their numerical force, attacked them in their entrenchment, forced their position in every direction, and after one of the severest conflicts ever known, completely defeated them and raised the siege of Turin. The battle, however, was at one time nearly lost to the Allies by an accident which befell Eugene. In rallying a body of imperial cavalry, the prince's horse received a ball in his chest, fell with the rider, and threw him into a ditch, where, stunned with the fall, he lay for several minutes among the dead and dying. The report spread through the army that he was killed, a general alarm was the consequence, and the infantry were beginning to give way, when, suddenly starting up, Eugene commanded the nearest German regiment to fire upon the French cavalry that were coming up to the charge. The effect was tremendous, the French went to the right about, and though they had rallied again and returned to the charge, the imperial troops continued gradually to force their way on, till their adversaries fled in confusion. The consequence of this victory was the evacuation of the north of Italy by the French. Eugene was now everywhere successful for some time. He forced the passage of the Col de Tente, carried the French entrenchments on the Var, and laid siege to Toulon. Here, however, he failed. The defence was long and obstinate. Reinforcements arrived at the French city, and Eugene, together with the Duke of Savoy, agreed to raise the siege once more and retire into Piedmont. Eugene was now again called to join Marlborough, in company with whom he fought and conquered at Audenard, took Lille, where he was again severely wounded, Ghent, Bruges, Tournay, and Mons, and forced the French lines at Malplaquet, after a severe and long protracted struggle in which 200,000 men were engaged and nearly 60,000 fell. If the victories of Blenheim and Audenard might more fairly be attributed to Marlborough than to Eugene, the success at Malplaquet was chiefly obtained by the prince, who had forced the entrenchments, taken the wood of Sartre, and turned the enemy's flank, before Marlborough had made much progress against the other wing. Eugene had strongly counselled the battle, though opposed by the states of Holland, and had in a measure taken the responsibility upon himself. On all occasions, Eugene's impetuosity led him to expose his person more than mere duty required, and now, having staked his fame on the success of his attempt, he seems to have resolved not to survive a defeat. In the very first attack he received a severe wound behind the ear, which bled so profusely that all his staff pressed him to retire for the purpose of having it dressed. If I am beaten, replied Eugene, it will not be worth while, and if we beat the enemy, I shall have plenty of time to spare for that. After some short repose, we soon find Eugene once more acting against the Turks in Hungary. No sooner was war determined than Ahmed III marched an immense force down to the frontiers of Hungary to act against Eugene, who had just taken the command of the German forces at Petervaradin. The vizier Hali, commanding the Ottoman troops, full of confidence in his own skill and in his immense superiority of numbers, advanced rapidly upon Eugene and crossed the Save, which formed the boundary of the two countries, determined to crush his adversary by one great battle. Eugene was as desirous of such an event as the vizier, and therefore the troops were soon engaged, almost under the walls of Petavaradin. The Turks fought bravely for many hours, and the battle was long undecided, but at length Eugene's superior skill prevailed and the enemy fled in every direction. The Grand Vizier struggled to the last with long and desperate bravery, but after having received two severe wounds, he was borne away by the fugitives to Karlovitz, where he died the next day, muttering to the last imprecations against the Christians. After the death of Hali from the wounds he had received at Petavaradin, 
the command of the Turkish army was given to the Pasha of Belgrade, one of the most skilled officers in the Ottoman service. But Eugene was destined to destroy the Turkish power in Hungary. The campaign of the next year commenced with the siege of the often captured Belgrade, and it was soon completely invested and reduced to sore distress. The port, however, was not unmindful of its preservation, and, in the beginning of August, the Pasha appeared on the mountains surrounding the town with an army of near 200,000 men. Thus shut up between a strong fortress and an immense army, with the dysentery in his camp and his forces enfeebled by long and severe labours, Eugene's situation was as difficult as it is possible to conceive. Notwithstanding every disadvantage, his usual bold course of action was pursued in the present instance, and met with that success which is almost always sure to attend the combination of daring and skill. After a short delay, to enable himself to employ all his energies, having been himself greatly debilitated by the camp fever, he attacked the Turkish army in their entrenchments, and at the end of a very short but severe struggle, succeeded in defeating a force more than three times the number of his own. Belgrade surrendered immediately, and the next year, without any great military event, put an end to the war. After the conclusion of peace, Eugene, who had been appointed governor of the Austrian Netherlands, resigned that office, which he had never personally filled, and was appointed vicar-general for the emperor in his Italian dominions. For many years after this, Eugene spent his days in peace and tranquillity, endeavouring to rise up a spirit of commerce among the Germans and to improve the finances of his sovereign, by whom he was appreciated and loved. His greatest efforts were in favour of Trieste, which he changed from a petty town to a great commercial city, and which remains to the present day the best and the noblest fruit of all his talents and all his exertions. At first, everything promised that the old age of Eugene would have passed in peace, uninterrupted by any warlike movements, but he was once more called from his calmer occupations by the short war which broke out with France in 1733. Perhaps, in point of military skill, the two campaigns which followed were the most brilliant of Eugene's life, but with only 30,000 men, opposed to a force of double that number, he could alone act upon the defensive. He did so, however, with more success than the scantiness of his resources promised. He prevented the French from penetrating into Swabia, and, though Philipsburg was taken notwithstanding all his efforts, he contrived, by turning the course of the neighbouring rivers, to inundate the country on the German side of that city and to render its possession unprofitable to France. Peace soon succeeded, and with these two campaigns ended Eugene's life as a commander. He lived for some time after this, indeed, amusing himself with the embellishments of his palace and gardens, and employing a great many mechanics and labourers during all seasons of dearth or scarcity, but the battlefield never saw him more. His health gradually and slowly declined, and on April 21, 1736, in the seventy-fourth year of his age, he was found dead in his bed, after having been slightly indisposed the night before. End of section 4「Section 5 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. General James Wolfe, by L. Drake, 1726-1759. General Edward Wolfe, an officer who distinguished himself under the Duke of Marlborough, was the father of James Wolfe, conqueror of Quebec. 
He was the eldest son of the general and was born at Westerham, a small town in Kent, on November 6, 1726. As liberal an education as could be acquired before the early age of 14 was given to the future hero. He then went with his father to Flanders to study the profession of an officer amid active warfare, and, thus engaged, seven years soon passed. During this novitiate, he was not without opportunities of distinguishing himself. His name was on several occasions mentioned with honor, till at length, at the Battle of Lafelt, his courage and skillful conduct attracted the notice of his commander, the Duke of Cumberland, who, at the close of the day, thanked him in the presence of the army, and from that time he was marked out as an officer of extraordinary merit and promise. His merit, rather than any favor, brought Wolfe the rank of lieutenant colonel when he was barely twenty-two. The battalion he commanded was soon distinguished by many and striking improvements in discipline, so that its superiority at exercise and in the order of its quarters gave sure proof of ability and temper in its young commander. The men, it is said, adored while they profoundly respected him, and his officers esteemed his approbation as much as they dreaded his displeasure. Canada, with a portion of New Brunswick and also the islands of St. John and Cape Breton, at the mouth of the St. Lawrence, were at this time possessed by the French, while Nova Scotia and New Brunswick belonged to the English. The latter also claimed the tract of land called New England, lying, as will be seen on looking at a map of North America, to the west of New Brunswick and south of the river St. Lawrence. The French, however, disputed their claim to this country, and constant quarrels arose between the rival settlers about their right to land of which, in reality, the poor Indians were the proprietors. In virtue of a grant of Parliament in 1750, a large body of English took possession of this debatable ground, but scarcely had they done so when a superior force of French and Indians attacked them, and killing some, made prisoners of others, and drove the rest back. Many vigorous but unsuccessful efforts were made on the part of the colonists and their neighbors during eighteen months to regain their territory. A body of troops was then sent from England, under General Braddock, but this attempt also failed, and, the struggle having now assumed some importance, an army of not less than 16,000 men, under Lord Loudon, renewed the contest of 1755 against the army under the Marquis de Montcalm, a most able and enterprising officer. His superiority as a commander had been shown in several instances, till, the slur which was being cast on the reputation of our country's arms having excited attention at home, Lord Loudon was recalled, and the army then in America was entrusted to General Abercrombie, not the celebrated Abercrombie. At the same time, a fresh force was raised at home, which put to sea in February 1757. Wolfe accompanied this expedition as brigadier under Major General Amherst. His object was to reduce Cape Breton, the possession of which island, commanding as it does the grand entrance of the St. Lawrence, was felt to be of the greatest importance. The town of Louisburg stands upon a small tongue of land, and at this period was carefully fortified, having heavy batteries toward the sea, and a strong defense of regular works on its land sides. Its harbor, which is considered the most magnificent in the world, was carefully guarded by five ships of the line extending quite across the mouth. Go Island formed one extremity of the entrance, and Lighthouse Point the other. Both these were surmounted by strong redoubts, having the largest cannon and mortars used in war, while a garrison of 3,000 soldiers, with 2,500 seamen to man the entrenchments, seemed to present an insuperable obstacle to a successful descent. Four miles westward of the town, however, there was a little creek called Freshwater Cove, and, after much deliberation, it was resolved to attempt a landing at this point. The frigates and lighter vessels accordingly moved thither as soon as the weather moderated, and anchored there one evening, with the wind still boisterous, and the surf running very high. Next morning, at daybreak, the first division of the troops entered their boats, wolf at their head. The seamen had scarcely dipped their oars a second time when a sudden glancing of arms amid the sandhills warned the troops to expect opposition. The French had foreseen the probability of such an attempt as the present and had prepared to oppose it by throwing up breastworks, 
placing field pieces in the hollows and stationing a considerable force to dispute a landing. Gallantly, the boats pressed onward, while the frigates, which had approached within half-cannon shot of the shore, opening their fire, swept the beach with a shower of round shot. The flotilla was now within musket range, when the French all at once poured in a volley of small arms. Wolfe ordered his men not to fire in return, but trusting to the broadsides from the frigates, which, plowing up the sand, threw it high in the air, and thus kept the beach open, he urged his rowers to their utmost strength, passed through a heavy surf, though not without some loss, and made good his landing. Company by company, as the men arrived, they quickly formed, and pushing on, after a sharp encounter, forced the French to abandon their works, and retreat within the walls of Louisbourg. The terrible surf proved the more formidable enemy. Above 100 boats, with a large number of their crews, were lost in attempting to pass through to the shore. But officers and men were too enthusiastic to be disheartened. In a short time, all the troops were landed. Guns, stores, work tools, and provisions followed quickly, and ere the enemy had learned that real danger at last threatened them, the business of the siege was begun. General Amherst invested the place without delay on the land side, and having opened his trenches before it, dispatched Wolfe with the light infantry and a body of Highlanders to attack the battery on Lighthouse Point. Before dawn one morning, he reached the outposts, drove them in, and followed with such rapidity that ere the enemy could form, and almost before they had got under arms, they were completely routed. The guns were immediately turned with terrible accuracy upon the harbor and town. The five ships of war now found their position very hazardous. One was soon on fire and blew up. The flames spread to two others, and the remaining two were attacked and captured by boats. The breaching batteries shook the ramparts of the town to their foundations, while the shells carried ruin and death into the streets. On July 26th, the enemy, finding it impossible to resist any longer, surrendered. The garrison became prisoners of war, and the islands of Cape Breton and Prince Edward fell into the hands of the English. Wolfe's part in this campaign was now over, for domestic matters summoned him to England. He had not, however, been long at home when he was informed from headquarters that his brilliant services as a subaltern had caused the king to select him to conduct an enterprise of still greater hazard and honor. It had been proposed in council, as the speediest mode of putting an end to the transatlantic war, that the reduction of Quebec, the enemy's colonial capital, should be effected. Competent authorities declared the attempt to be not impracticable. It was therefore resolved on, and Wolfe was nominated to the command of an armament to invest the town. An attack, to be made on three other points, was determined as a commencement of the campaign. The armament set sail early in February 1759. Admiral Saunders commanded the fleet, which comprised 22 line-of-battle ships and an equal number of frigates. The whole came within sight of Louisbourg April 21st. The harbor being still choked with ice, the vessels could not get in, and the delays which occurred prevented Wolfe from entering the St. Lawrence till June. The ships reached the Isle of Orleans by the end of the month and casting anchor, possession was taken. The land was in a high state of cultivation, affording abundant supplies to soldiers and sailors. The Marquis of Montcalm, now an old but still energetic man, occupied Quebec and the adjoining district with an army of 5,000 regular troops, and the same number of militia and Indians. He made preparations for the defense with great judgment. The mass of his army was in the town, which he had further protected by entrenchments extending nearly eight miles to the west, till they reached the Montmorency River. Montreal was also well garrisoned, and twenty miles above Quebec, a body of two thousand men lay encamped to attack and flank any force which might attempt to land in that direction. Many skirmishes took place at first between the Indians and British troops, and one attack of more importance, on the entrenchments near the St. Charles, was headed by Wolfe in person. It completely failed, but it taught him the strength of the enemy's position, and clearly showed that it would require stratagem to accomplish his design of reducing the town itself. A council was summoned, when it was found that disease and the petty combats in which they had been engaged had reduced the troops to 5,000 effective men. 
Insufficient as this army seemed, Wolf determined to remain idle no longer, and a plan of attack on the town was agreed upon. Accordingly, the following morning, September 11th, the ships of the line, with the exception of two or three and all the frigates, suddenly hoisted sail, and exposed to a cannonade from all the batteries, sailed up the river past Quebec. The troops had previously been landed on the southern side of the river, and in perfect safety they marched in the same direction. When they had proceeded about nine miles, they found the fleet riding at anchor, already beyond the reach or observation of the enemy. The point of attack Wolfe had chosen lay within a mile and a half of Quebec and consequently this march had no other purpose in view than to mislead the enemy as to his intentions. No sooner had the tide turned and evening set in than the surface of the river suddenly swarmed with boats, which had secretly been brought to this distant mustering place. Then the signal for the ships to sail was hung out, and they immediately began proudly to descend the channel, leaving the flotilla boats behind them. Before midnight, the fleet had reached its first anchorage, and the troops up the river could hear the thundering of their guns as they cannonaded at long shot the fortifications below the St. Charles. The cheering sound told them that the ships had repassed the town safely, while the French naturally concluded that from the ships a descent was about to be attempted. During the interval, the troops had silently and in complete order taken their places in the boats and, as soon as it became quite dark, like a huge flock of waterfowl, they glided down the stream. Not a word was spoken, the soldiers sat upright and motionless, and the sailors scarcely dipped their oars, lest the splash should reach the ears of the French placed along the shore at short distances. Wolfe sat in the leading boat, surveying attentively each headland, to prevent the hazard of shooting beyond the point at which he proposed landing. Unobserved, he gained the little cove which has since borne his name, and shortly before midnight all the men were landed. The troops now stood upon a narrow beach. Above them rose a precipice, nearly perpendicular to the height of two hundred and fifty feet. A winding path, broad enough to admit four men abreast, led to the summit, and here lay one of the large plains, or tablelands, which distinguished the heights of Abraham, on a level with the upper town of Quebec. A battery of four guns and a strong party of infantry defended this important pass. Vigilance, however, was not one of the qualities of this guard, for the leading files of the British, under Colonel Howe, were close upon the station of the French sentinel ere he challenged. Replying with a hearty cheer, they sprung forward. An irregular volley poured upon them, but the next instant they were high on the ground and at close bayonets with the French guard, who immediately fled in terror leaving Colonel Howe quietly in possession of their redoubt and artillery. Long before dawn, all the troops had gained this ground. Leaving two companies in charge of the redoubt, Wolfe hastened forward with the rest, toward Quebec. He halted when within a mile of the town, and there the men lay down with their arms in readiness for the first alarm. A communication by small parties, called videttes, was kept up with the companies at the redoubt. A trooper with his horse covered with foam appeared in the French camp at Bow Point as the morning sky began to redden. He brought Montcalm the first intelligence of the landing the English had effected, and the unwelcome news was soon confirmed by the appearance of some of the fugitive soldiers from the redoubt. The camp was instantly in commotion, but the Marquis gave his orders coolly and before an hour the entire army had crossed the river and were in full march for the heights of Abraham. About eleven in the forenoon, a large body of Indians and Canadian riflemen were seen issuing from a wood on one side of the plain on which the English were stationed. They were soon hidden again by a thicket, and dexterously spreading themselves among the bushes, they opened a smart skirmishing fire on the pickets. This was the first warning that the long-wished-for event was at hand. A general conflict might now be confidently expected. Without delay, Wolfe drew up his men in two lines, placing a few light companies in skirmishing order in front, and retaining one regiment, the 47th, in divisions as a reserve. The French skirmishers were quickly engaged with the light troops, whom they compelled to fall back on the line, while a heavy column advancing on the left obliged Wolfe to wheel round three battalions to strengthen that side. But ere the column bore down, a fresh body of skirmishers appeared, and under their cover it silently withdrew. 
Then, suddenly appearing on the right, it came down impetuously upon the irregular troops which Wolf had there stationed. These did their duty nobly. The fierce attack of the enemy failed to break their order or make them even flinch for a moment. The skirmishers, meantime, continued to gall the light infantry with their desultory fire, which acted also as a veil to conceal the intended movements of the main body of the enemy. As the light troops, however, hastily fell back, they caused a slight dismay among their supporters. Wolf instantly rode along the line and assured the men that these were only obeying instructions in order to draw the French onward. "'Be firm, my lads,' said he. Do not return a shot till the enemy is within forty yards of the muzzles of your pieces. Then you may fire. The men replied by a shout, and shouldering their muskets, they remained as though on parade, while the French continued to press nearer and nearer. At length, they were within the appointed distance. Every gun was now leveled, a crashing volley passed from left to right, a dense smoke followed the discharge, and hid its effects for a minute. The breeze soon carried this off, and then the huge gaps in the enemy's line exceeded all expectation. In the rear, the ground appeared crowded with wounded men, hurrying or being borne from the conflict, while the army, which had just advanced so confidently, now wavered and then stood still. Seeing the irresolution of the enemy, Wolf cheered his men to charge. A moment after, a musket ball struck his wrist. He paused only to wrap his handkerchief round the wound, and again pressed on. He received a second ball in his body, but still continued to issue his orders without evincing any symptom of pain, when a third bullet pierced his breast. Wolf fell to the ground. He was instantly raised and borne to the rear, where the utmost skill of the surgeons was put forth in a vain attempt to save his life. While they were engaged in examining his wounds, Wolf continued to raise himself, from time to time, to watch the progress of the battle. His eyesight beginning to fail, he leaned backwards upon one of the grenadiers, who had supported him from the field, and his heavy breathing and an occasional groan, alone, showed that life remained. "'See how they run!' exclaimed an officer beside the dying general. "'Who run?' cried Wolf instantly raising himself on his elbow and looking up, as if life were returning with full vigor. "'The French,' answered the officer. "'They are giving way in all directions.' "'Run, one of you,' said the general, speaking with great firmness. "'Run to Colonel Burton. Tell him to march Webb's regiment down to Charles River with all speed, so as to secure the bridge and cut off the enemy's retreat.' His orders were obeyed, and after a short pause he continued, "'Now, God be praised, I shall die happy. He fell back at these words, turned convulsively on his side, and expired. Montcalm had also fallen in the battle. The enemy was totally routed, and five days after, Quebec capitulated to General Townsend. The body of the gallant and high-minded wolf was conveyed home in a ship of war. When the hero's remains arrived at Portsmouth, minute guns were fired, the flags half-struck, and a body of troops, with reversed arms, received the coffin on the beach, and followed the hearse. Parliament voted Wolfe a monument in Westminster Abbey, and in that venerable pile would have been his last resting place. But a mother claimed the ashes of her son, and laid them beside those of his father, in a vault of the parish church of Greenwich. End of section 5「Section 6 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Victoria Neely. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. By Charles F. Horn. Frederick the Great. How shall we describe the incomparable, the extraordinary compound of so many brilliant and repulsive qualities? How is he to be depicted who was great as a king and little as a man, always admired in his public, never beloved in his private character, a just, generous, and laborious prince, a vain, avaricious, and cold-hearted individual, luxurious by temperament, temperate in practice, a selfish Epicurean, and affecting the harshness of the cynic, 
peacefully disposed and cultivating the arts of peace, yet exercising the arts of war in their direst form. A man of letters, ignorant of the beauties and disdaining the language of his country, magnificent and mean, the builder of palaces, theaters, libraries, and museums, and dying literally without a whole shirt in which he could be buried. And lastly, the most brilliant and successful soldier of his time, and almost destitute of the soldier's first quality, personal courage. Frederick, by general acclamation surnamed the Great, was born on January 24, 1712. His education was principally military. His very toys were miniature implements of war suited to his age, and no sooner was he able to handle a musket than he was sent to drill and forced, like all the Prussian officers of the period, to perform the duties and submit to the privations of a private soldier, obliged even to stand sentinel before the palace in all the severities of a northern winter. Though rather feeble of constitution, he soon became a proficient in martial exercises. The different branches of science bearing on the art of war he was forced to study, but his leisure hours were devoted to reading French verses and playing on the flute, pursuits that greatly displeased his royal father, who frequently threw the books into the fire and the flutes out of the window. Frederick William, the original founder of the pipe-clay science of tactics and the stick-and-starvation system of organization, the first inventor of pauper armies dressed in martial uniforms, became gradually estranged from his poetical son, and often declared that the dandy, der Stutzer as he styled him, would ruin everything. He consequently treated him with so much severity that the young prince attempted to escape, intending to fly to England. The tragical result of the adventure is well known. Frederick was thrown into prison, and his friend and adviser, Cat, beheaded under his window, while soldiers held the prince's head toward the scaffold on which the deed of death was acting. What impression this dreadful scene made on his mind is not known, but it ought to have been a deep and lasting one. It was the king's wish to follow up this execution by the trial of his own son, but the remonstrances of the cabinet of Vienna, of his own council, and, above all, of the upright and honest chaplain, Dr. Rheinbeck, reluctantly induced him to forego the intention. It is not probable that he actually intended to put the prince to death, but only to force him to resign his right to the throne in favor of his second brother, William a proposal to which Frederick constantly refused to assent. But though not tried, Frederick was severely punished, for he was confined to the fortress of Kustrin, where he was obliged to perform the duties of a commissary of finance, and write the reports, and make out the returns with his own hand. All this was, no doubt, of advantage to the future sovereign. On condition of marrying the Princess Elizabeth of brunswick Bevern, he was, at the end of eighteen months, released from confinement, and allowed to reside in the small town of Rheinsberg, where he resumed his flute and his French poets, to which the study of French philosophers and French translations from the classics was added. It was during his stay at Rheinsberg that his correspondence with foreign men of letters commenced, and it was here also that with a party of friends he formed an order of chivalry termed the Order of Bayard, the motto of the knights being, without fear and without reproach, but these were vain attempts at knighthood, for there was nothing chivalrous in the character of Frederick. Two short journeys performed with his father, and a visit to the army which Prince Eugene commanded on the Rhine in 1734, formed the only interruption to the tranquil and philosophical life of Rheinsberg. The first appearance in the field of the army bequeathed by Frederick William to his son forms an era in modern history for a belief in its efficiency was the mainspring that urged on the young king to attack the Austrians, and its excellence became the lever with which he ultimately raised his poor and secondary kingdom to the rank of a first-rate European power. The history of the rise and formation of this army, though a very curious one, would necessarily exceed our limits. But no one will be able to write the life of Frederick and do full justice to the subject without giving the reader a proper idea of the nature and origin of the engine, which helps so mainly to render him great and famous. He had no doubt other claims to greatness besides those which his military actions conferred upon him. 
but it was the splendor of these actions that brought his other merits to light, and little enough would have been heard of the philosopher of Sas Souci had not the victor of so many fields made him known to the world. Frederick, while crown prince, had not shown any great predilection for military affairs. He was rather pacifically disposed, was even a little taken with the philosophy of Wolfe, and greatly captivated by French literature and by French poetry in particular. It is probable, therefore, that the high opinion generally entertained of the newly formed army, and the favorable opportunity that fortune offered on his accession to the throne, were the spurs that pricked him on to the field. The Emperor Charles the Sixth, the last male descendant of the House of Habsburg, died in October 1741, leaving his daughter, Maria Theresa, to retain, if possible, his extensive dominions against the various claimants who had not acknowledged the pragmatic sanction, an act by which the emperor had bequeathed to her all the possessions of his house. Frederick William had not acknowledged this deed, so that Frederick was not bound by it, and having some well-grounded claims on the duchies of Silesia, prepared to make them good, by force of arms if necessary, the moment the emperor died. The desire to be spoken of was, as he himself confesses, one of his principal motives for action on this occasion. The young king resolved to lead the army he had inherited personally into the field, and as the Austrians were totally unprepared for the visit, the principalities were occupied without resistance. It was not till April 10, 1741, that an Austrian force, under General Nyperg, came to give him the meeting, and there was but little wanting to have rendered the Battle of Molwitz, the first of Frederick's fields, the last also. The ground was covered with snow. Both parties were of about equal strength and took up their ground, as the king himself tells us, in a manner alike unskillful. But on the part of the tactician, this very want of skill tended to gain the battle, for three battalions of the first line, not finding room to form up, were thrown back in potence on the extremity of the right wing, and, as we shall see, repulsed the Austrian cavalry by their fire at the most critical moment of the battle. The Austrians had been very merry at the expense of the Prussian system of tactics, and had promised to beat the pipe clay out of their jackets at the first meeting, and now the words of scorn were to be made good. After the usual salutation of artillery, the imperial cavalry, practiced in the Turkish wars, fell at full gallop upon the Prussian cavalry of the right wing, and overthrew them in an instant. For like the infantry, they had been taught only to fire. Following up their success, the Austrian horsemen dashed at the flank of the Prussian infantry. But here the three battalions, already mentioned as thrown back in potence, presented a steady front, and by their rapid fire repulsed the assailants, who, having their commander killed, seeing the despised and pipe-clayed warriors standing immovably in their ranks, from which a fire of never-heard rapidity was pouring out in all directions, soon dispersed, leaving their comrades of the infantry to try their fortune against these well-drilled foes. The infantry were not more fortunate than the cavalry. The Prussians stood firm as rocks, and fired three shots to their one, and as both were equally unskillful in the use of arms, the quantity of shots fired naturally decided the day. After a combat of several hours, the Austrians retired from the field, leaving the victory and battleground in the hands of the Prussians. But where was he, the chieftain of that gallant host, the claimant of dukedoms and principalities, the victor for whose brows a splendid wreath of laurel had been so nobly gained by the blood of the brave? Will blushing glory hide the tale of shame? Alas, no! Vain were the courtly attempts made to conceal the truth, and history is forced to confess that Frederick the Great from Molwitz deigned to run. In the scene of death, tumult, and confusion, which followed on the overthrow of the Prussian cavalry, the king completely lost his presence of mind, and fled as far as open, where the Austrian garrison, unfortunately for their cause, received him with a fire of musketry that made him take another direction. He passed the night in great anxiety at a small country inn, twenty miles from the field. On the following morning, an aide-de-camp of the Prince of Dessau brought the fugitive king back to his victorious army. "'Oh, Frederick,' says Baron Horst, 
Who could then have foretold the glory thou wert destined to acquire, and to merit as well as any conqueror and gainer of battles ever did? The war of the Austrian succession having been now kindled, and Maria Theresa been attacked on all the points of her extensive dominions, Frederick made peace, left his allies to shift for themselves, and, having obtained the principalities of Silesia, retired from the contest. That he made good use of the time and additional sources of strength gained, it is needless to say. The splendid success of the Austrian arms against France, the rapid preponderance that Maria Theresa was acquiring, alarmed him, however, for his late conquests, and he determined again to take the field before the strength of the House of Austria should outgrow his power to repress it. Voltaire negotiated for France on this occasion, and represented the danger with rather more than diplomatic ability. On both sides, the protocols were as often written in verse as in prose, and Frederick, who hated George II, having told the poet, Let France declare war against England, and I march, the latter instantly set out for Versailles, and thus gave the signal for the Second Silesian War. This was in 1744. The Prussian troops were again victorious in battle, but the general result was not so much in their favor. The king, after taking Prague, was forced to evacuate Bohemia and part of Silesia, and though afterward brilliantly successful, particularly in the fields of Ohenfriedberg, he did not hesitate to make a separate peace the moment a fair opportunity offered. On taking the field, he told the French ambassador, I am going to play your game, and if the trumps fall to my share, we'll go halves. The best part of the promise was soon forgotten, and the French, Spaniards, and Bavarians left, as before, to fight their own battles, the King of Prussia having, in December 1745, amicably concluded all his differences with Saxony and Austria. The young and fortunate conqueror now proceeded to improve and adorn his dominions, and it is almost impossible to speak in too high terms of the great things he effected with comparatively small means. At this period of his life, Frederick was singularly beloved and admired by the new court and world with which he had surrounded himself. His wit, fortune, and activity, a figure marked by distinguished bearing, by beauty of a peculiar kind, even by dress and apparel, a total of personal appearance that impressed itself singularly on the eyes of the beholder, excited general enthusiasm. Imitation is a proof and consequence of it, and many an orthodox believer, who trembled in private, ridiculed religion in public, because he had heard that the king was an atheist. And many a gallant soldier, who hated the sight and smell of snuff, disfigured his nose and lip with rapine, because such was the royal fashion. As a general, he was looked upon as the first of his time. The feeble moment at Mulvitz had not become generally known, and the few who had witnessed the unpleasant affair were too loyal and well disposed to call it back to their recollection. The king certainly did everything to deserve the favorable opinion entertained of him. Arts, science, commerce, and agriculture were encouraged. More than one hundred and thirty villages sprang up on the newly drained lands along the banks of the Oder. Men of letters and talents were brought to Berlin. Theaters, operas, ballets were established. A sort of German Versailles arose amid the sands of Brandenburg, and the garden house outside the gate, which was Frederick William's summer residence and place of recreation, soon sank down to the humble rank of a gardener's lodge to his son's palace. The machinery of government was never carried on with such perfect regularity. The king superintended the whole himself, and that without any regular intercourse with his ministers, some of whom, it is said, he never saw in his life. They furnished him every morning with abridged statements of the business to be transacted, and he wrote his order on the margin of the paper. The affairs of state were all settled in a couple of hours. Literary compositions in prose and verse, military reviews, meals, and conversation filled up the rest of the day. Frederick, says Voltaire, in his vile and mischievous memoir, governed without court, council, or religious establishment, cult. It was during this brilliant period of the king's reign that the French poet passed some time at Berlin. The Austrians, who had ridiculed the drilling and powdering, had paid for their folly in many a bloody field, but had profited by the lesson, and could now move as accurately and fire as quickly as their neighbors. The first combat of the Great Seven Years' War, 
which began in 1756, already proved this to the conviction of all parties. The Prussians purchased a slight advantage by a great loss of blood, and on the very battlefield the general remark was, these are no longer the old Austrians. On the capture of the Saxon army, which surrendered at Perna, Frederick, who exacted such unlimited allegiance from his subjects and soldiers, gave a strange proof of inconsistency and of that contempt which he seemed to treat the feelings of other men. For without so much as asking their consent, he ordered all the prisoners to be incorporated into the ranks of his army and expected to make loyal Prussians of them by merely changing their uniforms. As was to be expected, they deserted immediately. The progress of the war is out of our province. Spoiled by success, Frederick, after gaining the dearly purchased victory of Prague, attempted to reduce a city which he could not invest and in which an army was concentrated. The Austrians advanced with 60,000 men to raise the siege, and the presumptuous king did not hesitate to rush upon them with less than half the number of Prussians. A total defeat, the first he had yet sustained, was the consequence. From this day it is allowed that the Prussian infantry had no longer any superiority over their enemies. Henceforth the genius of their sovereign, the confidence he inspired, and the dread entertained of him by his adversaries are the only advantages they have to depend upon. In the second year of the war, he writes to Lamotte Fouquet, Owing to the great losses sustained, our infantry is very much degenerated from what it formerly was, and must not be employed on difficult undertakings. In the third year, he says to the same, Care must be taken not to render our people timid. They are too much so by nature already. Of this battle of Collin, we must here report an anecdote characteristic of what Frederick then was. The left wing of the Prussian army was obliquing an admirable order to the left, and already gaining the right of the Austrians according to the prescribed disposition, when the king, at once losing patience in the most unaccountable manner, sent directions to Prince Maurice of Dessau, who commanded the infantry, ordering him to wheel up and advance upon the enemy. The prince told the officer that the proposed points had not yet been attained, and recommended that the oblique march should still be continued. The king immediately came up in person, and in haughty and overbearing style repeated the order, and, when the prince of Dessau attempted to explain, drew his sword, and in a fiery and threatening tone exclaimed, Will he obey and immediately wheel up and advance? The officers present were terrified, fancying from his excited manner that he would be guilty of some act of violence. But the prince, of course, bowed and obeyed, and the battle was soon lost. Frederick, as an absolute king and commander, had no doubt many advantages over the ill-combined coalition by which he was assailed. But the mass of brute force was so great on the part of his adversaries that he was more than once on the very eve of being crushed. At one time, indeed, he contemplated the commission of suicide. The wonderful battles of Rosbach and Luthen reconciled him to life. The former was not, as is well known, his work, as it was almost gained before he well knew what was going on. It was due principally to the indomitable bravery of Zeidlitz and the cavalry. His conduct at Luthen could not be surpassed, and his manner of promoting General Prince Maurice of Dessau, who had most nobly aided him in the battle, was highly characteristic. I congratulate you on the victory, Field Marshal, said Frederick, when they met on the field. The prince was still so much occupied with what was going forward that he did not mark the exact words the king had used, till the latter again called out, Don't you hear, Field Marshal, that I congratulate you on the victory gained? When the newly promoted made due acknowledgments in course, Frederick, in his great contest, was assisted by the English, Hessian, and Hanoverian army, as well as by English subsidies. But, making full allowance for the value of these auxiliaries, it must still be admitted that great genius and courage were required to enable a king of Prussia to resist the combined forces of France, Austria, Russia, and Sweden. Frederick effected this, and his conduct deservedly obtained for him the name of Great. Footnote. It was the evening succeeding this battle of Luthen that Frederick, himself leading the advance after the flying Austrians, entered the little town of Lissa, where a body of the enemy, 
never dreaming the pursuit could reach so far, were resting for the night. Frederick was as surprised as they when, on entering a room of the principal inn, he found it filled with Austrian officers. He had but a handful of troops with him, and, had his enemies known it, was their prisoner. But with the utmost coolness he saluted them. "'Good evening, gentlemen. Is there still room for me, thank you?' Whereon the frightened Austrians, thinking themselves surrounded by the whole Prussian army, decamped in wild haste, and getting their troops together as they could, fled from the dangerous neighborhood. End of footnote. During his first two wars, until the period of the Battle of Rossbach in the Third War, he always kept at a distance from the scene, which may be allowed in a commander who has to overlook the whole, and is not called upon to defend posts or lead attacks in person. After the above period, however, and when he perceived that the nature of the contest and public opinion itself demanded greater exertions from him, he several times, on due deliberation, exposed himself to the danger of an ordinary brigadier. Several occasions of this kind might be specified. At the Battle of Kunersdorf, when attempting to assemble some remnants of the infantry, who were still holding their ground here and there, his horse was shot under him. At Liegnitz, a spent ball struck him on the calf of the leg. At Torgau again, when a newly advanced brigade began to give way like all its predecessors, he rode into the heaviest fire of musketry, and received a shot on the breast which penetrated his shirt, and for some moments deprived him so completely of all power of breathing that he was believed to be dead. Footnote. This battle of Torgau Frederick planned to win by a flank attack. But the flanking column was delayed in its march, and at evening the king found himself everywhere beaten back. His last chance of success against his many opponents seemed lost, and he spent the night seated in the church of Elsnig in such a mood as may be imagined. During the night the flanking column at last arrived, fell on the enemy, and crushed them. This was the last of Frederick's great battles. End of footnote. Frederick outlived his last great war for 23 years and died in 1786, in the 74th year of his age. Every hour of this last period of his life was assiduously occupied, almost to the hour of his death, in zealous exertions to improve his country and ameliorate the condition of his people. He certainly effected great things, but left much that he might have achieved totally unattempted. Living in the solitude which his dazzling fame had cast around him, separated from all immediate intercourse with his species, by the very barrier his glory had interposed between him and other men, he acted his part to admiration before the crowds who, from far and near, came to behold him. But blinded by the halo that encompassed him, he saw little and deemed less, perhaps, of mankind and their doings. In the mass they may possibly not be deserving of high admiration, but Frederick had never done them even justice, and in the latter years of his life he entirely lost sight of the direction they were taking. He formed an ideal world to himself, and governed his country and subjects accordingly. He was the admired wonder of the age, a brilliant if not spotless sun that cast far aloft its vivid beams, indeed, but remained stationary and concentrated within itself, while all surrounding nature was in motion and in progress. End of section 6 Section 7 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sanjay Parikh. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Robert Lord Clive, by W.C. Taylor, LLD, 1725 to 1774. The history of British India is without a parallel in the annals of mankind. It is little over a hundred years ago since the company of British merchants trading with the East Indies possessed nothing more than a few ports favorably situated for commerce 
held at the will, or rather the caprice, of the native princes, and defended against commercial rivals by miserable fortifications which could not have resisted any serious attack. Now, British sovereignty in India extends over an empire greater than that possessed by Alexander or the Caesars, and probably superior to both in the amount of its wealth and population. The chief agent in raising the East India Company from a trading association to a sovereign power was Lord Clive, whose own elevation was scarcely less marvellous than that of the empire which he founded. Robert Clive was born September the 29th, 1725. His father was a country gentleman of moderate fortune and still more moderate capacity, who cultivated his own estate in Shropshire. When a boy, the future hero of India distinguished himself chiefly by wild deeds of daring and courage, neglecting the opportunities of storing his mind with information the want of which he bitterly felt in afterlife. His violent temper and his neglect of study led his country to despair of his success at home. And in his 18th year, he was sent out as a writer in the service of the East India Company to the presidency of Madras. In our day, such an appointment would be considered a fair provision for a young man holding out, besides, a reasonable prospect of obtaining competency, if not fortune. But when Clive went to the East, the younger writers, or clerks, were so badly paid that they could scarcely subsist without getting into debt, while their seniors enriched themselves by trading on their own account. The voyage out from England to Madras, which is now effected in three or four weeks, occupied at that time from six months to a year. Clive's voyage was more than usually tedious. The ship was detained for a considerable period at the Brazils, where he picked up some knowledge of Portuguese and contracted some heavy debts. This apparent misfortune had the good effect of compelling him to reflect on his situation. He avoided all amusements and dissipation but availed himself of the resources of the governor's library, which was liberally open to him in his hours of leisure. He, however, felt himself unhappy, for his occupations were unsuited to his tastes, and he longed for an opportunity of finding a mode of life more congenial to his disposition. The War of the Austrian Succession, in which George II took the side of the Empress, while the French king supported her competitor, extended to the Eastern world. La Boudonnais, the governor of the French colony in the Mauritius, suddenly appeared before Madras, and as the town and fort were not prepared for defence, both were surrendered on honourable terms. But Duple, the French governor of Pondicherry, denying the right of La Boudonnais to grant any terms, refused to ratify the capitulation and directed Madras to be raised to the ground. With still greater disregard for public faith, he led the English, who had capitulated through the town of Pondicherry, as captives gracing his triumphal procession in the presence of 50,000 spectators. Clive escaped this outrage by flying from Madras in disguise. He took refuge at Fort St. David, a settlement subordinate to Madras, where he obtained from Major Lawrence, one of the best officers then in India, an ensign's commission in the service of the company. Peace between England and France having been established, Madras was restored to its former owners. Clive, however, did not return to his civil pursuits. He occasionally acted as a writer, but he was more frequently employed as a soldier in the petty hostilities which arose between the English and the natives. Events, however, were now in progress, which made the French and English East India companies competitors for an empire, though neither understood the value of the prize for which they contended. And Clive 
fortunately for his country and himself, was almost forced to take the position of a military commander. To explain fully the position of India at this period would take far more pages than we can afford lines. A very brief sketch may, however, help our readers to comprehend the course of events. India, in its entire extent, was nominally governed by the Emperor of Delhi, or as he was generally, though absurdly called in Europe, the Great Mogul. Under him were several viceroys, each of whom ruled over as many subjects as any of the great sovereigns of Europe. And the delegates of these viceroys had a wider extent of territory than is included in most of the minor states of Germany. This empire began to lose its unity toward the close of the 17th century. The different viceroys, while professing a nominal allegiance to the crown of Delhi, established a substantial independence. Several of the immediate vassals treated them as they had done the emperor, and several warlike tribes took advantage of this disorganization to plunder the defenseless provinces. Of these, the most formidable were the Maratas, whose name was long the terror of the peninsula. Duplay, whose name has already been mentioned as the French governor of Pondicherry, was the first who conceived the possibility of establishing a European dominion on the ruins of the Delhi Empire. And for this purpose, he wisely resolved to attempt no direct conquest, but to place at the head of the different principalities men who owed their elevation to his aid and whose continuance in power would be dependent on his assistance. With this view, he supported a claimant to the viceroyalty of the Deccan and another to the subordinate government of the Carnatic, or as the Indians term it, a rival Nizam, a rival Nabob, against the princes already in possession of these territories. His efforts were equally splendid and successful. The competitors whom he had selected became masters of the kingdom, and he, as the bestower of such mighty prizes, began to be regarded as the greatest authority in India. The English were struck with astonishment, and as there was peace with France, they were at a loss to determine in the line of conduct that they ought to pursue. Muhammad Ali, whom the English recognized as Nabob of the Karnatic, was reduced to the possession of the single town of Trichinopoli. And even that was invested by Chanda Sahib, the rival Nabob, and his French auxiliaries. Under these circumstances, Clive proposed to the Madras authorities the desperate expedient of seizing on Arcot, the capital of the Karnatic, and thus recalling Chanda Sahib from the siege of Trichinopoly. With a force of 200 Europeans and 300 sepoys, under eight officers, four of whom had been taken from the counting house, Clive surprised Arcot in the midst of a terrible storm, and the garrison fled without striking a blow. Being reinforced by large bodies of troops, the expelled garrison swelled to the number of 3,000 men, formed an encampment near the town. But Clive took them by surprise in the night, slew great numbers, put the rest to flight, and returned to his quarters without a single casualty. Chanda Sahib sent 10,000 men, including 150 French soldiers, under his son Raja Sahib, to recover Arcot. Clive's little garrison endured a siege of 50 days against this disproportionate force and against the pressure of famine, which was early and severely felt. Nothing in history is equal to the proof of devotion which the native portion of this gallant little band gave to their beloved commander. The sepoys came to Clive with a request that all the grain should be given to the Europeans who required more nourishment than the natives of Asia, declaring that they would be satisfied with the thin gruel 
which strained away from the rice. Raja Sahib at length made an attempt to take the place by storm. He was defeated with great loss, principally by Clive's personal exertions, upon which he abandoned the siege, leaving behind him a large quantity of military stores. Clive followed up this victory with great vigour, and the government of Madras, encouraged by his success, resolved to send him with a strong detachment to reinforce the garrison of Trichinopoly. Just at this conjuncture, however, Major Lawrence returned from England and assumed the chief command. If Clive was mortified by the change, he soon overcame his feelings. He cheerfully placed himself under the command of his old friend, and exerted himself as strenuously in the second post as when he held the chief command. The French had no leaders fit to cope with the two friends, and the English triumphed everywhere. The besiegers of Trichinopoly were themselves besieged and compelled to capitulate. Chanda Sahib fell into the hands of the Maharatas and was put to death at the instigation of his rival. The forts of Kovalong and Chingliput were taken by Clive, though his forces consisted of raw recruits, little better than an undisciplined rabble. Duplay, however, was not driven to despair, but still sought means of renewing the contest. After the capture of Chingliput, Clive returned to Madras, where he married Miss Maskeline, sister to the astronomer royal and immediately after returned to England. He was received with great honours by the Court of Directors, and through the influence of Lord Sandwich, obtained a seat in Parliament. But his election having been set aside, he again turned his thoughts toward India, where both the company and the government were eager to avail themselves of his services. The directors appointed him Governor of Fort St. David, the king gave him the commission of a lieutenant colonel in the British army, and thus doubly authorised, he returned to Asia in 1755. The first service on which he was employed after his return to the east was the reduction of the stronghold of Keria. This fortress, built on a craggy promontory and almost surrounded by the ocean, was the den of a pirate named Angria, whose ships had long been the terror of the Arabian seas. Admiral Watson, who commanded the English squadron, burned Angria's fleet, while Clive attacked the fastness by land. The place soon fell, and a booty of £150,000 sterling was divided among the conquerors. About two months after Clive had entered on his government at Fort St. David, Intelligence was received of the destruction of the English settlement at Calcutta by Suraj Dalla, the Nabob of Bengal. Although scarcely any resistance had been made, the English prisoners, 146 in number, were all thrust into a close and narrow apartment called the Black Hole, which in such a climate would have been too close and too narrow for a single prisoner. Their sufferings during the dreadful night until death put an end to the misery of most, cannot be described. 123 perished before morning, and the survivors had to be dug out of the heap formed by the dead bodies of their companions. The authorities at Madras, on receiving this intelligence, resolved to avenge the outrage. 900 Europeans and 1,500 sepoys, under the command of Clive, were embarked on board Admiral Watson's squadron. The passage was rendered tedious by adverse winds, but the armament arrived safely in Bengal. Clive proceeded with his usual promptitude. He routed the garrison which the Nabob had placed in Fort William, who recovered Calcutta and took Hooghly by storm. Suraj Dalla, who was as cowardly as he was cruel, now sought to negotiate peace, but at the same time he secretly urged the French to come to his assistance. This duplicity could not be concealed from Clive and Watson. They determined accordingly 
to attack Chandernagore, the chief possession of the French in Bengal, before the force there could be strengthened by new arrivals, either from the south of India or Europe. Watson directed the expedition by water, Clive by land. The success of the combined movements was rapid and complete. The fort, the garrison, the artillery, the military stores, all fell into the hands of the English, and nearly 500 European troops were among the prisoners. Soon after, Clive marched to attack Surajadala near Plassey. At sunrise on the morning of June 23, 1757, the army of the Nabob, consisting of 40,000 infantry and 15,000 cavalry, supported by 50 pieces of heavy ordnance, advanced to attack the English army, which did not exceed 3,000 men in all, and had for its artillery but a few field pieces. But the Nabob had no confidence in his army, nor his army in him. The battle was confined to a distant cannonade, in which the Nabob's artillery was quite ineffective, while the English field pieces did great execution. Suraja's terror became greater every moment, and led him to adopt the insidious advice of a traitor, Mir Jafir, and order a retreat. Clive saw the moment, and the confusion it occasioned in the undisciplined hordes. He ordered his battalions to advance, and in a moment, the hosts of the Nabob became a mass of inextricable confusion. In less than an hour, they were dispersed, never again to reassemble. Though only five or six hundred fell, their camp, guns, baggage, with innumerable wagons and cattle, remained in the hands of the victors. With the loss of only 22 soldiers killed and 50 wounded, Clive had dispersed an army of 60,000 men and conquered an empire larger and more populous than Great Britain. Surajad fled from the field of battle to his capital, but not deeming himself safe there, he tried to escape by the river to Patna. He was subsequently captured and barbarously murdered by the son of Mir Jafir. In the meantime, Clive led Mir Jafir in triumph to Murshidabad and installed him as Nabob. Immense sums of money were given to the servants of the company. Clive received for his share between two and three hundred thousand pounds. Nor was this all. Shah Alam, a son of the Emperor of Delhi, having invaded Bengal, Clive delivered Mir Jafir from this formidable enemy and was rewarded with the Jagir, or estate, of the lands south of Calcutta, for which the company were bound to pay the Nabob a quick rent of about £30,000 annually. But the gratitude of Mir Jafir did not last long. Weary of his dependence on the English, he sought an alliance with the Dutch, who had a factory at Jinsura. The authorities of this place sent earnest letters to their countrymen in Batavia, urging them to take this opportunity of raising a rival power to the English in India, and their advice was taken. Seven large ships from Java, having on board 1,500 troops, appeared unexpectedly in the Hooghly. Though England was at peace with Holland, Clive resolved to attack them without delay. The ships were taken and the army routed. Chunsura was invested by the conquerors and was only spared on the condition that no fortifications should be built and no soldiers raised beyond those that were necessary for the police of the factories. Three months afterward, he returned to England, where he was received with a profusion of honours. He was raised to the Irish peerage and promised an English title. George III, who had just ascended the throne, received him with marked distinction, and the leading statesmen of the day vied with each other in showing him attention. By judicious purchases of land, he was enabled to acquire great parliamentary influence, and by large purchases of India's stock, 
he was enabled to form a strong party in the court of proprietors. The value of such support was soon shown. The court of directors, instigated by Mr. Sullivan, the personal enemy of Lord Clive, withheld the rent of the Jagir that he had received from Mir Jafir, and it was necessary to institute a suit in chancery to enforce payment. But Clive's greatest strength was derived from the misconduct of his successors in the government of Bengal. Rapacity, luxury, and the spirit of insubordination, says a late writer, spread from the civil service to the officers of the army and from the officers to the soldiers. The evil continued to grow till every mess room became the seat of conspiracy and cabal, until the sepoys could only be kept in order by wholesale executions. Individuals were enriched, but the public treasury was empty, and the government had to face the dangers of disordered finances when there was war on the frontiers and disaffection in the army. Under these circumstances, it was generally felt that Clive alone could save the empire which he had founded. Lord Clive felt the strength of his position. He refused to go to India so long as his enemies had preponderating power in the court of directors. An overwhelming majority of the proprietors seconded his wishes, and the Sullivan party, lately triumphant, was deprived of power. Having been nominated Governor-General and Commander-in-Chief of the British possessions in Bengal, he sailed for India and reached Calcutta in May 1765. He at once assembled the council and announced his determination to enforce his two great reforms, the prohibition of receiving presents from the natives and the prohibition of private trade by the servants of the company. The whole settlement seemed to be set as one man against these measures, but Clive declared that if the functionaries in Calcutta refused obedience, he would send for some civil servants from Madras to aid him in conducting the administration. As he evinced the strength of his resolution by dismissing the most factious of his opponents, the rest became alarmed and submitted to what was inevitable. Scarcely had the Governor-General quelled the opposition of the civil service when he had to encounter a formidable mutiny of the officers of the army, occasioned by a diminution of their field allowances. Two hundred English officers engaged in a conspiracy to resign their commissions on the same day, believing that the Governor-General would submit to any terms rather than see the army on which the safety of the empire rested, left without commanders. They were mistaken in their calculations. Clive supplied their places from the officers round his person. He sent for others from Madras. He even gave commissions to some mercantile agents who offered their support at this time. Fortunately, the soldiers, and particularly the sepoys, over whom Clive had unbounded influence, remained steadfast in their allegiance. The leaders were arrested, tried and dismissed from the service. The others, completely humbled, besought permission to withdraw their resignations, and Clive exhibited lenity to all, save those whom he regarded as the contrivers of the plot. In his foreign policy, he was equally successful. The Nabob of Uth, who had threatened invasion, sought for peace as soon as he heard of Clive's arrival in India, and the Emperor of Delhi executed a formal warrant empowering the company to collect and administer the revenues of Bengal, Bihar, and Usa, that is in fact to exercise direct sovereignty over these provinces. Never had such a beneficial change been wrought in the short space of 18 months. The Governor-General set a noble example of obedience to his own regulations. He refused the brilliant presents offered him by the native princes. And when Mir Jafir left him a legacy of £60,000, he made the whole over to the company, in trust for the officers and soldiers invalided in their service. At the close of January 1767, 
the state of his health compelled Lord Clive to return to England. His reception at home was far from being gratifying. His old enemies in the India House, reinforced by those whose rapacity he had checked in Bengal, assailed him publicly and privately. The prejudices excited against those who had suddenly made large fortunes in India were concentrated against him, who was the highest, both in rank and fortune, while his ostentatious display of wealth and grandeur increased the unfavourable impression on the public mind. The dreadful famine which desolated Bengal in 1770 was, with strange perversity, attributed to Lord Clive's measures, and his parliamentary influence was greatly weakened by the death of George Grenville. Such was his position in the session of 1772, when the state of India was brought before Parliament, and all the evils of its condition made subjects of charge against the best of its rulers. Clive met the storm with firmness. Lord Chatham declared that the speech in which he vindicated himself at an early stage of the proceedings was one of the finest ever delivered in the House of Commons. His answers, when subjected to a rigid examination before a committee of inquiry, were equally remarkable for their boldness and candour. But there were some of his deeds which could not be justified, and a vote of moderate censure on his conduct was sanctioned by the House of Commons. This was a disgrace for which the favour of his sovereign, though it never varied, afforded him no consolation. His constitution, already weakened by a tropical climate, began to give way. To soothe the pains of mind and body, he had recourse to the treacherous aid of opium, which only aggravated both. At length, on November 22nd, 1774, he died by his own hand. That Clive committed many faults cannot be denied, and it is not sufficient excuse to say that they were necessary to the founding of the British Empire in India. But his second administration, the reforms he introduced into the government, and the system of wise policy which he established, may well atone for his errors. Indeed, it has done so in India, where the natives not only respect his memory as a conqueror, but venerate it as a benefactor. End of section 7《Section 8 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Kinge from Surrey, United Kingdom.《Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn, Section 8, Francois Kellerman, Marshal of France, from 1735 to 1820. Francois Christopher Kellerman, who, with a little army of raw recruits, defeated the forces of united Europe at Valmy and saved France from destruction, was born of a respectable family at Strasbourg, then part of France, on May the 28th, 1735. At the age of 17, he became a cadet in the regiment of Lowendau, and passing through the grades of ensign and lieutenant in 1753 and 1756, became captain of dragoons, in which rank he served in the Seven Years' War until 1762 and was favourably mentioned in the reports of the Battle of Bergen. A brilliant charge of cavalry against a corps commanded by General Scheider procured him in the last year the distinction of the Cross of St. Louis, then an honour of the highest esteem. After the peace of 1763, he passed with the same rank into the Legion of Conflans, and in 1765 and 1766, was charged by the king with the execution of some important commissions in Poland, 
in 1771, the increasing troubles in Poland furnished a pretext for the invasion of that country by the united troops of France and the Germanic Confederation, and Kellerman was appointed to accompany the French commander-in-chief of the expedition, Baron de Viemenel, and in 1772 he was placed at the head of a native corps of cavalry, which he had been concerned in organising. His conduct in the retreat from the castle of Krakow in 1772 elevated his character for dexterity and courage. In 1780, he became Lieutenant Colonel of Hussars on January 1st, 1784. He was promoted to the rank of Brigadier and in 1788 received the rank of Major General. In 1790, under the National Assembly, he was placed in command of both departments of Alsace, and so approved were his services in placing that frontier in a state of defence against the threatened invasion of combined Europe that in 1792 he received the Cordon Rouge of the Order of St. Louis and was appointed Lieutenant General and Commander-in-Chief of the Forces assembled at Neukirch and afterwards on August the 28th in the same year of the Army of the Moselle. It was at this time that the formidable invasion under the Duke of Brunswick, consisting of 138,000 men, of whom 66,000 were under the King of Prussia in person, and 50,000 were Austrians under Prince Hohenlohe and Marshal Clairfin, marched to France and menaced du Maurier, who occupied the defiles of Rennes with very inferior forces. Against this mighty invasion, the French nation rose as one man. Recruits poured to the borderland singing the Marseillaise, their newly adopted national hymn. Rapidly reducing this motley force to order, Kellerman, with 22,000 men, marched from Metz on September the 4th for Chalons with the utmost celerity, reached Bar before the Prussians and saved the magazines on the upper Seine and Marne, and put himself in situation to communicate with Du Maurier. The latter general was attacked on September the 16th, and immediately ordered Kellerman to take a designated position on his left, which was, accordingly, accomplished on the 19th. No sooner had Kellerman arrived here, than he perceived that the position was altogether defective. A pond on his right, separated him from de Maurier. The marshy river of the Ove, traversed by a single narrow bridge, cut off his retreat in the rear, and the heights of Valmy commanded his left. While he was shut up in this isolated position, the enemy might march upon the magazines at Dompierre and Voimont, cut both the French armies off from Chalons, and then fall upon each of them in succession. Kellerman instantly resolved to rectify this error in the disposition of the troops, and by four o'clock on the following morning, his army was in motion by its rear upon Dampierre and Voilmont. But the Prussians, equally alive to the disadvantage in which Kellerman had been placed, were already in movement to attack him, and it became impracticable to pass the Ove, leaving his advanced guard and his reserve to check the Prussians on the plain, Kellerman drew off the rest of his army to the heights of Valmy, and placing a battery of 18 pieces near the mill of Valmy at seven in the morning, was drawn up in a strong position to receive the attack of the enemy. The King of Prussia, who commanded in person, drew up his army in three columns on the height of La Lune, and advancing in an oblique direction, a vehement fire was kept up on both sides for two hours. About nine, a new battery on the enemy's right suddenly opened in the direction of the mill, near which Kellerman and his escort, with the reserve cuirassiers, were stationed and produced the utmost confusion. Most of the escorts were killed or wounded, and Kellerman had a horse shot under him, while about the same time the explosion of the two caissons of ammunition near the mill added to the alarm. Kellerman, however, quickly disposed a battery so as to return the fire, and the battle was restored on that side. 
After some time, two of the Prussian columns, flanked by powerful cavalry, advanced in a formidable array towards the mill, while the third remained in reserve. Kellerman drew up his men in column by battalions, and, advancing, his reserved artillery to the front of his position waited the advance of the enemy, who approached in silence. When they were within range of the destructive fire, Kellerman, waving his hat upon the end of his sabre, shouted, Vive la nation! to which the whole army responded with enthusiastic cries, and at the same moment the artillery opened a tremendous fire. The Prussians halted, the head of their columns melted away under the galling discharges, and they retreated, in good order, to their original position after sustaining a serious loss. The fire, however, continued on both sides with spirit, and about four o'clock in the afternoon, the Prussians renewed their attack in column, but were again repulsed, even more decidedly, and, by six in the evening, were in full retreat. The victory was thus decided in favour of the French, but the safety of the magazines at Dompierre and Valmont was still not secured. Kellerman allowed his army about a two hours repose, and then, leaving large fires lighted along his whole line and some regiments of light cavalry to defend the position, if the enemy should attempt an attack, he quietly drew off about nine o'clock at night and reached Dompierre without the enemy being aware of his movement. About six o'clock the next morning, the Prussians marched for the same point and were not a little astonished to find Kellerman's army drawn up in a line of battle on the heights of Dompierre, in a position which rendered it impracticable to attack. They immediately retreated, and their retiring columns suffered severely from a fire opened by the French artillery. This operation raised the reputation of Kellerman to an exalted height. The Allies soon afterwards retreated from France, and Kellerman desired to attack their rear, but Du Maurier would not allow the movement to be made. In recompense of these services, Kellerman was made Commander-in-Chief of the Army of the Alps, but, incurring the jealousy of the ruling faction, he was thrown into prison in June 1793, and lingered there for 13 months until the 9th Thermidor, July 27, 1794, restored him to liberty. In 1795, the Army of Italy was reincorporated with the Army of the Alps, from which it had been separated in the beginning of 1793, and the command of the united force was given to Kellerman at the close of that month. On his way to Nice to take the command, he met Napoleon at Marseilles, who, having been displaced by the reconstruction of the army, was now visiting his mother at that place on his way to Paris. Napoleon gave much valuable information respecting the seat of war, and Kellerman, continuing his journey, reached headquarters at Nice on May the 9th, 1795. His operations during the campaign that followed diminished the reputation which he had previously acquired. Throughout the conduct of this war, says Napoleon, he was constantly committing errors. On June 23rd, General Devins, at the head of the Austrian and Piedmontese armies, advanced against his positions, and after a series of engagements on the 25th, the 26th, and the 27th, Kellerman was driven out of all the posts in which Napoleon's arrangements had placed him in in the preceding October, and falling back to the line of Borghetto, wrote to the Directory that unless he was speedily reinforced, he would be obliged even to quit Nice. The government were now satisfied that the command of the Army of Italy was beyond Kellerman's abilities, and again, separating the Army of the Alps from it, they placed Kellerman at the head of the latter as a reserve and entrusted the army of Italy to General Shearer, sometime afterward to Napoleon. After the conquest of Milan, the Directory, either jealous of Napoleon 
or elated by success, decided to divide his army and to place 20,000 men under Kellerman to cover the siege of Mantua and to direct the rest under Napoleon upon Rome. Napoleon immediately resigned his command and wrote to the Directory, I will not serve with a man who considers himself the best general in Europe. It is better to have one bad general than two good ones. The Directory, in alarm, abandoned their design. Kellerman was left at Chambry and Napoleon was allowed to follow his own plans. In 1797, Kellerman was made Inspector General of the Cavalry of the Army of England and of that of Holland, and in 1799 he took his place in the Senate and was elected President on August 1st, 1801. In 1804 he was created a Marshal of the Empire, and in the following year received the Grand Eagle of the Legion of Honour. In 1803 he commanded the third corps of the army of reserve on the Rhine, and in 1806 was placed at the head of the whole of that army, to which authority the command of the army of reserve in Spain was added in 1808. And in the same year, in honour of the great victory of his more vigorous days, he was created Duke of Valmy. In 1809, he commanded the Army of Reserve on the Rhine, the Army of Observation of the Elbe, the 5th, the 25th and the 26th Military Divisions and the Army of the Reserve of the North. In 1812, he was charged with the duty of organising the cohorts of the National Guard in the 1st Military Division. He afterward commanded the 25th and the 26th Divisions. In 1813, he was at first provisional commander of the Corps of Observation on the Rhine and then received the command of the 2nd, 3rd and 4th military divisions. After the Battle of Leipzig, he performed a valuable service in reconducting to France a body of about 6,000 soldiers who had been wounded in the affairs about Dresden. Upon the restoration of Louis XVIII, Marshal Kellerman received the command of the 3rd and 4th Divisions and took no part in the events of the Hundred Days. Upon the Second Restoration, he was placed at the head of the 5th Division, received the Grand Cross of the Order of St. Louis and was made a peer of France. He died at Paris on September 13, 1820, aged 85 years. He left a son, the celebrated general, who made the decisive charge at Marengo and distinguished himself in Spain and at Waterloo, and who died on June the 2nd, 1835, and a daughter, married to General de Liri. End of section 8「Section 9 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Cicilla. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Michael Ney. Among the marshals of the great Napoleon, Ney has always held in my mind the place of honor. The bravest of the brave was the sobriquet bestowed on him by the men of his own nation and his own time, and the briefest record of his life cannot fail to prove how well the title was deserved. I could wish for a larger canvas on which to paint his portrait, but the space allotted to me here will at least suffice to reveal his character and chronicle the main events of his career. Michael Ney was born on January 10, 1769, in the small town of Serre louis in Lorraine, which province had, at that time, only recently been annexed to France. He was in reality, therefore, more German than French. His father was a working cooper by trade, but he wished his son to be something better, and arranged for him to study law. Life at a desk, however, had no interest for the future marshal, who, even then, had no doubt as to what should be his future career. In 1787, he enlisted at Metz as a private hussar. His rise was rapid from the first. He greatly distinguished himself in the Netherlands, where revolutionary France, under Du Maurier and others, was holding her own against allied Europe. 
He became lieutenant in 1793 and captain in 1794. In 1796, after a brilliant conflict under the walls of Forchheim, which resulted in the taking of that town, and on the field of battle, he was made general of brigade. Next year, in trying to save a gun from capture, he was taken prisoner by the Austrians. But General Hoche, who was then commanding the army of the Sambre and Meuse, soon effected his exchange. In 1798, he served with great distinction under Messena in Switzerland and was made general of division. In 1799, he was transferred to the Army of the Rhine, which he commanded for some time, fighting with varying success, but with unvarying energy and courage. He fought under Moreau at the famous Battle of Hohenlinden, and at the Peace of Lunéville was appointed Inspector General of the Cavalry. In 1802, Napoleon, having discovered that Switzerland could not settle her intestine divisions except by the interposition of France, sent Ney, with 20,000 men, to dissolve the Diet and disband its forces. This mode of settling intestine divisions did not command itself to the Swiss. It is generally admitted, however, that Ney acted with as much moderation as his odious task permitted, and he doubtless welcomed his recall to take command in the army which was being collected at Boulogne, ostensibly of the invasion of England. When Napoleon was proclaimed emperor, Ney was made a marshal for a long succession of heroic actions, and when the army, instead of crossing the Channel, turned back to crush Austria and the coalition, Ney commanded the Sixth Corps. By October 14, 1805, Napoleon had surrounded Mack and his army in Ulm, and on that day Ney carried the heights of Elchingen after a terrific combat. It was from this achievement that his title of Duke of Elchingen was derived. After the capitulation of Ulm, Ney had, at Innsbruck, the proud satisfaction of restoring to the 76th Regiment the flags of which they had been despoiled. He was sent into the Tyrol in pursuit of the Archduke John, whose rear guard he caught and cut to pieces at the foot of Mount Brenner at the same time that Napoleon at Austerlitz brought the war to a close. After the Peace of Presburg, Ney remained in Swabia until the rupture with Prussia. The day of Jena found him so anxious for the fray that he attacked the enemy without waiting for orders, and brought the whole Prussian cavalry upon his small division of some 3,000 men, and held them at bay until Napoleon sent him assistance. Though Prussia was practically annihilated by the battles of Jena and Auerstadt, Russia was still to be reckoned with. Napoleon invaded Poland and found himself forced into a winter campaign at a formidable distance from France. Marching and countermarching through mud and snow, the whole army was subjected to horrible suffering, but even then Ney's impetuous energy was unabated. Napoleon even rebuked him for foolhardiness, and more than once his only salvation from destruction was in the slowness and density of the Russians. He took little part in the dreadful and indecisive Battle of Ilo, after which Napoleon remained for eight days without making any movement. But it was to him that, at Friedland, Napoleon allotted the post of honor and of danger, saying, as the marshal went off proud of his task, that man is a lion. Napoleon about this time discovered that the interposition of France was necessary in the affairs of Spain, and after the peace of Tilsit, Ney was only allowed to remain in France long enough to recruit his forces, before being sent to the peninsula. A few months later in the year, when Napoleon visited Spain, Ney was given the command of the Sixth Corps there but he was destined to reap few Spanish laurels, and it is said that he endeavored to persuade the emperor to relinquish the hopeless struggle against an entire people. While Soult was engaged in the difficult task of forcing the English from the peninsula by way of Coruna, Ney held Galicia and the Asturias, destroyed guerrilla bands, defeated Sir Robert Wilson, and intercepted the enemy's convoys, but the whole country was in arms against the French, who, after six months' unceasing struggle, were compelled to retreat. When Messena was sent to Portugal with orders from Napoleon to drive the English leopards and their Sepoy general into the sea, Ney, acting under his directions, took Ciudad Rodrigo and Almeida. At Busaco, on September 27, 1810, he differed from his commander-in-chief as to the advisability of attacking the English position in front, which was strong. Messena suffered a severe repulse, and Ney was undoubtedly right, since the fact remains that after the battle, Wellington's position was easily turned, and he was compelled to fall back. He retreated upon the famous lines of Torres Vedras, before which Messena sat helplessly for months, until famine forced him to break up his camp. Ney was entrusted with the command of the rearguard, and the universal opinion of military critics is that his management of this retreat was one of his most splendid feats of arms. On one occasion he confronted, with 5,000 men, Wellington and his army of 30,000, and delayed them for many hours, while the sick and wounded, the baggage wagons, and the main body of the French army made good their retreat. While Ney was in front of him, Wellington knew no repose, nor, for all his efforts, did he succeed, during the whole pursuit, 
in capturing an ammunition wagon or even a single gun. But when Massena, with a view to saving his military reputation, which had been gravely compromised by his want of success, proposed again to advance upon Lisbon, Ney flatly refused to obey him, and after a violent quarrel was ordered by Massena to relinquish his command and retire into the interior of Spain to await the decision of the emperor. Napoleon recalled him to France and gave him command of the third corps of that avalanche of men, men of so many nations and kindreds and peoples, which he was preparing to hurl upon Russia. The Grand Army crossed the Niemen in June 1812 and followed an ever-retreating foe to Smolensk, where the Russian general, Barclay de Tolly, had received positive orders from Alexander to give battle, and where he had placed a garrison of 30,000 men. On August 14th, Ney cleared the neighboring town of Krasnoy at the point of the bayonet, and during the next two days the Russians were slowly forced back under the walls of Smolensk. On the 17th, a general attack was ordered, and Ney was directed to take the citadel. But so obstinate was the Russian defense that when night came, no entrance had been effected. However, an hour after midnight, the Russian general set fire to the town and abandoned it, having lost 12,000 men in the defense. At a council of war which followed the capture of the place, Ney strongly recommended that the Grand Army should establish itself upon the banks of the Dwina and the Dnieper, and occupying Smolensk and its environs with a vanguard, there await the Russian attack. His advice was overruled, however, and he was forced to follow the retreating foe upon the road to Moscow. But Russia was thoroughly dissatisfied with the way in which the war had been so far carried on, and Barclay de Tolly was, at this juncture, superseded by Kutasov, who, having entrenched himself strongly near the little village of Borodino, prepared to dispute the farther progress of the invaders. The battle which followed, on September 7th, was one of the most obstinate and sanguinary of modern times. It lasted from early morning till late at night, and more than 80,000 men were killed or wounded. Ney fought like a common soldier in the very thickest of the conflict. The Russian positions were at last carried, and Ney sent to the emperor for reinforcements with which to complete the victory. The emperor had only his guard in reserve, and refused his request. If there should be another battle tomorrow, he said, with what am I to fight it? Let him go back to Paris and play at emperor and leave fighting to us, cried Ney scornfully when he heard this message. Had his request been granted and the imperial guard been hurled into the conflict at the right moment, it seems probable that the Russian army would have been entirely destroyed. As it was, they drew off in good order, under cover of night, and Kutasov even had the effrontery to claim a victory. For his services during this memorable day, Ney received the title of Prince of the Moskova. The result of the Battle of Borodino was to leave Moscow at the mercy of the invaders, and a barren prize indeed it proved to them. In the horror of the fearful retreat from the ruined city, the fame of Ney reached its highest point. Nothing in all history surpasses the record of his indomitable courage and cheerfulness, in the most hopeless situations, and amid the most frightful hardships. As in Spain, he had the command of the rear guard, and the soldiers, preyed upon alike by the Cossacks and the cold, died in the path like flies. Without artillery and without cavalry, they yet succeeded, day after day, in obstructing their pursuers. Ney was on foot in the midst of them, carrying a musket and fighting like the humblest private. But at Smolensk, where the army expected to find everything, and really found nothing, they stayed too long, and on resuming their march found the Russians barring their pass. Napoleon and the Imperial Guard cut their way through. The first and fourth corps succeeded, after a desperate conflict, in evading their enemies. But Ney, who had received orders to blow up fortifications of Smolensk before leaving the town, found himself with some 8,000 men cut off from the main body of fugitives by an army of 50,000 Russians. He attacked them as though the numbers were equal, lost in a short time nearly half his little force, and was obliged to fall back. Being called upon to surrender, he answered proudly, a marshal of France never surrenders, and gave the order, as night approached, to retreat towards Smolensk, which was indeed the only way open to him. The soldiers were in despair. Ney alone did not lose heart. In the gathering dusk they came upon a small rivulet. The marshal broke the ice and watched the flow of the current beneath. This must be a feeder of the Dnieper, he said. We will follow it and put the river between us and our enemies. This they succeeded in doing, but were obliged to leave their wounded, their artillery, and their baggage upon the other side. Ney had left Smolensk on November 17th with about 8,000 men. On the 20th he joined Napoleon, who had given him up for lost, with somewhere about 1,000. Napoleon, hearing that he was come, fairly leaped and shouted for joy, exclaiming, I have three hundred millions of francs in the Tuileries. I would have given them all rather than have lost such a man. 
A few days afterward, Ney was fighting madly on the shores of the fatal Beresina to clear the way for the surging and almost frenzied crowd of soldiers, stragglers, women, and children, who, under the merciless fire of the Russian batteries, were streaming across the river on the rickety bridges improvised by the French engineers. The Grand Army was by this time only a crowd of wretched and undisciplined fugitives. Ney managed to preserve the semblance of a rear guard, and if it had not been for his unceasing efforts, it seems probable that hardly a single soldier would ever have again seen the shores of France. As it was, when he crossed the Niemen on December 13th, himself the last man to leave Russian territory, his rear guard had vanished, and he had with him only his aides de camp, while of about 500,000 men who had crossed the river five months before, scarcely 50,000 returned. No sooner did this catastrophe become known than Europe, so long ground under his heel, rose against Napoleon, who at once called upon France for fresh levies. Ney was given the command of the First Corps. On April 29, 1813, he drove the Allies from Weissenfels toward Leipzig. On May 1st, he again compelled a retrograde movement, and on May 2nd, he commanded the French center at the Battle of Lutzen, where indeed he bore the brunt of the fighting. The Allies were compelled to retire, but they did not consider themselves beaten, and they fought again at Bautzen a few days afterward. Lutzen and Bautzen were both dubious victories, but at Dresden the Allies were defeated with great loss. This victory, however, annulled by the defeat of Van Damme, who was taken prisoner in Bohemia after losing 10,000 men. When Napoleon heard of this disaster, he at once sent Ney to replace Boudinot in the command of the Northern Army, with the object of pushing on to Berlin. But for once, Ney's evil stars were in the ascendant, for on September 5th he was totally defeated by Bernadotte at Denowitz, losing 10,000 prisoners and 80 guns. The bravest of the brave was inconsolable. For some days he took no food and scarcely spoke. He wished to give up his command and fight as a grenadier. If I have not blown out my brains, he said, it is only because I want to rally my army before dying. And now came the catastrophe at Leipzig, the three days battle of the nations, where, on the first day, Ney was defeated by Blücher, after a desperate struggle in which he lost 4,000 killed and wounded, and upward of 2,000 prisoners. On the third day, after the defection of the Saxons, he held out for five hours with 5,000 men against 20,000, and retired fighting to the end. Through the whole of the succeeding campaign of France, he was at the emperor's side, and when, in spite of all the genius of Napoleon and all the bravery of his soldiers, Paris capitulated, Ney was one of three marshals sent by the defeated emperor of the French to negotiate with the Emperor of Russia for his abdication in favor of his son, the King of Rome. This mission failed of any result. Napoleon went to Elba, and Louis XVIII reigned over France in his stead. Ney accepted the new order of things and was created a peer of France, Knight of St. Louis, and Governor of the 6th Military Division. But the world was for the time at peace, and Ney's occupation was gone. He had been a fighter all his life. He could not turn courtier at the end. He had married, in 1810, Mademoiselle Augier, who had been brought up in the court of Louis XVI, was a friend of Hortense Beauharnais, and naturally fond of gaiety and society. The great marshal was a simple and rather illiterate man, who had had no time to cultivate fashionable graces. So it happened that when Madame la Marechale gave a banquet or ball, Ney used not to appear, but dined by himself in his own apartments, as far removed as possible from the noise of the festival. It is said that outside the field of battle he was one of the timidest of men, and even submitted quite tamely to the insolence of his own servants. In January 1815, he departed for his country seat of Cordreau, near Chateau d'Un, where he lived in the simplest possible fashion, till on March 6th an aide-de-camp of the Minister of War brought him an order to return at once to the headquarters of the military division of which he was a commander. Instead of going directly to his post, he went by way of Paris, where he heard for the first time of the landing of Napoleon. It is a great misfortune, said he. Whom can we send against him? Then, having visited the king and assured him of his devotion to the monarchy, he went to his command at Besançon. Next morning he heard that Grenoble had declared for the emperor, and that the occupation of Lyon was inevitable. He could observe for himself the dissatisfaction of the troops by whom he was surrounded. On the 12th, he was at lon le saulnier organizing his troops, and writing to the Minister of War for ammunition and horses. But he soon saw that resistance was hopeless. The Bourbons had managed, as usual, to make themselves hated. The King's brother and Marshal MacDonald had been obliged to flee from Lyon when Napoleon appeared. All the soldiers were delighted at the thought of having their little corporal back again. On the night of the 13th, Ney received an emissary from Napoleon. 
What memories must have stirred in his heart of old perils and old glories? How could he resist the mighty spell of the past? On the 14th, he announced to his troops that the House of Bourbon had ceased to reign and proclaimed Napoleon. It was a grievous fault, and grievously did Caesar answer it. From this moment, Ney knew no more peace of mind. So bitter was his remorse that he could not face his fellow soldiers, and obtained Napoleon's permission to retire for a time into the country. When he returned, Napoleon said, banteringly, I heard you had emigrated. Ah, sire, answered Ney, I ought to have done so long ago, but it is too late now. The approach of war revived his spirits to some extent, and when, a few days before the Battle of Waterloo, he joined the army in Flanders, he looked like the Ney of old. At Quatre Bras, on June 16th, despite an obstinate combat, he failed to drive Wellington from his position, and the next day he does not appear to have discovered that the English had fallen back upon Waterloo until some hours after their departure. At the Great Battle of Waterloo, on June 18th, he fought with the same reckless bravery as ever. He had five horses killed under him and his clothing was riddled with bullets. Napoleon said, not without truth, that he behaved like a madman. After his fifth horse was shot, he fought on foot until forced from the field by a rush of fugitives. He had done his best to die on the field of battle, but almost miraculously he escaped without a wound. After the second restoration of the Bourbons, Ney retired into the country, meaning to escape to the United States, and was provided by Fouché with a passport for this purpose. He delayed, for some reason, to use it, and on August 3rd he was arrested at the house of a relative. A council of war was appointed to try him, composed of Marshals Massena, Augereau, Mortier, and three lieutenants. It would have been better for Ney had he submitted himself to their verdict, but he unwisely denied their competence, and demanded, as a peer of the realm, to be tried by his peers, and it was a tribunal which showed him no mercy. It does not appear that the king desired his death, but Talleyrand declared that it would be a grand example, and the royalists generally thirsted for his blood. He was condemned, by a majority of 139th 17, to be shot for high treason. On December 7th, his wife and four children were admitted to his prison in the early morning to take leave of him. But neither in this painful ordeal nor at any time afterward did the condemned marshal show any sign of weakness. At eight o'clock, he was taken in a carriage to the place of execution, outside the garden gates of the Luxembourg. The officer who commanded the firing party wished to bandage his eyes, but Ney said, quietly, "'Are you ignorant that for twenty-five years I have been accustomed to face both balls and bullets?' Then, raising his voice, he cried, I protest against my condemnation. I wish that I had died for my country in battle, but here is still the field of honor. Vive la France! The officer in command, to his credit be it said, was dumb. He seemed incapable of giving the word to fire, and Ney himself, taking off his hat and striking his breast, cried in a loud voice, Soldiers, do your duty! Fire! Thus died, in his forty-seventh year, the bravest of the brave. End of section 9. Section 10 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Napoleon Bonaparte, by Colonel Clayton, R.A., 1769-1821. Napoleon Bonaparte, the second son of Charles Bonaparte and his wife, Letizia di Ramolino, was born at Ajaccio in Corsica on August 15, 1769. In 1779, he entered the Royal Military School of brienne le chateau There he remained till the autumn of 1784, when he was transferred to the Military School of Paris, according to the usual routine. An official report on him by the Inspector of Military Schools in this year speaks highly of his conduct, and notifies his great proficiency in mathematics and fair knowledge of history and geography, but says he is not well up in ornamental studies or in Latin, and curiously enough adds that he will make an excellent sailor. Napoleon lost his father in 1785, and the same year he was commissioned as second lieutenant of artillery, in which capacity he served at Valence and other garrisons. He spent his periods of leave in Corsica, and appears to have wished to play the leading part in the history of his native island, showing the first signs of his ambitious and energetic character. During the critical times following the first French Revolution, he at first joined the moderate party of Paoli, but trying for military power, 
though by untiring activity and reckless audacity he succeeded in being elected lieutenant colonel of the National Volunteers of Ajaccio, he failed in an attempt to seize that town and was obliged to return to France. The French government soon made an endeavor to crush Paoli and do away with Corsican privileges, and the islanders rallied around the Patriot. Napoleon now turned against him and attempted to seize the citadel of Ajaccio for the French. But failing again with all his relatives, he fled a second time to France. From this time onward, Napoleon looked to France for his career. The narrow horizon of his native island was no longer wide enough for him, but from its bracing mountain air and from the quick blood of his race he drew a magnetic force, which imparted to his decisions and actions a rapidity and energy that carried all before them, while at the same time a power of calm calculation, of industry, and of self-control enabled him to employ his genius to the best advantage. The force of his personality was so overwhelming that in considering his career the regret must ever be present that the only principle that remained steadfast with him, and is the key to his conduct throughout, should have been the care for his own advancement, glory, and power. Napoleon now joined the army under Carteau, which acted against the Marseillaise, who had declared against the National Convention and occupied Avignon. At this time he became attached to the younger Robespierre, who was a commissioner with the army, and embraced his Jacobin principles. He was shortly promoted chef de battalion, and commanded the artillery at the siege of Toulon, where he highly distinguished himself, and is generally believed to have been the author of the plan of attack which led to the fall of the place. He was then promoted general of brigade. On the fall of the Robespierres, Napoleon incurred serious danger, but was saved by powerful influence enlisted in his favor. He was, however, ordered to take command of an infantry brigade in the Army of the West. This, he considered, would stifle his military career, and neglecting to obey the order, he was in consequence removed from the list of employed general officers. Disgusted with his apparent lack of prospects, he was now anxious to be sent to Turkey to reorganize the Turkish artillery. But, on the eve of the 13th, Vendemier, October 5th, 1795, he was appointed second in command of the Army of the Interior under Barras, and did the National Convention good service next day in repelling the attack of the sections of Paris. Influenced partly by fear and partly by appreciation of his talents, the director appointed General Bonaparte to the command of the Army of Italy on February 23, 1796. On March 9th, he married Josephine Tascher de la Pagheri, widow of General Vicomte Alexandria de Bohonnais, and left Paris for Italy two days later. On joining the army, Bonaparte inaugurated a new era in the wars of the Republic. Previously, the leading motives had been pure patriotism and love of liberty. Bonaparte, for the first time, in his proclamation on taking command, invoked the spirit of self-interest and plunder, which was to dominate the whole policy of France for the next twenty years. Evil as were the passions which he aroused, Napoleon's great military genius flashed forth in its full brilliancy in this his first campaign. His power lay in the rapidity and boldness of his decisions, and in the untiring energy with which he carried them out, confounding his enemies by the suddenness and lightning rapidity of his blows, which never gave him time to recover. He found the French army, about 36,000 strong, distributed along the crests of the mountains from Nice to Savona, and opposing 20,000 Piemontesi under Colai and 38,000 Austrians under Bilot. These two generals had, however, differing interests. Colley's main object was to protect Piedmont, Bellot's to cover Lombardy. Hence, if Bonaparte could penetrate the point of junction of the two armies, it was probable they would separate in the retreat, and could be beaten singly. He therefore attacked the center of the Allied line, and driving back the Austrians from Montenot on April 12th, turned against the Piedmontese and defeated them at Millesimo the next day. Losing no time, he left a division under Ajuro to keep the Piedmontese in check, and led the bulk of his army against the Austrians, defeating them heavily at Dago on the 14th. The Allied armies then retreated in diverging directions as expected, and Bonaparte, following the Piedmontese, beat them at Seva and Mondovi, and forced the King of Sardinia to sign the armistice of Churrasco, leaving him free to deal with the Austrians. He crossed the Po at Piacenza on May 7th, and obliged the Austrians to retreat to the Atta. 
Following them, he forced the bridge of Lodi on May 11th and entered Milan amid the rejoicings of the people on the 15th. But his ill-omened proclamation had done its work. Violence and pillage were rampant in the French army, and he could do little to restrain them. Indeed, he himself showed an example of plundering, though under more organized forms. Heavy contributions were exacted, curiosities and works of art were demanded wholesale and dispatched to France, and the Directory, demoralized by the unaccustomed wealth that flowed in upon them, became fully as eager as Napoleon for fresh conquests and their accruing spoils. The Austrians still held Mantua, which Napoleon now besieged, occupying himself at the same time in consolidating his conquests. The Austrians made strenuous efforts to save the fortress. They were much superior in number to the French, but were defeated again and again by the rapidity and genius of their opponent. Finally, at the end of October, an Austrian army of 50,000, but mostly recruits, advanced under Alvinzi. Then followed the three days' battle of Arcola, during which Napoleon had a very narrow escape, but which ended in Alvinzi's defeat and retreat on Tyrol. From Arcola, Napoleon dated his firm belief in his own fortune. Once again, in January 1797, Alvinzi tried to relieve Mantua. But Napoleon moved in full force on Rivoli, and won a decisive battle there on January 14th, the Austrian detachment on the lower Adige having to lay down their arms next day at Roverbella. Wurmser capitulated at Mantua on February 2nd, Napoleon treating him with generosity. The first Italian campaign was perhaps the most skillful of all those of Napoleon. Everything was done accurately and rapidly, and without throwing away chances. Some of his later campaigns, though equally brilliant, show him acting more with the gambler's spirit, running unnecessary risks with almost a blind reliance upon his star, in the hope of obtaining results which should dazzle the world. In political matters during this time, Napoleon was acting less as a servant of the French Directory than as an independent ruler. He entirely ignored the instructions he received from Paris, levying contributions, entering into negotiations, and deposing princes at his own will, and writing that he is not fighting for those rascals of lawyers. Napoleon returned to Paris on December 5, 1797. The Directory, fearing his ambition, thought they could only keep him quiet by employing him, and gave him command of the so-called Army of England. But he was bent on the conquest of Egypt. He appears to have had something visionary in his temperament, and to have dreamed of founding a mighty empire from the standpoint of the East, the glow and glamour of which seems always to have had a certain fascination for him. He therefore employed the resources of the Army of England to prepare for an expedition to Egypt, and the Directory yielded to his wishes, partly, no doubt, through the desire of getting him away from France. But their aggressive policy was, at the same time, bringing on another European war. The expedition sailed from Toulon on May 19, 1798, captured Malta from the Knights of St. John by treachery, and, escaping by the great luck of the British fleet under Nelson, arrived at Alexandria on June 30th. The army was disembarked in haste, for fear lest Nelson should arrive, and on July 8th Napoleon marched on Cairo. He defeated the Mamelukes at Chabrez and the Pyramids, and entered Cairo on July 24th. He then occupied himself with organizing the government of Egypt, but his position was rendered very hazardous by the destruction of the French fleet on August 1st by Nelson at the Battle of the Nile, and he saw that his dream of founding an empire in the East could not be realized. He thought, however, that he might create a revolution in Syria, by the aid of which he might overthrow the Turkish power and march in triumph back to Europe through Asia Minor and Constantinople. He accordingly entered Syria on February 1799 with 12,000 men, but was brought to a standstill before St. Jean d'Arc. Failing to capture that fortress, supported as it was by the British squadron under Sir Sidney Smith, in spite of the most desperate efforts, he was obliged to return to Egypt. After his return, Napoleon defeated a Turkish army which had landed at Aboukir, but learning the reverses that had been suffered by the French arms in Europe, he resolved to leave Egypt and return to France. He embarked secretly on August 22nd, leaving a letter placing Kleber in command of the army of Egypt, and landed in France six weeks later. He found matters at home in great confusion. The wars had been mismanaged, Italy was almost lost, and the government, in consequence, was in very bad odor. The revolution of the 18th 
Brumaire followed, November 9, 1799, when the legislature was forcibly closed, and a provisional executive of three consuls, Sayez, Roger Duclos, and Bonaparte, formed to draw up a new constitution. This was promulgated on December 13th. The executive was vested in three consuls, Bonaparte, Cambesseres, and Lebrun, of whom Bonaparte was nominated first consul for ten years. He was practically paramount, the two remaining consuls being ciphers, and the other institutions being so organized as to concentrate power in the executive. Sayez became president of the Senate. The governmental crises being settled, energetic steps were taken with regard to the civil war in the West. A proclamation was issued promising religious toleration, at the same time that decided military action was taken and these measures were so successful that all was quiet at home by the end of February 1800. Then Napoleon turned his attention abroad. He made overtures for peace to England and Austria, now the only belligerents, as he wished to lull suspicion by posing as the friend of peace, not as a military ruler. But he inwardly rejoiced when they rejected his overtures. The situation of the belligerents on the continent was this. The army of the Rhine under Moreau, more than 100,000 strong, was distributed along the Rhine from the Lake of Constance to Alsace, opposed to Cray, whose headquarters were at Donauschlingen in Baden, while Massena, with the army of Italy, was on the Riviera and at Genoa, opposed to an Austrian army under Malas. Napoleon intended to gain himself the chief glory of the campaign, so, giving Moreau orders to cross the Rhine, but not to advance beyond a certain limit, and leaving Messina to make head at best he could against Malas, with the result that he was besieged in Genoa, and reduced to the last extremity, he prepared secretly an army of reserve near the Swiss frontier, to the command of which Berthier was ostensibly appointed. Outside, and even inside France, this army of reserve was looked upon as a chimera. Moreau crossed the Rhine on April 24th, and drove Cray to Alm, but was there checked by Napoleon's instructions, according to which he also sent a division to cooperate with the army of reserve. Napoleon himself went to Geneva on May 9th, and assuming command of this army, crossed the St. Bernard, and reached the plains of Italy before Malas had convinced himself of the existence even of the army of reserve, and while his troops were scattered from Genoa to the Var, Napoleon's obvious course would now have been to move straight on Genoa, relieve Massena, and beat in detail as many of Molossus' troops as he could encounter. But this would not have been a sufficiently brilliant triumph, as the bulk of the Austrian army might have escaped, and trusting in his star, he resolved to stake the existence of his army on a gambler's cast. Leaving Massena to be starved out, he moved to the left on Milan, and occupied the whole line of the Ticino and the Po as far as Piacenza, so as to cut off entirely the retreat of the Austrians. He then crossed the Po, and concentrated as many troops as he could spare at Stradella. The strategy was brilliant, but the risk run excessive. His army was necessarily scattered, while Malas had had time to concentrate, and he was besides ignorant of the Austrian position. He sent Dessau with a column to seek information, and moved himself on Alessandria, where he found Malas. Next day, June 14th, Malas marched out to attack the French on the plains of Marengo, and despite all Napoleon's efforts, had actually defeated him, when, fortunately, de Sos returned, and his advance, together with a cavalry charge by Kellerman, changed defeat into victory. Malas, losing his head, signed a convention the next day, giving up almost all North Italy, though Marmont says that if he had fought another battle, he must have won it. Napoleon returned to Paris with the glories of this astonishing campaign, but peace did not follow till Moreau, when his liberty of action was restored to him, had won the Battle of Hohenlinden on December 3, 1800. Then followed the Treaty of Luneville with Germany. In February 1801, the Concordant with Rome. In July 1801, and the Treaty of Amiens with England. In March 1802, so that Napoleon was able to figure as the restorer of peace to the world. He then devoted himself to the reconstruction of the civil institutions of France, employing in this great work the best talent that he could find, and impressing on their labors the stamp of his own genius. The institutions then created, which still remained for the most part, were the restored church, 
the judicial system, the codes, the system of local government, the university, the Bank of France, and the Legion of Honor. France at this period, sick of the failure of republican government, was gradually veering towards monarchy, and Napoleon knew how to take advantage of events to strengthen his position, and in due time establish his own dynasty. Preparations for the invasion of England had been steadily proceeding, but Napoleon's aggressive demeanor after becoming emperor alarmed the European cabinets, so that Pitt was able to revive the coalition, and in 1805 Napoleon found himself at war with Russia and Austria, as well as with England. Forced by England's naval supremacy to abandon the notion of invasion, he suddenly changed front in August 1805 and led his armies through Hanover and the smaller German states, disregarding the neutrality even of Prussia herself, and reached the Danube in rear of the Austrian army under Mack, which was at all. The surprise was complete. Mack surrendered October 19th, and Napoleon then marched on Vienna, which he entered November 13th. But his position was critical. The Archduke Charles was approaching from Hungary, a Russian army was entering Moravia, and Prussia, incensed at the violation of her territory, joined the coalition. A short delay would have surrounded Napoleon with his enemies, but the Tsar was impatient, and the Russian army, with a small contingent of Austrians, encountered Napoleon at Austerlitz, December 2, 1805, and was signally defeated. This caused the breakup of the coalition, the Holy Roman Empire came to an end, the Confederation of the Rhine was formed under French protection, and the Napoleonic Empire was firmly established. Napoleon then entered into negotiations for peace with Russia and England, endeavoring to conciliate those powers at the expense of Prussia. The negotiations failed, but Prussia was mortally offended, and mobilized her army in August 1806, about which time Russia finally rejected the treaty with France. Napoleon acted with his usual promptitude and advanced against Prussia before she could get help either from England or Russia. Although the rank and file of the Prussian armies was good, their generals were antiquated, and Napoleon crushed them at Jena and Auerstadt, October 14th, and entered Berlin on the 27th. He had then to carry on a stubbornly contested campaign with Russia. An indecisive battle at Eylau was followed by a hardly earned French victory at Friedland. June 14, 1807, and the Peace of Tilsit ensued, by which Prussia lost half her territory and had to submit to various humiliating conditions, which Russia escaped easily, and indeed got a share of the spoils. Napoleon was now at the zenith of his power. He was the arbiter of Europe and the paramount head of a confederation of princes, among whom the members of his own family occupied several thrones. To reward his partisans, he at this time created a new noblesse, and lavished upon them the public money. He sent an army under Junot to Portugal, and another to Spain, which, under Murat, took Madrid. Napoleon then procured the abdication of the King of Spain, and placed his brother Joseph on the vacant throne. But he did not foresee the consequences. The spirit of the nation was roused, and a formidable insurrection broke out, while a British army, under Sir Arthur Wellesley, landed in Portugal defeated Junot at Vimera, and forced him to sign the Convention of Sintra, evacuating Portugal. So began the Peninsular War, which for the future was to paralyze half Napoleon's strength. In Germany also, a spirit of revolt against his tyranny was rising, Austria at first taking the lead, and this brought on the War of 1809 against that power. Prussia, already beginning to recover her strength under the military system of Scharnhorst and Stein, was hostile to Napoleon in sentiment, but was kept down by the pressure of Russia. Napoleon declared war on the pretext that Austria was arming, and marching through Bavaria drove the Austrians out of Ratisbon, and entered Vienna May 13th. Eugene Baharnais, at the head of the Army of Italy, drove the Austrians before him into Hungary, defeated them at Rab, and joined Napoleon. The emperor then tried to cross the Danube, but was checked at Aspern and obliged to retire to the island of Lobau. Five weeks of preparation then followed, the peasant war under Hofer being carried on in Tyrol, and then Napoleon made a fresh and successful attempt to cross the Danube, and won the Battle of Wagram July 5th. This was followed by the Armistice of Zam and the Treaty of Schönbrunn, October 20th, 1809, by which he obtained a heavy indemnity in money and considerable accession of the territory in Carniola, 
Carinthia, Croatia, and Galicia. But he mortally offended the Tsar by giving a large portion of the ceded territory of Galicia to the Duchy of Warsaw, i.e. to Poland. On December 16, 1809, Napoleon, desirous of an heir, divorced Josephine, who was childless, and married, April 1, 1810, the Archduchess Maria Luisa of Austria. He had no doubt the wish also to get a footing in the circle of legitimate reigning families of Europe. A son, whom the title of King of Rome was given, was born March 20, 1811. Still bent on the humiliation of England, Napoleon now tried to effect his purpose by increasing the stringency of the continental system. But this ended in bringing him into conflict with Russia. He first annexed the kingdoms of Holland and Westphalia to give him command of their seaboards, and then prohibited English trade even when carried in neutral bottoms. The Tsar, already estranged by Napoleon's alliance with Austria and his conduct as regards Poland, refused to adopt this policy, and the relations between them gradually became so strained that the war was inevitable, and Napoleon took the momentous resolve to invade Russia. With Maria Luisa, he arrived at Dresden, May 16, 1812, and was there greeted by the Emperor of Austria, the King of Prussia, and other sovereigns. His army for this gigantic enterprise numbered about 600,000, including French, Germans, and Italians. He crossed the Neman on June 24th, reaching Vilna, which was evacuated by the Russians on the 28th, and remaining at Vilna till July 16th, hesitating to take the final resolution to invade the heart of Russia. He made overtures for peace to the Tsar, who refused to treat as long as an enemy remained on Russian soil. Foiled here, Napoleon at last decided to go on with his enterprise. So he advanced, and at first the Russians were in no condition to meet him, their forces being scattered. If Napoleon could have advanced rapidly to Smolensk, he might have cut the Russian forces in two, but his vast host appears to have been unmanageable. Barclay de Tolly and Bagration succeeded in uniting at Smolensk, but were driven from it on August 18th, after an obstinate defense. At Smolensk, Napoleon again hesitated as to whether he should go into winter quarters, but eventually decided to press on to Moscow, trusting to the moral effect of the fall of the ancient capital. It seems as if, while his superstitious belief in his stars still remained, bodily ailments had caused a deterioration in his power of rapid decision and in his energy of action. Meanwhile, great discontent had been caused in Russia by the continued retreat of the armies. Kusukov was appointed to the chief command, and stood to fight at Borodino on September 6th. Napoleon won the battle, but with unwanted and misplaced caution refused to engage his guard, and the victory was almost fruitless. He entered Moscow on September 14th, and fire broke out the next night, the first effect of which was still further to alarm the Russians, who believed it to be the work of the French. The fire raged fiercely till the 20th, and a great part of the city was burned to the ground. Had the victory of Borodino been more decisive, the Tsar might now have yielded, but as it was, he listened to the advice of Stein and Sir R. Wilson, and refused to treat, thus putting Napoleon in a dilemma. His plans were always made on the basis of immediate success, and the course to be adopted in the case of failure was not considered. Again he hesitated, with the result that when at last he resolved to retire from Moscow, the winter, coming earlier than usual, upset his calculations, and the miseries of that terrible retreat followed. He left Moscow on October 18th, and, reaching the Beresina with but 12,000 men, was joined there by Udino and Victor, who had been holding the line of the Duina with 18,000. His passage of the river was opposed, but he succeeded in crossing, and on December 6th the miserable remnant of the Grand Army reached Vilna. MacDonald, Renier, and Schwarzenberg, with 10,000 men on the Polish frontier and in the Baltic provinces, were safe, but this was the whole available remnant of the 600,000 with which the campaign commenced. All Europe now united against him. The French armies were discouraged, and the Allies enthusiastic, but the latter had difficulties to contend with, from their heterogeneous composition and diversity of interests. The campaign opened with varying fortune. A blow at Berlin was parried by Bulow at Gross Beren on August 23rd. Napoleon himself forced Blücher back to the Kasbach, 
but had to retire again to defend Dresden from the Austrians, and his lieutenant, MacDonald, was defeated in the Battle of Katzbach on August 26th. Napoleon inflicted a crushing defeat on the Austrians before Dresden on the 27th, but, while preparing to cut off their retreat, was disturbed by the news of Gros Beren and the Katzbach and by sudden illness, and at Kuhm lost Van Damme with 20,000 men. September was spent in fruitless marches, and towards the end of the month the Allies began their converging march on their preconcerted rendezvous at Leipzig. At the same time, the Confederation of the Rhine began to dissolve. The Kingdom of Westphalia was upset on October 1st, and on the 8th Bavaria joined Austria. The toils were closing round Napoleon, and between October 14th and 19th he was crushed in that Battle of the Titans at Leipzig, and brushing aside the Bavarians, who tried to stop him at Haynau, on November 1st, led back the remnant of his army, some 70,000 strong, across the Rhine at Mainz. The Allies now made overtures for peace on the basis of natural frontiers, which would have left France the fruits of the First Revolution, viz. Belgium, the left bank of the Rhine, Savoy, and Nice. But Napoleon could not be content with such curtailment of his power. Evading at first the proposal, he would have accepted it but with suspicious qualifications, when too late. The invasion of France followed. The Allies issued a manifesto on December 1st, saying they were waging war against Napoleon alone, and advanced with three separate armies. Schwarzenberg led the Austrians through Switzerland. Blucher crossed the Middle Rhine towards Nancy, while the Northern Army passed through Holland. Napoleon had yet hopes of success on account of the forces he still had in the German fortresses, the mutual jealousies of the Allies, his connection with the Emperor of Austria, and the patriotism which would be aroused in France by invasion. But the Allies gave him no time to utilize these influences, and Paris was not fortified. Napoleon carried on a campaign full of genius, gaining what advantage he could from the separation of his enemies. He attacked Blücher and won four battles in four days at Champambert, February 10, 1814, Montmorel, 11th, Chateau Thierry, 12th, and Vauchamp, 13th. These successes would have enabled him to make a reasonable peace, but his personal position forbade this, and he tried subterfuge and delay. The Allies, however, were not to be trifled with, and in the beginning of March signed the Treaty of Chamont, which bound them each to keep 150,000 men on foot for 20 years. The battles of Crayon and Léon followed in which Napoleon held his own, but saw his resources dwindle. On March 18th, the conferences at Châtillon came to an end, and on the 24th, the Allies determined to march on Paris. Montmartre and Mortier, with less than 30,000 men, could make no head against them, while Napoleon himself tried a fruitless diversion against their communications. Joseph Bonaparte withdrew Maria Luisa and the King of Rome to Tours, on March 30th, the Allies attacked Paris on three sides, and in the afternoon the French marshals offered to capitulate. Napoleon, when he learned the real state of affairs, hurried up in rear of the Allies, but was too late and had to fall back on Fontainebleau. His position was desperate, and to add to his difficulties, Wellington, whose career of success had gradually cleared the French out of the peninsula, had now led his victorious army across the Pyrenees into France itself. Napoleon, therefore, at first offered to abdicate in favor of his son, but when he found that would not be sufficient, he signed an unconditional abdication on April 11, 1814. He was given the sovereignty of the island of Elba, and the Bourbons, in the person of Louis XVIII, were restored to the throne of France. But the condition of affairs was very precarious. The return of the Bourbons was most unpopular. It indeed restored the Parliament, but it unsettled the position of public men and the title to estates. The army was disgusted at the appointment to commands of emigres who had fought against France. The church began to cause alarm to the holders of national property, and by the release of prisoners and the return of the garrisons of German fortresses, very large numbers of Napoleonic soldiers became dispersed over France. The coalition, too, broke up, and fresh alliances began to be sought with a view to check the aggressive spirit which Russia seemed inclined to manifest. 
Altogether, affairs in Europe and France were in such a state as to make it not impossible that the magic of Napoleon's name might replace him in power. He accordingly resolved on making the attempt, left Elba on February 26, 1815, and landed on the French coast on March 1st. On the 20th he entered Paris, having been joined by the army. Europe had declared war against him, and a new coalition had been formed, but only two armies were immediately ready to take the field. A mixed force under the Duke of Wellington in Belgium, and a Prussian army under Blucher in the Rhine provinces. The English army had its base on the sea, and the Prussian on the Rhine, so that they had diverging lines of operation. Napoleon's idea was to strike suddenly at their point of junction before they could concentrate, push in between them, drive them apart, and then defeat each separately. The plan was unexceptionable, resembling that of his first campaign in 1796, and the opening moves were successfully carried out. Napoleon left Paris on June 12, his army being then echeloned between Paris and the Belgian frontier, so that the point where the blow would fall was still doubtful. On the 15th, he occupied Charleroi, and was between the two allied armies. And on the 16th, he defeated Blücher at Ligny before Wellington could come to his assistance. So far, all had gone well with him, but now, apparently, his energy was not sufficient to cope rapidly with the difficulties that no doubt beset him through the shortcomings of his staff, and the spirit of mutual distrust that reigned among his officers. He did nothing till the morning of the 17th, and it was not till 2 p.m. that he sent Grouchy with 33,000 men to follow the Prussians in the supposed direction of their retreat towards Leech, and to keep them at a distance while he turned against Wellington. But he had lost his opportunity. The wasted hours had enabled the Prussians to disappear, and he did not know the fact that Blücher had taken the resolution to move on rivalry giving up his own communications in order to reunite with Wellington. The latter had retired to a previously chosen position at mont saint jean and received Blucher's promise to lead his army to his assistance. So on the 18th, when Napoleon attacked the Duke, unknown to him the bulk of the Prussian army was hastening up on his right flank, while Grouchy was fruitlessly engaged with the Prussian rearguard only. This led to the crowning defeat of Waterloo, where Napoleon's fortunes were finally wrecked. He fled to Paris and abdicated for the last time on June 22nd, and finding it impossible to escape from France, he surrendered to Captain Maitland of the Belle Rofon at Roquefort on July 15th. He was banished by the British government to St. Helena, where he arrived on October 15, 1815, and died there of cancer of the stomach on May 5, 1821. End of section 10. Section 11 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jennifer Painter. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Arthur, Duke of Wellington, by L. Drake, 1769-1852. Arthur Wellesley, the fourth son of the Earl of Mornington, was born on May the 1st, 1769, at Dungan Castle in Ireland. Although exhibiting no decided inclination for the profession of arms, a soldier's career was chosen for him at an early age, and after some preparatory years spent at Eton, he was sent to Angers in France to learn in its ancient military school those lessons in the art of war which he was destined in after life again and again so gloriously to surpass. Unlike his contemporary Napoleon, the genius of Wellington did not display itself beyond enabling him to attain a fair and creditable proficiency at Angers. On his return to England, he was gazetted to an ensigncy early in 1787, and five years later, having passed through the intermediate degrees, he obtained a troop in the 18th Light Dragoons. 
His first appearance in public life was as a statesman, having been returned to the Irish Parliament for the borough of Trim. His military career of active service commenced by his being ordered, with his regiment, to join the army in the Netherlands. Ere he reached it, the tide of victory was running against the British arms, and his opening campaign, while it gave him much experience, brought him but little glory. He had now obtained the rank of colonel, and, as commander of the rear guard of the army, he steadily covered its retreat before the advancing troops of the French Republic, till they crossed the frontiers of the Low Countries, when, after a kindly welcome and a short stay with the Bremeners, they returned home. The worn-out regiments were immediately recruited, and in April 1796, Colonel Wellesley sailed with his corps for the East Indies, where he arrived in February the following year. The fall of Serengapatam and the death of Tipu Saib in its defence are well-known events. The principal command of the army in India was soon entrusted to Colonel Wellesley, and early next year he was gazetted Major General. The nature of this sketch will not admit of a detailed account of the rest of the campaign, although it proved a short but brilliant one, one which ended in the entire submission of the Maratha potentates who continued the struggle after Tipu's fall and completely established the reputation of the future hero of Waterloo. A staff commander awaited Major General, and now Sir Arthur, Wellesley's return to England, and soon afterward he married Catherine, the third daughter of the Earl of Longford. The command of a detachment of the army sent against the French in Spain and Portugal was confided to Sir Arthur in June 1808, when, without delay, he proceeded to Corunna. The successes of the earlier portion of the campaign, owing to the admirable conduct of Sir Arthur, were so well appreciated at home that the king raised him to the peerage. Through many difficulties, Lord Wellington still continued to lead the Allied army on from victory to victory, to relate which, even briefly, would alone fill a volume, till he found himself ready for the last grand struggle at Ciudad Rodrigo, which was now occupied by the French. It was early in January 1811, yet notwithstanding the coldness of the weather and the dangers to which the army was exposed, in case of the sudden rising of the river Agueda, which runs nearly in front of the town, the preliminaries of the siege were successfully conducted. One afternoon, the breaching batteries, comprising 27 large guns, opened their fire on the wall of the town. In five days, the breaches were practicable and a summons to surrender was sent to the governor. This he declined doing. Wellington, having personally examined the breaches, felt convinced that an assault had every prospect of success. Ordering the fire of the guns to be directed against the cannon on the ramparts, he sat down on an embankment and wrote the order of assault which was to seal the doom of the town, beginning with the emphatic sentence, The attack upon Ciudad Rodrigo must be made this evening at seven o'clock. Spain and Portugal conferred honours on the conqueror of Rodrigo, and at home he was raised to the earldom of Wellington, with an increased annuity of £2,000 a year. The French army, under Marshal Soult, had at length been compelled to quit Spain, and with such speed that in four days they passed over ground which it took the Allied armies seven days to traverse. During the retreat, the two armies approached each other several times, and on one occasion, when the French army was crossing the plains of Gur, its pursuers followed so closely that had it not been for the thick woods through which they had to pass, Soult's retreat would have been seriously endangered by the British cavalry. When Bonaparte had quitted Fontainebleau and had embarked on board the undaunted frigate for Elba, Lord Wellington felt he might safely leave the army for a time and, setting out for Paris, he reached it May the 4th. 
he met with an enthusiastic reception from all classes, while the unqualified praises of each of the Allied sovereigns showed how much the successful issue of the struggle to restore liberty to Europe was due to his talents and constancy of purpose. The restored Spanish King Ferdinand sent him a letter of gratitude, and the Crown Prince of Sweden gave him the Order of the Sword. England at the same time conferred upon him the dukedom he so long enjoyed, and raised five of his lieutenants to peerages. Once more the loud, shrill clarion of war aroused Europe to arms. Ten short months after his abdication, Napoleon, escaped from Elba, was again in Paris, resolved to incur all risks in order to gain the greatest prize in Europe, the crown he had so lately relinquished. The magic influence of his name spread through France, which became one vast camp, and in an incredibly short space of time, Napoleon found himself ready to take the field with an army of 150,000 men, of whom 20,000 were highly disciplined cavalry. The whole army was perfectly equipped, while 300 pieces of cannon formed an overpowering artillery. To oppose this well-appointed force, the Duke of Wellington and Marshal Blucher had collected an army of 180,000 men. But although the Allied armies thus exceeded Napoleon's in numbers, his consisted of veteran troops of one nation, while theirs were composed, for the most part, of raw levies. That under the Duke was the weakest and the worst. At no time did it reach 80,000 men, and on one half of these only could reliance be placed in the day of battle. I am going to have a brush with Wellington, said Napoleon on the evening of June the 11th, 1815, and next morning before daybreak he set out to join his army on the frontiers, taking every precaution to conceal from Wellington that he was coming. Napoleon's object was to separate Blucher from Wellington, then to deal with each singly, and thus to crush them forever. Then France, rejoicing to see glory once more resting on her eagles, would again hail him as her emperor. While at dinner, Wellington received the first news of the advance of Napoleon. Thinking that this was merely a feint to draw the Allies towards Ligny, while a serious attempt was made upon Brussels, Wellington, who had already prepared himself for any emergency, determined to wait till Napoleon's object was more fully displayed. While, therefore, he gave orders that the troops should be in readiness to march at a moment's notice, he, with his officers, joined in the festivities of a ball given that evening by the Duchess of Richmond. Blucher's second courier arrived before twelve o'clock, and the dispatches were delivered to the Duke in the ballroom. While he was reading them, he seemed completely absorbed by their contents, and after he had finished, for some minutes he remained in the same attitude of deep reflection, totally abstracted from every surrounding object, while his countenance was expressive of fixed and intense thought. He was heard to mutter to himself, Marshal Blucher thinks, it is Marshal Blucher's opinion. And after remaining thus abstracted a few minutes, and having apparently formed his decision, he gave his usual clear and concise orders to one of his staff officers, who instantly left the room, and was again as gay and animated as ever. He stayed to supper, and then went home. The trumpet's loud call awoke every sleeper in the city of Brussels a little after midnight. Then it became known that the French had advanced to Chalois, which they had taken, and that the English troops were ordered to advance and support the Prussians. Instantly the place resounded with martial preparations, and as soldiers were quartered in every house, the whole town became one bustling scene. At daylight the troops were under arms, and at eight o'clock set out for Quatre Bras, the expected scene of action in advance of Chalois. The 5th Division taking the direct road through the forest of Soigny. Early in the afternoon, Marshal Ney attacked the Prince of Orange 
and by an overwhelming superiority of troops was driving him back through a thick wood called Le Bois de Bosson, when the leading columns of the English reached Quatre Bras. Wellington's eye at once saw the critical condition of his ally, and, though the troops had marched twenty miles under a sultry sky, he knew their spirit was indomitable, and gave the welcome order that the wood must be immediately regained. On came Ney's infantry, doubling that of his opponents in number, supported by a crashing fire of artillery, quickly followed by the cavalry, which, dashing through the rye crops, more than breast high, charged the English regiments as soon as they reached the battleground. Yet, though unable properly to establish themselves, they formed squares and roughly repelled the enemy. Fierce and frequent were the efforts of the French to break the squares. Showers of grape poured upon them, and the moment an opening appeared, on rushed the lancers. But the dead were quickly removed, and, though the squares were lessened, they still presented an unbroken line of glittering bayonets, which neither the spears of the lancers nor the long swords of the cuirassier could break through. A division of the guards from Engen, coming up at this crisis, gallantly charged the enemy, and in half an hour cleared the wood of them completely. This exploit was remarkable, achieved as it was by young soldiers after a toilsome march of fifteen hours, during which time they had been without anything to eat or drink. The fire of the French artillery and the charges of cavalry obliged these gallant fellows, although now joined by the Brunswickers, in some measure to keep the shelter of the wood. They, however, sallied out at intervals, until Ney, finding himself shaken, sent for his reserve. This force Napoleon had unexpectedly removed to support his attack on the Prussians at Ligny. Yet the Marshal maintained his position to the close of the day, when he fell back on the road to Fran, while the British and their brave allies lighted fires, and securing such provisions as they could, after a scanty meal, piled arms, and lay down to rest on the battlefield. Napoleon's simultaneous attack on the Prussians at Ligny was for a long time doubtful. Both Blucher and Napoleon were compelled to bring their reserves into action, and when night closed, Blucher, still, like a wounded lion, fought with ferocity, but the darkness enabled Napoleon to wheel a division of French infantry on the rear of the Prussians, while a dense body of cuirassiers forced Ligny on the other side, and not till then did Blucher fall back. Wellington was prepared to accept battle at daybreak next morning, but hearing of Blucher's retreat, he also resolved to fall back, so as to keep a lateral communication with the right wing of the Prussians, and by this movement also prevent Bonaparte from placing himself between the two armies, when at his choice he might turn his forces against either, in which case the inferiority of numbers would have entailed certain defeat. Napoleon expected to find the English army still upon the ground it had occupied on the 16th. Great was his surprise when, on reaching the heights above Fran, he saw that the troops at the entrance of the wood were only a strong rearguard, and that the retreat toward Brussels was already half effected. He bitterly rebuked Ney for his supposed negligence, though Wellington's own officers did not imagine they were to retreat till the moment it began, and the Duke, by dexterously wheeling his troops round the wood, part of which could only be seen by the French, gave their marshal the idea that he was bringing up large reinforcements instead of drawing off his troops. The French squadrons immediately commenced the pursuit, but were so rudely handled by the lifeguards under Lord Uxbridge, who protected the rear, that, after several attacks, in the last of which the French hussars were charged and nearly cut to pieces, the pursuit was so severely checked as to give the infantry ample time to take up the ground appointed them on the heights of Mont Saint Jean, covering the approach to Brussels by the great road from Charlois. Here it was that the Duke had determined to make his final stand, staking the glory of many years on the issue of a single battle. 
When day broke and Napoleon beheld his opponents, whom he feared would have escaped him during the night, fearlessly occupying their position of the evening before, and evidently prepared to defend it, a flush of joy overspread his face, while he exclaimed confidently, Bravo! I have them then, these English! By nine o'clock the weather moderated, the sun shone out, fires were kindled, the men dried and cleaned their arms, and, ammunition being served out, provisions were distributed, and the men breakfasted with some degree of comfort. Since daybreak, occasional shots had been fired, but not till eleven o'clock did the battle begin. A body of light troops left the French line, and, descending the hill at a slinging trot, broke into scattered parties, keeping up an irregular fire as they advanced towards the Chateau of Hougoumont. These were closely followed by three divisions, nearly 30,000 strong, and the dropping fire was soon changed into one continued roll of musketry. As the English skirmishers fell back, two brigades of British artillery opened on the advancing columns of the French, each shot plunging and tearing through their masses, while the shells from the howitzers fell so truly that the shaken columns drew back. But now a powerful artillery opened from the French heights, fresh troops poured forward, and for more than an hour the line of each army remained spectators of the terrific attack on the chateau, surrounded by a dense cloud of smoke, through which glared forth the flashes of the artillery. The French guns had found their range. Every shot told upon the old walls of the mansion, and crashing masonry burning rafters falling, mingled with the yell of battle, added a frightful interest to the scene. At length the Nassau sharpshooters were driven back, and the French troops began to penetrate the orchard. But ere they could occupy it, the squadrons of English cavalry, under Lord Saltoun, bore down upon them and drove them back. Wheeling round, they then attempted the rear of the chateau, but being received unflinchingly, were obliged to retire. Despairing of success, the French artillery now discharged shells upon Hugomont. The tower and chapel were soon in a blaze, and in these many wounded men met a dreadful fate. Still, though surrounded by flames and bursting shells, with the heavy shot ploughing through wall and window, the guards held their post, nor could Hugomont be taken. How beautifully these English fight, but they must give way, exclaimed Napoleon to Marshal Soult. But evening came, and yet they held their ground. The men, maddened by seeing their comrades falling around them, longed ardently for the moment to advance, but Wellington felt that the crisis was not yet come. It required all his authority to restrain the troops but he knew their powers of endurance. Not yet, my brave fellows, said the Duke. Be firm a little longer, and you shall have at them by and by. This homely appeal kept every man in his place in the ranks. But now the superior officers remonstrated and advised a retreat. Will the troops stand? demanded Wellington. Till they perish, was the reply. Then, added the Duke, I will stand with them to the last man. Yet Wellington was not insensible of the critical nature of his position, and longed for night or blucher. It was now seven, and the Prussians had been expected at three. In less than an hour, the sound of artillery was heard in the expected direction, and a staff officer brought word that the head of the Prussian column was at Planchenois, nearly in the rear of the French reserve. Bonaparte, when told of their advance, maintained that it was Grouchy's long-expected force coming up, but when he saw them issue from the wood and perceived the Prussian colours, he turned pale, but uttered not a word. Napoleon's imperial guards, his veteran troops, were now advancing, covered by a tempest of shot and shells, 
toward the ridge behind which lay the British infantry to gain a shelter from the fire. Wellington eagerly watched the dense cloud as it approached, and when it arrived within a hundred yards, advancing on horseback to the brow of the ridge, he exclaimed, Up, guards, and at em. In a moment, the men were on their feet. The French closed on them, when a tremendous volley drove the whole mass back. But the old Imperial Guard recovered, yet only to receive a second volley as deadly as the first, followed by a bold charge with the bayonet, which forced them down the slope and up the opposite bank. In vain the French attempted to support them by taking the guards in flank. Lord Hill brought forward the extreme right of the army in the form of a crescent, which overlapping the horsemen, they were crushed as in a serpent's folds, while the infantry fell back, reformed, and occupied their former place on the ridge. Wellington's quick eye already detected the confusion caused by the Prussian attack under General Bulow on the French rear. Hastily closing his telescope, he exclaimed, The hour is come. Now every man must advance. Forming into one long line, four men deep, the whole infantry advanced with a loud cheer, the sun at the instant streaming out as if to shed his last glories on the conquerors of that dreadful day. Headed by the Duke, with his hat in hand, the line advanced with spirit and rapidity, while the horse artillery opened a fire of canister shot on the confused masses. For a few minutes they stood their ground gallantly, and, even when the Allied cavalry charged full upon them, four battalions of the old guard formed squares, and checked its advance. As the grape shot tore through the ranks of the veterans, they closed up again, and, to every summons to surrender, gave the stern reply, The guard never surrender. They die. Napoleon had already fled. Finding all hope of victory gone, he at first threw himself into one of the squares of the old guard, determined to die with them, but when the Prussians gained on their rear, and he was in danger of being made prisoner, he exclaimed, For the present it is finished. Let us save ourselves. And, turning his horse's head, he fled with ten or twelve of his immediate attendants. It was now half-past nine at night, and the moon rose with more than ordinary splendour. The French, now a mass of fugitives, were closely pursued by both armies, and a fearful slaughter ensued between Waterloo and Genappe. At the latter place the British discontinued the pursuit, but the Prussians, comparatively fresh, pursued without intermission, their light horse putting no limit to their revenge. Many of the poor fugitives sought shelter in the villages on their route, but at the sound of a Prussian trumpet they fled again, only to be overtaken and cut down. Wellington recrossed the field of Waterloo to sup at Brussels. The moonlight revealed all the horrors of the scene. His stern nature gave way, and, bursting into tears, he exclaimed, I have never fought such a battle, and I hope never to fight such another. He never did. Waterloo was his last battle, though he lived for nearly forty years afterward, a leader in English politics, and died in 1852, a national hero, a worthy twin figure to the immortal Nelson. End of section 11section 12 of great men and famous women volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by jennifer painter great men and famous women volume 2 by charles f horn lord horatio nelson 1758 to 1805. Horatio Nelson was born at Burnham Thorpe in Norfolk, September the 29th, 1758. 
His father, the rector of that parish, was burdened with a numerous family, and it is said to have been more with a view to lighten that burden than from predilection for the service that at the age of twelve he expressed a wish to go to sea under the care of his uncle, Captain Suckling. Of his early adventures it is unnecessary to speak in detail. In 1773 he served in Captain Phipps' voyage of discovery in the northern polar seas. His next station was the East Indies, from which, at the end of eighteen months, he was compelled to return by a very severe and dangerous illness. In April 1777 he passed his examination and was immediately commissioned as second lieutenant of the Lowestoft frigate, then fitting out for Jamaica. Fortunate in conciliating the goodwill and esteem of those with whom he served, he passed rapidly through the lower ranks of his profession, and was made post-captain with the command of the Hinchinbrook of 28 guns, June the 11th, 1779, when not yet of age. In 1782 he was appointed to the Albemarle, 28, and in 1784 to the Boreas, 28, in which he served for three years in the West Indies, and though in time of peace gave signal proof of his resolution and strict sense of duty, by being the first to insist on the exclusion of the Americans from direct trade with the British colonies, agreeably to the terms of the Navigation Act. He had no small difficulties to contend with, for the planters and the colonial authorities were united against him, and even the admiral on the station coincided with their views, and gave orders that the Americans should be allowed free access to the islands. Still Nelson persevered. Transmitting a respectful remonstrance to the admiral, he seized four of the American ships, and after a long and tedious process at law, in which he incurred much anxiety and expense, he succeeded in procuring their condemnation by the Admiralty Court. Neither his services in this matter, nor his efforts to expose and remedy the peculations and dishonesty of the government agents in almost all matters connected with naval affairs in the West Indies, were duly acknowledged by the government at home, and in moments of spleen, when suffering under inconveniences which a conscientious discharge of his duty had brought on him, he talked of quitting the service of an ungrateful country. In March 1787, he married Mrs Nisbet, a West Indian lady, and in the same year returned to England. He continued unemployed till January 1793, when, on the breaking out of the French wars, he was appointed to the Agamemnon, 64, and ordered to serve in the Mediterranean under the command of Lord Hood. An ample field for action was now open to him. Lord Hood, who had known him in the West Indies and appreciated his merits, employed him to cooperate with Paoli in delivering Corsica from its subjection to France, and most laboriously and ably did he perform the duty entrusted to him. The siege and capture of Bastia was entirely owing to his efforts, and at the siege of Calvi, during which he lost an eye, and throughout the train of successes which brought about the temporary annexation of Corsica to the British crown, his services and those of the brave crew of the Agamemnon were conspicuous. In 1795, Nelson was selected to cooperate with the Austrian and Sardinian troops in opposing the progress of the French in the north of Italy. The incapacity, if not dishonesty, and the bad success of those with whom he had to act rendered this service irksome and inglorious, and his mortification was heightened when orders were sent out to withdraw the fleet from the Mediterranean and evacuate Corsica and Elba. These reverses, however, were the prelude to a day of glory. On February the 13th, 1797, the British fleet, commanded by Sir John Jarvis, fell in with the Spanish fleet off Cape St Vincent. In the battle which ensued, Nelson, who had been raised to the rank of Commodore, and removed to the captain, 74, bore a most distinguished part. 
apprehensive lest the enemy might be enabled to escape without fighting, he did not hesitate to disobey signals and executed a manoeuvre which brought the captain into close action at once with three first rates, an 80 and two 74 gunships. Captain Trowbridge in the Culloden immediately came to his support and they maintained the contest for near an hour against this immense disparity of force. One first rate and one seventy four dropped astern, disabled, but the Culloden was also crippled, and the captain was fired on by five ships of the line at once, when Captain Collingwood, in the excellent, came up and engaged the huge Santissima Trinidad of one hundred and thirty six guns. By this time, the captain's rigging was all shot away, and she lay unmanageable abreast of the 80-gun ship, the San Nicolas. Nelson seized the opportunity to board, and was himself among the first to enter the Spanish ship. She struck after a short struggle, and, sending for fresh men, he led the way from his prize to board the San Joseph of 112 guns, exclaiming, Westminster Abbey, or victory. The ships immediately surrendered. Nelson received the most lively and public thanks for his services from the Admiral, who was raised to the peerage by the title of Earl St. Vincent. Nelson received the Order of the Bath. He had already been made Rear Admiral before tidings of the battle reached England. During the spring, Sir Horatio Nelson commanded the inner squadron employed in the blockade of Cadiz. He was afterward dispatched on an expedition against Tenerife, which was defeated with considerable loss to the assailants. The admiral himself lost his right arm and was obliged to return to England, where he languished more than four months before the cure of his wound was completed. His services were awarded by a pension of £1,000. On this occasion, he was required by official forms to present a memorial of the services in which he had been engaged. And as our brief account can convey no notion of the constant activity of his early life, we quote the abstract of this paper given by Mr. Southey. It stated that he had been in four actions with the fleets of the enemy and in three actions with boats employed in cutting out of harbour, in destroying vessels and in taking three towns. He had served on shore with the army four months and commanded the batteries at the sieges of Bastia and Calvi. He had assisted at the capture of seven sail of the line, six frigates, four corvettes and eleven privateers, taken and destroyed near fifty sail of merchant vessels and actually been engaged against the enemy upward of a hundred and twenty times in which service he had lost his right eye and right arm, and had been severely wounded and bruised in his body. Early in 1798, Nelson went out in the vanguard to rejoin Lord St. Vincent off Cadiz. He was immediately dispatched with a squadron into the Mediterranean to watch an armament known to be fitting out at Toulon, the destination of which excited much anxiety. It sailed May the 20th, attacked and took Malta, and then proceeded, as Nelson supposed, to Egypt. Strengthened by a powerful reinforcement, he made all sail for Alexandria, but there no enemy had been seen or heard of. He returned in haste along the north coast of the Mediterranean to Sicily, refreshed the fleet, and again sailed to the eastward. On nearing Alexandria the second time, August the 1st, he had the pleasure of seeing the object of his toilsome cruise moored in Abukir Bay in line of battle. It appeared afterward that the two fleets must have crossed each other on the night of June the 22nd. The French fleet consisted of 13 ships of the line and four frigates, the British of the same number of ships of the line and one 50-gun ship. In number of guns and men, the French had a decided superiority. It was evening before the British fleet came up. The battle began at half past six, night closed in at seven, and the struggle was continued through the darkness, a magnificent and awful spectacle to thousands who watched the engagement 
with eager anxiety. Victory was not long doubtful. The first two ships of the French line were dismasted in a quarter of an hour. The third, fourth and fifth were taken by Huffpast 8. About ten, the Lorient, Admiral Bruy's flagship, blew up. By daybreak, the two rear ships, which had not been engaged, cut their cables and stood out to sea, in company with two frigates, leaving nine ships of the line in the hands of the British, who were too much crippled to engage in pursuit. Two ships of the line and two frigates were burnt or sunk. Three out of the four ships which escaped were subsequently taken, and thus, of the whole armament, only a single frigate returned to France. This victory, the most complete and most important then known in naval warfare, raised Nelson to the summit of glory, and presents and honours were showered on him from all quarters. The gratitude of his country was expressed, inadequately in comparison with the rewards bestowed on others for less important services, by raising him to the peerage by the title of Baron Nelson of the Nile, with a pension of £2,000. The court of Naples, to which the Battle of Abukir was as reprieved from destruction, testified a due sense of its obligation by bestowing on him the dukedom and domain of Bronte in Sicily. The autumn of 1798, the whole of 1799 and part of 1800, Nelson spent in the Mediterranean, employed in the recovery of Malta, in protecting Sicily, and in cooperating to expel the French from the Neapolitan continental dominions. In 1800, various causes of discontent led him to solicit leave to return to England, where he was received with the enthusiasm due to his services. Soon afterward, he separated himself formally from Lady Nelson. In March 1801, he sailed as second in command of the expedition against Copenhagen, led by Sir Hyde Parker. The dilatoriousness with which it was conducted increased the difficulties of this enterprise and might have caused it to fail, had not Nelson's energy and talent been at hand to overcome the obstacles occasioned by this delay. The attack was entrusted to him by Sir Hyde Parker and executed April the 2nd with his usual promptitude and success. After a fierce engagement, with great slaughter on both sides, the greater part of the Danish line of defence was captured or silenced. Nelson then sent a flag of truce on shore, and an armistice was concluded. He bore honourable testimony to the gallantry of his opponents. The French, he said, fought bravely, but they could not have supported for one hour the fight which the Danes had supported for four May the 5th, Sir Hyde Parker was recalled and Nelson appointed commander-in-chief, but no further hostilities occurred and suffering greatly from the climate, he almost immediately returned home. For this battle, he was raised to the rank of Viscount. At this time, much alarm prevailed with respect to the meditated invasion of England and the command of the coast from Orfordness to Beachy Head was offered to him and accepted. But he thought the alarm idle, he felt the service to be irksome, and gladly retired from it at the Peace of Amiens. When war was renewed in 1803, he took the command of the Mediterranean fleet. For more than a year he kept his station off Toulon, eagerly watching for the French fleet. In January 1805 it put to sea, and escaped the observation of his lookout ships. He made for Egypt, and failing to meet with them, returned to Malta, where he found information that they had been dispersed in a gale and forced to put back to Toulon. Villeneuve put to sea again, March the 31st, formed a junction with the Spanish fleet in Cadiz, and sailed for the West Indies. Thither Nelson followed him, after considerable delay for want of information and from contrary winds, but the enemy still eluded his pursuit, and he was obliged to retrace his anxious course to Europe without the longed-for meeting, and with no other satisfaction than that of having frustrated by his diligence their designs on the English colonies. 
June the 20th, 1805, he landed at Gibraltar, that being the first time that he had set foot ashore since June the 16th, 1803. After cruising in search of the enemy till the middle of August, he was ordered to Portsmouth, where he learned that an indecisive action had taken place between the combined fleets returning from the West Indies and the British under Sir Robert Calder. Nelson at Trafalgar He had not been many days established at home before certain news arrived that the French and Spanish fleets had entered Cadiz. Eager to gain the reward of his long watchings and laborious pursuit, he again offered his services, which were gladly accepted. He embarked at Portsmouth, September the 14th, 1805, on board the Victory, to take the command of the fleet lying off Cadiz under Admiral Collingwood, his early friend and companion in the race of fame. The last battle in which Nelson was engaged was fought off Cape Trafalgar, October the 21st, 1805. The enemy were superior in number of ships and still more in size and weight of metal. Nelson bore down on them in two lines, heading one himself, while Collingwood, in the Royal Sovereign, led the other, which first entered into action. See, cried Nelson, as the Royal Sovereign cut through the centre of the enemy's line and muzzle to muzzle engaged a three-decker. See how that noble fellow Collingwood carries his ships into action. Collingwood, on the other hand, said to his captain, Rotherham, what would Nelson give to be here? As the victory approached, an incessant raking fire was directed against her, by which fifty of her men were killed and wounded before a single gun was returned. Nelson steered for his old opponent at Cape St. Vincent, the Santissima Trinidad, distinguished by her size, and opened his fire at four minutes after twelve, engaging the redoubtable with his starboard, the Santissima Trinidad and Bucentaur with his larboard guns. About a quarter past one, a musket ball, fired from the mizzen top of the redoubtable, struck him on the left shoulder, and he fell. From the first, he felt the wound to be mortal. He suffered intense pain, yet still preserved the liveliest interest in the fate of the action, and the joy visible in his countenance, as often as the hurrahs of the crew announced that an enemy had struck, testified how near his heart, even in the agonies of death, was the accomplishment of the great work to which his life had been devoted. He lived to know that his victory was complete and glorious, and expired tranquilly at half-past four. His last words were, Thank God I have done my duty. He had indeed done his duty and completed his task, for thenceforth no hostile fleet presumed to contest the dominion of the sea. It may seem mournful that he did not survive to enjoy the thanks and honours with which a grateful country would have rejoiced to recompense this crowning triumph. But he had reached the pinnacle of fame, and his death in the hour of victory has tended far more than a few years of peaceful life to keep alive his memory in the hearts of a people which loved and a navy which adored him. End of section 12「Section 13 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Israel Putnam, 1718 to 1790. Israel Putnam, the redoubtable hero of Indian and French adventure in the old colonial wars, the survivor of many a revolutionary fight, was born at Salem, Massachusetts, January 7, 1718. His grandfather, from the south of England, was one of the first settlers of the place. The boy was brought up with his father on the farm. He had little education in literature, much in the development of a hardy, vigorous constitution in his contest with the soil and the actual world about him. 
He was fond of athletic exercises and adept in running and wrestling, in which he proved himself more than a match for his village companions. The story is told of his being insulted for his rusticity on his first visit to Boston by a youth of twice his size when he taught the citizen better manners by a sound flogging. Before he was of age, he was married to the daughter of John Pope of Salem and presently removed with his wife to a farm in the town of Pomfret in eastern Connecticut. His rugged powers were no doubt sufficiently taxed in the ordinary labors of the field. In those days, the farmer had enemies to encounter, which have since vanished from the land. The well-known fable of Aesop of the boy and the wolf had then a literal application. Every child in the days of our fathers knew the story of Putnam and the she-wolf which he dragged from its den. This and similar tales go far to make up the popular reputation of the hero, and it was as a man of the people that Putnam first appears upon the public scene. Upon the breaking out of the old French war, as it was termed, at the age of 37, he drew together a band of his neighbors and reported himself with the Connecticut contingent before Crown Point. He appears to have been employed in this service under Major Rogers, the celebrated partisan ranger whose life he is said to have saved in an encounter with a stalwart Frenchman. Putnam conducted himself as a man of resources and valor in this mixed species of warfare in achieving a reputation which brought him, in 1757, the commission of major from the Connecticut legislature. It was the year of the memorable massacre at Fort William Henry. Putnam was with the forces whose headquarters were at the neighboring Fort Edward under the command of General Webb and made several vigorous attempts to assist in the support of the beleaguered fortress, but his efforts were not seconded by the commander who ungenerously left the fort a prey to Montcalm and the Indians. These adventures of Putnam displayed his personal courage in approaching the enemy on Lake George and subsequently in command of his rangers in rescuing a party of his fellow soldiers from an an Indian ambuscade at Fort Edward. The year 1758 saw Major Putnam again in the field, under the command of Abercrombie, at the scene of his former labors in the vicinity of Lake George. In the early movements of the campaign, Putnam distinguished himself in an ambuscade by a destructive night attack upon a party of the enemy at Wood Creek. When the main line advanced towards Ticonderoga, he was with the lamented Lord Howe in the front of the center when that much-loved officer was slain upon the march. It was the first meeting after the landing from Lake George with the advance of the French troops. There was some skirmishing which attracted the attention of the officers. Putnam advanced to the spot, accompanied, contrary to his dissuasions, by Lord Howe, who fell at the first fire. The party of Putnam enraged by this disaster, fought with gallantry and inflicted a heavy loss upon their opponents. The result of this miserably conducted expedition, however, made no amends for the loss of the gallant Howe. Two thousand men were blunderingly sacrificed before Ticonderoga, and the threatened siege was abandoned. The life of Putnam is full of perilous encounters incident to border service against the Indians. In one of these, he narrowly avoided capture by the savages on the Hudson, near Fort Miller. He escaped only by shooting the rapids with his boat, a marvelous adventure which is said to have wakened a superstitious veneration for him in the minds of his Indian assailants. Not long afterwards, however, the barbarians had an opportunity of treating him with less respect. It was in the month of August of this year that he was engaged with a reconnoitering party in company with the partisan Rogers near Ticonderoga. They had been employed in watching the movements of the enemy and were on their return to Fort Edward when the attention of the French partisan officer Molang, who was on lookout, was attracted to them by a careless shooting match between Rogers and a fellow British officer. A confused hand-to-hand -hand action ensued in the woods, in the course of which Putnam, his gun missing fire, while the muzzle was pressed against the breast of a large and well-proportioned savage, was captured and bound to a tree by that formidable personage. The English party, now rallying, drove their pursuers backwards, which brought the unfortunate Putnam to a central position between two fires. 
Human imagination, Wells says Colonel Humphreys, can hardly figure to itself a more deplorable situation. Putnam remained more than an hour deprived of all power save that of hearing and vision, as the musket balls whizzed by his ears with a ruthless savage aiming his tomahawk repeatedly with the infernal dexterity of a Chinese juggler within a hair's breadth of his person. This amusement was succeeded by the attempt of a French petty officer to put an end to his life by discharging his musket against his breast. It happily missed fired. The action was now brought to an end in favor of the provincials, but Putnam was carried off in a retreat by his Indian captor. He was now destined to witness one of those scenes, since so well described by Cooper, of the peculiar tortures inflicted by the Indians upon their prisoners of war, but unhappily with less complacent feelings than the reader of the skillful novelist experiences, whose terrors are tempted by the delightful art of the narrator. With Putnam, the spectator and the sufferer were the same. He has been bound on the march with intolerable thongs. He has almost perished under his burdens. He has been tomahawked in the face. He now is to be roasted alive. A dark forest is selected for the sacrifice. Stripped naked, he is bound to a tree, and the inflammable brushwood piled around him. Savage voices sound his death knell. Fire is applied when a sudden shower dampens the flame to burst forth again with renewed strength. Though securely fastened, the limbs of the victim are left some liberty to shrink from the accursed heat. He has thought his last thought of home, of wife, and children. When the desperate French partisan Molang, the commander of the savage hordes, hearing of the act, rushes upon the scene and rescues him from his tormentors. Putnam is now restored to the guardianship of the Indian chief by whom he had been captured and from whom he was separated during these hours of agony when he had fallen into the hands of the baser fellows of the tribe. The party now reached Ticonderoga, where Putnam is delivered to Montcalm and thence courteously conducted by a French officer to Montreal. There he found himself within reach of a benevolent American officer, then a prisoner in the city, Colonel Peter Schuler, who generously ministered to his necessities and who was instrumental in procuring his release from the French commander when he himself was exchanged after the capture of Fontenac. Putnam, on his return home, gallantly conducted through the wilderness the sorely tried Mrs. Howe and her children, whose adventures in Indian captivity and among the French equal the inventive pages of romance. The next year, in Amherst's great campaign, Putnam returned to Montreal under better auspices. He was with that commander in his onward movement, with the rank of lieutenant colonel, and rendered efficient service in the passage down the St. Lawrence by his bravery and ingenuity. When the fort of Oswegatchie was attacked and two armed vessels were in the way, he proposed to silence the latter by driving wedges to hinder the movement of their rudders and to cross the abatis of the fortification by an attack from boats armed with long planks, which were to be let down when the vessels, protected by the fascines, were placed alongside of the work. A timely surrender anticipated both of these expedients. The dying wolf had conquered Canada at Quebec, making victory easy elsewhere in the province. Montreal surrendered to the Allied forces without a blow. Putnam, it is recorded, availed himself of the opportunity to look up the Indian chief who had taken him prisoner and exchange civilities and hospitalities now that the tables were turned. We next find Putnam in charge of a Connecticut regiment in a novel field of warfare on the coast of Cuba in Lord Albemarle's attack upon Havana in 1762. He was in considerable danger in a storm when the transport in which he embarked with his men was wrecked upon a reef of the island. A landing was effected by rafts and a fortified camp established on the shore. He was again fortunate in escaping the dangers of a climate so fatal to his countrymen. On his return home, he was engaged in service against the Indians with the title of Colonel. The war being now over, he retired to his farm, which he continued to cultivate till he was again called to the field by the stirring summons of Lexington. 
In the preliminary scenes of the war, he fairly represented the feelings of the mass of his countrymen as it was excited by the successive acts of parliamentary aggression. As a soldier of the old French war, he had learned the weakness of British officers in America and the strength of hardy patriotic peasantry. If, he said, it required six years for the combined forces of England and her colonies to conquer such a feeble colony as Canada, it would, at least, take a very long time for England alone to overcome her own widely extended colonies, which were much stronger. Another anecdote is characteristic of the blunt farmer. Being once asked whether he did not seriously believe that a well-appointed British army of 5,000 veterans could march through the whole continent of America, he replied, No doubt, if they behaved civilly and paid well for everything they wanted, but if they should attempt it in a hostile manner, though the American men were out of question, the women, with their ladles and broomsticks, would knock them all on the head before they had got halfway through. The news of Lexington, the war message, transmitted from hand to hand till village repeated it to village, the sea to the backwoods, found the farmer Pomfret two days after the conflict, like Cincinnatus, literally at the plow. He unyoked his team and hastened in his rude dress to the camp. Summoning the forces of Connecticut, he was placed at their head with the rank of major general and stood ready at Cambridge for the bloody day of Bunker's Hill. He was in service in May in the spirited affair, checking the British supplies from Noodles Island in Boston Harbor and resolutely counseled the occupation of the Heights of Charleston. When the company of Prescott went forth on the night of June 16th to their gallant work, he was with them, taking no active command, but assisting where opportunity served. He was seen in different parts of the field, but his chief exhortations appear to have been expended upon the attempted fortification of Bunker's Hill, where he met the fugitives in the retreat and conducted such of them as would obey him, says Bancroft, to the night's encampment at Prospect Hill. Putnam's was one of the first congressional appointments, ten days before the battle, when the rank of major general was conferred upon him. He continued to serve at the Siege of Boston, and when the theater of operations was changed by the departure of the British to New York, was placed by Washington in 1776 in command in that city until his own arrival. He employed himself during this short period with several devices for the safety of the harbor. In August, on the landing of Howe, he was, upon the sudden illness of Green, who had directed the fortifications, and after the arrival of the British, left in command at the Battle of Long Island. And much censure has been thrown upon him for the neglect of the passes by which the American left was turned. In the actual combat, there appears to have been a divided authority. The abandonment of New York next followed, with the retreat to Westchester and the passage through the Jerseys, Putnam was then, in January 1777, ordered to Philadelphia to make provision for its defense. In May, he was put in command of the post at the Highlands to secure its defenses and observe, from that central position, the movements of the enemy. In the summer of this year, Sir Henry Clinton, at New York, sent up the river a flag of truce to claim one Edmund Palmer, who had been taken in the American camp as a lieutenant in the British service. This drew forth from Putnam a reply which has been often quoted. Headquarters, August 7th, 1777. Edmund Palmer, an officer in the enemy service, was taken as a spy lurking within our lines. He has been tried as a spy, condemned as a spy, and shall be executed as a spy, and the flag is ordered to depart immediately. Israel Putnam. P.S. He has been accordingly executed. In September, a portion of Putnam's command was withdrawn by Washington for the support of the army in Pennsylvania by a preemptory order which, it is said, put an end to a plan formed by Putnam for a separate attack on the enemy at New York. Forts Montgomery and Clinton, at the entrance to the Highlands, fell into the hands of Clinton by a surprise shortly after, but the conquest of this important position was neutralized by the victory of Gates at Saratoga. The British remained at Fort Montgomery but 20 days. 
Putnam seems still to have entertained some project in connection with New York, which led him to withhold troops called for by the imperious necessities of Washington. The neglect of these orders brought a pointed letter from Hamilton and an equally sufficient rebuke from Washington himself. In the following spring, Putnam was relieved of his command in the Highlands by the appointment of General McDougall to the post and was ordered to Connecticut to superintend the raising of the new levies. He was stationed the following winter at Danbury when the famous descent of the precipice at Horse Neck occurred, one of the latest marvels of Putnam's anecdotal career. While he was on a visit to one of his outposts at Horse Neck, Governor Tyrone of New York advanced upon the place with a considerable body of troops. Putnam planted his small force on a hill, but was speedily compelled to provide for the safety of his men by a retreat and for his own by plunging down a formidable rocky steep by the roadside. In 1779, he was again in the Highlands, superintending the defenses, then erected at West Point, one of which, the fort now in ruins, bore his name. In the winter, he visited his family in Connecticut, and as he was returning to the army at Morristown, was struck with paralysis. His right side was enfeebled, and his active career ceased, though he enjoyed the cheerful, tranquil pursuits of age. His memory remained unimpaired. One of his amusements was to relate to his friend and military companion, Colonel Humphreys, those events of his varied life, which that officer wrought into the pleasing narrative appropriately addressed to the State Society of the Cincinnati in Connecticut and published by their order. The dedication of the work to Colonel Jeremiah Wadsworth bears date June 4, 1788, about two years before the decease of the hero of the story. General Putnam died at Brookline, Connecticut, May 29, 1790, in his 73rd year. End of Section 13. Section 14 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Anthony Wayne by O.C. Bosbyshell, 1745-1796. Across the pages of history recording mighty conflicts that rock nations and governments to their foundation, flash certain grand characters whose career adds a charm to the dreary and often prosaic narrative. Some bright particular star whose luster flings romance over dry facts, firing the hearts of all patriots with enthusiasm and national fervor. Honoring the great commanders of the wars of the ages for their noble deeds, here and there sparkles out the brilliant genius of a warrior with less responsibility, but whose name inspires the ardor of men, the love of women, and the fervor of the poet and novelist. Such a character, such a man, was Mad Anthony Wayne, an able, fearless soldier of the American Revolution. So thoroughly patriotic, such an earnest, honest believer in the righteous cause for which he fought, that he was mad indeed with all found arrayed against the interests of the colonists, or with those who, having donned the continental uniform, were indisposed to fight. Anthony Wayne was born in Waynesboro, East Town Township, Chester County, Pennsylvania, on January 1, 1745. He sprang from good English stock. His grandfather resided in Yorkshire, England, but during the reign of Charles II, purchased an estate in the county Wicklow, Ireland, and settled on it. Being a thorough Protestant, he espoused the cause of King William III, and in the service of that monarch, fought in the Battle of the Boyne as a captain of dragoons. In 1722, he came to America with his four sons and procured some 1,600 acres of land in Chester County, Pennsylvania, upon which he settled in 1724. His youngest son, Isaac, the father of Anthony Wayne, received as his share of his father's estate 500 acres of land near Powley. Born and brought up amid the charming surroundings of this most beautiful country, it is easily understood why Anthony Wayne became so thoroughly imbued with the tastes for the beautiful. 
his neatness in dress and earnest advocacy of a brilliant uniform for officers and men of the Revolutionary Army had its foundation in the very atmosphere he lived in, this magnificent Chester Valley. Dandy Wayne, indeed, but only so far as neatness in dress and delicacy of taste were concerned. For a nobler-minded, more unselfish patriot never entered the army of a nation. Wayne was educated at the Philadelphia Academy, and he became a surveyor of some note. He attended closely, however, to his magnificent farm and took a lively interest in all affairs affecting his fellow citizens. In 1765 and 66, only just of age, he was sent to Nova Scotia to survey some lands belonging to Benjamin Franklin and others. In May 1766, he married Mary, the daughter of Bartholomew Penrose, a Philadelphia merchant, and settled down to the life of a farmer. He was a stirring man in his neighborhood, fond of an active and outdoor life. He was filled with military impulses. His choice of profession, that of surveyor, evidently arose from his taste for exploration and for the excitement incident to plunging into trackless wastes of forest and mapping out new boundaries. His love of military pursuits led him to study all the great works on the art of war, and when the time came he was prepared, as few soldiers of the Revolution were, for the conflict against the trained soldiers of Great Britain. He formed companies with the men in his neighborhood and drilled them assiduously. This gave him prominence and popularity, so that he is found a member of the Pennsylvania legislature in 1774 through 75. Wayne seemed to have prescience of what was coming, and when the conflict came, he was ready. In September 1775, he raised a regiment of soldiers, of which he became the colonel in January the following, and joined General Sullivan's command in Canada in the spring of 1776. At the Battle of Three Rivers, May 1776, Wayne displayed remarkable military knowledge and was enabled to extricate his command from difficulties that seemed almost insurmountable. In a letter to Dr. Franklin and others, he gives a graphic description of his engagement. Of his men engaged, he says, I have lost more than one quarter part, together with a slight touch in my right leg, which is partly well already. This was Wayne's first battle. He displayed such remarkable coolness and excellent judgment throughout his engagement as to command the respect and admiration of all the army. His entire career during this unfortunate Canadian campaign exhibited clearly his soldierly qualifications. Recognizing these, General Schuler, in November 1776, appointed Colonel Wayne to the command of Fort Ticonderoga and Mount Independence, for which military post Wayne considered the second most important in the country. While stationed there, Wayne busied his men in rendering the place as nearly impregnable as possible, and by warm, fervid letters implored the powers that be in Pennsylvania to send proper clothing, food, and arms to the men of that state serving in his army. So negligent did the state seem to the needs of its men that this warm-hearted, high-spirited warrior seriously thought of resigning his commission, being unable to longer witness the impoverished condition of his troops. Colonel Wayne was appointed Brigadier General in February 1777 and ordered to join General Washington's army at Morristown, New Jersey, in April of the same year. He was given command of the Pennsylvania Line, consisting of two brigades of four regiments each, with a total strength of about 1,700 men. His activity and alertness during the summer in harassing and annoying the enemy went far toward ridding the state of that enemy and gaining for him the praise of Washington, who publicly acknowledged his bravery and good conduct. The British, unable to force their way through New Jersey, determined to go around by sea to Philadelphia and, after embarking at Staten Island, were next heard from within the Chesapeake Bay. Washington moved his army to Wilmington, Wayne having been sent ahead to organize the militia rendezvousing in Chester County, Pennsylvania. He rejoined the army at Germantown and marched with it to Wilmington. In the Battle of Brandywine, September 11, 1777, Wayne was particularly distinguished. 
he occupied the left of the American line at Chad's Ford and had opposed to his forces the Hessians, commanded by Baron von Neffossen. He fought all day, holding his ground tenaciously, repelling every effort made by the enemy to cross the ford and worrying them by repeated attacks of his light infantry, which he frequently sent over the creek for the purpose. The right wing of the enemy having been turned, Wayne at sunset retreated in good order without the loss of any artillery or stores. On the evening of September 20th, Wayne, with a detachment of 1,200 men, was suddenly and impetuously attacked at Powley Tavern by a very large force of the rear guard of the British Army, which rear guard he had been sent to annoy. By the betrayal of Tory spies at the time of the attack, the forces were not more than 10 yards distant. Notwithstanding the impetuosity of the attack, by largely overwhelming numbers, Wayne succeeded in extricating his command without loss of artillery, ammunition, or stores. Some 61 Americans were killed. A court of inquiry was instituted to inquire into Wayne's conduct of this affair, which resulted so distastefully to him that he demanded a court-martial. This court-martial acquitted him with highest honors, a conclusion approved by General Washington. Wayne's residence was searched by the British immediately after the Powley fight, with the hope of capturing the general. The officer, in his zeal, ripped open a feather bed with his sword. Mrs. Wayne indignantly exclaimed, Do you expect to find General Wayne in a feather bed? Look where the fight is the thickest. Wayne led the right wing at the Battle of Germantown, October 4, 1777, and forced the enemy back a distance of two miles. The British claim that this was the first time we had ever retreated from the Americans. The balance of the army, failing to accomplish the end desired, Wayne was compelled to retreat. But this he did in good order, and when General Howe, who could not persuade himself that we had run from victory, as Wayne puts it, followed the Americans, Wayne drew up in line. When he advanced near, we gave him a few cannon shot with some musketry, which caused him to break and run with the utmost confusion. Wayne lost a horse in this engagement and received slight wounds in the hand and foot. The memorable winter at Valley Forge followed. General Wayne, ever active, devoted his time to procuring necessary supplies for the army. His earnest appeals to the state authorities and men of influence for the welfare of the brave men at Valley Forge tell a tale of suffering and endurance hard to realize. Early in the spring of 1778, he successfully raided the British lines, carrying off horses, cattle, forage, and other supplies. After the evacuation of Philadelphia, Wayne kept up a constant annoyance around the rear of the British Army, fighting whenever the opportunity came. The American Army re-entered New Jersey in June 1778 and moved across that state in a line parallel with the route taken by the British Army. These lines encountered one another on June 28th at Monmouth, an engagement fought in the main on the plan suggested to General Washington by General Wayne. General Charles Lee's half-hearted action, to call it no more severe name, resulted in the Battle of Monmouth being less of a disaster to the British Army than it promised. Wayne did his part gloriously. Lee, who with his own command was in full retreat when he should have earnestly supported Wayne, ordered Wayne to retire. This the latter did, chagrined and mortified, until the mortification was turned into delight upon meeting the commander-in-chief, who immediately ordered Wayne to advance to the attack again. This is just what Wayne wanted, and with three Pennsylvania regiments, one from Maryland and one from Virginia, he stayed the assaults of the flower of the English army, the corps d'élite, and successfully held his line, causing the enemy to retire with great loss. General Washington commended General Wayne in the highest terms for his good conduct and bravery through the whole action. Writing of this engagement to the Secretary of War, Wayne says, Tell the Phila ladies that the heavenly, sweet, pretty redcoats, the accomplished gentlemen of the guard, and grenadiers have humbled themselves on the plains of Monmouth. The enemy retreated to New York and remained in that city the balance of the year. 
Wayne occupied the time in urging active operations and trying to infuse a more aggressive spirit into the management of affairs. At this time, public affairs were very much hampered by a feeling of indifference as well as an elusive notion that peace would soon follow. This affected the nation and the army. Wayne baffled these false ideas with all his powers. He urged the government to forward needed supplies of clothing and food. He could not be inactive, fervid, earnest, and aggressive. He must be ever doing. The American army kept a close watch on the movements of the British in New York during the summer and fall of 1779. General Washington organized a light infantry corps and put General Wayne in command. It was considered one of the finest bodies of troops attached to the Continental Army and was composed, besides the choicest sons of Pennsylvania, with two Connecticut and one Virginia regiment. The commander-in-chief was extremely desirous of driving the British from the forts commanding King's Ferry on the Hudson at Stony Point on the western bank of the river and at Verplanck's Point, directly opposite. This dangerous business was confided to Wayne and his light infantry corps, the plan of operations being carefully prepared by General Washington. This plan was followed by Wayne, except one particular, which change Washington declared to be an improvement on his own plan. Wayne, after the most careful preparations, moved to the assault on Stony Point, a fortification strongly built on a rocky eminence 150 feet above the Hudson River at 12 o'clock at night on July 16, 1779. Wayne's report to Washington tells the story of the fight most graphically. He says he gave the troops the most pointed orders not to attempt to fire, but to put their whole dependence on the bayonet, which was mostly faithful and literally observed, neither the deep morass, the formidable and double rows of abatis, or the high and strong works in front and flank could damp the ardor of the troops, who, in the face of a most tremendous and incessant fire of musketry, and from artillery loaded with shells and grapeshot, forced their way at the point of bayonet through every obstacle, both columns meeting in the center of the enemy's works nearly at the same instant. Before entering the fort, Wayne was struck in the head by a musket ball. He fell stunned, but soon rallied, and, by the assistance of two of his aides, was helped into the fortification and shared the capture with his troops. The Stony Point achievement roused the patriotic spirit of the Americans. It was deemed the most brilliant affair of the war. Congratulations from the commander-in-chief and all the prominent generals, as well as the foremost citizens and assemblies, were heaped upon Wayne and Congress voted him a gold medal to commemorate his gallant conduct. Besides thanking him for his brave, prudent, and soldier-like conduct in the well-conducted attack on Stony Point. After the treachery of Arnold in 1780, the charge of the fort at West Point was committed to General Wayne. He marched his division over the mountain in a dark night, a distance of 16 miles in four hours, without a single halt or a man left behind. In January 1781, owing to the broken promises of Congress, a large number of men in the Pennsylvania line mutinied, an event that threatened serious consequences to the American army. This defection was suppressed peaceably, mainly through the excellent tact of General Wayne. He was idolized by his soldiers, who knew him as the soul of honor, and who placed implicit trust in his statements. Washington, in a letter, certifies to his great share in preventing worse extremities, and thanks him for his exertions. In February 1781, Wayne was ordered to join General Greene's army, then operating in South Carolina. But upon Lord Cornwallis's rapidly transferring his forces to Virginia, this order was changed, and Wayne was directed to reinforce Lafayette. This he did at Fredericksburg in June. The enemy seemed intent upon destroying all military stores they could reach, and for this purpose continually sent raiding parties through the state. The efforts of Wayne were ever put forth to suppress these raids, believing on July 6, 1781, that Cornwallis's forces were divided by the James River, Wayne was sent forward to attack them at Greensprings. He found a great force of the British Army in his front. 
Too late to retreat, Wayne, with true soldierly instinct, having faith in the courage and discipline of his men, boldly charged a force five times as large as his own, threw them into disorder, and safely brought his men away under the cover of the enemy's confusion. Cornwallis hastened to Yorktown, the investiture and siege of which Wayne aided in furthering, first by occupying the ground south of the James River to prevent the enemy's reaching North Carolina, and then in opening the first parallel with six regiments on October 6, 1781. A few days afterward, he, with two battalions, covered the Pennsylvania and Maryland troops while they began the second parallel. Wayne, with the Pennsylvania regiments, supported the French troops in the attack of the 14th and was present at the surrender on the 19th. Notwithstanding a wound in the fleshy part of his leg, early in the siege, caused by a sentry mistaking him, Wayne remained active and participated in the glory of the capture of Cornwallis and his army. This operation over, Wayne joined the army of General Nathaniel Green in South Carolina in January 1782 and was instrumental in quelling the disturbances in that section. A very large force of Indians threatened the destruction of his command on the night of June 23, 1782. These Indians were skillfully handled by a noted Creek chief, as well as by a British officer. They surrounded Wayne's forces and held his artillery. Wayne fiercely attacked, using only the bayonet, and so impetuous was his onslaught that he broke the lines of the Indians and routed them completely. The dead body of the Creek leader, who it is said was felled by Wayne's own sword, was found on the ground the next day. Wayne commanded the forces that took possession of Savannah and Charleston after their evacuation by the British. Having freed the South from all marauders, Wayne returned, much shattered in health from the effect of a low fever, to his old home in Pennsylvania and settled down to civil life, desiring, as he puts it, to pass many happy hours in domestic felicity with a few of our friends, unfettered by any public employ and consequently unenvied. He was, however, made a member of the Council of Censors and, in 1784, represented his county in the General Assembly of Pennsylvania. He was likewise, in 1787, a member of the Convention of the State called to ratify the Constitution of the United States. To better look after an estate given him by the state of Georgia in recognition of the services he rendered that state, Wayne settled there and was elected a member of Congress on January 3, 1791. He served from October 1791 to March 1792, when, a contest being made, Congress decided his election illegal and declared his seat vacant. Almost immediately after this action, on April 3, 1792, President Washington appointed Wayne Commander-in-Chief of the United States Army with the rank of Major General, an appointment confirmed by the Senate on the same day. No more single act could have marked the approval of Wayne's great services to the nation in the War of the Revolution than this great mark of approbation conferred by his illustrious chief. To him was entrusted the settlement of the difficulties then existing with the Indians in the Northwestern Territory. These savages, stirred up by the British, armed with British guns and often led by British officers, continued the warfare on the Americans after peace had been declared between the contending countries. Efforts to subjugate them under Generals Harmar and St. Clair had failed. General Wayne, whose entire life clearly shows a man prepared for what may come, wisely drilled the force he collected to undertake this work for a year. He knew the value of a well-drilled and disciplined army. Having perfected his troops, he, by easy stages, advanced into the disturbed territory, establishing posts at various points, which he cleverly fortified, and upon every occasion and opportunity offered the savages peace. These offers were as often rejected, 
from Fort Defiance, a fort he built and named at the junction of the Miami and La Glaze Rivers. He, in August 1794, went down the Miami River with about 1,000 men until he came close to a British post at the foot of the rapids of the river. Here he sent a last overture to the Indians, promising peace if they would lay down their arms. Upon their rejecting this, he, on August 20th, moved to the head of the rapids and attacked them with such vigor, using again his favorite weapon, the bayonet, that their defeat was overwhelming. The entire surrounding country was laid waste. The army advanced to the junction of the St. Joseph and St. Mary's rivers, where a strong fort was built and named Fort Wayne. The present flourishing city of that name in Indiana now stands upon this spot. The winter was spent in Greenville, at which place the Indians, on August 3, 1795, against the wishes of their leaders and English allies, signed a treaty of peace in which twelve tribes took part, a peace which was never broken and by which an immense territory was ceded to the United States and opened up for settlement. Wayne returned early in 1796 on a short visit to Pennsylvania and everywhere en route received the plaudits of his fellow citizens. His reputation in Philadelphia was exceedingly brilliant. The unsettled condition of affairs in the Northwest, however, made his stay brief, having been appointed sole commissioner to treat with the disaffected parties there and directed to take possession of all forts held by the British in that country, he returned in June of the same year. With great tact, he performed wisely and well the difficult mission entrusted to him. In November, he left Detroit to visit the last of the posts included in his orders. This was then called Presque Isle, but is now the site of the city of Erie, when within a short sail of this post, a severe and sudden attack of the gout came on. He was carried into the blockhouse at Presque Isle in a dying condition and lingered in great agony until December 15, 1796, when he died. By his own desire, he was buried at the foot of the flagstaff on a high hill called Garrison Hill, north of the present soldier's home. In 1809, his son, Colonel Isaac Wayne, removed the body to the family burying ground at St. David's Church, Radnor, Pennsylvania, where, on July 4th of the same year, the Society of Cincinnati erected a monument in his honor. So lived, so died, Anthony Wayne, gentleman, soldier, statesman, patriot, mad, dandy, black snake, tornado, angry with traitors, neat, courageous, irresistible. None can study his life without feeling the nobleness of his character, courtly in manners, honorable to a degree, high in aspirations, unselfishly for country, magnanimous in victory, loyal to authority, affectionate to family, pure in morality, and earnest for the right. Anthony Wayne's life is a bright example and legacy to the American youth of all times. End of section 14. Section 15 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2, by Charles F. Horn. Frances Marion, 1732 to 1795. Frances Marion, the partisan general of South Carolina, was of Huguenot descent, the first American settlers of the same name being Benjamin Marion and Judith Blanet, his wife, who came from France in 1690 and established themselves in a plantation on one of the tributaries of the Cooper River near Charleston. Gabriel, the son of Benjamin, married Esther Cords. These were the parents of Francis Marion. He was born, it would appear, in St. John's Parish, Berkeley County, probably in 1732. His early life was passed till his 27th year in agricultural pursuits, when we first hear of him in connection with military matters in the period of the Old French War. 
He took the field with Moultrie and fought gallantly by the side of that officer in the Cherokee country against the savages at the Battle of Akohi. He then returned to his farm near Utah Springs, ripening for the work of the revolution, which found him at the height of manhood, at the age of 43. The people of his district relied upon his understanding, for we find them sending him as their delegate to the Provincial Congress of 1775, when he was appointed captain in the regiment of his former superior officer, Colonel Moultrie. His first duty was to gather a company, which he speedily effected in the eastern region, where he was well known. He was then employed in the neighborhood of Charleston, being engaged in the occupation of Fort Johnson and the command of Dorchester. He was with Moultrie at Sullivan's Island in May 1776, during that fierce day of battle when the British were driven from the southern colonies and particularly distinguished himself in the gallant defense. At the ill-managed attack upon Savannah by the combined forces of Destin and Lincoln, which ended so disastrously for the Americans, Marion was present with his regiment, which did much by its gallantry to redeem the honor, if not the fortunes, of the day. Next came, in the winter of 1780, the Siege of Charleston by Sir Henry Clinton. It was evident from the beginning that the city must fall, and it has been a point much discussed whether Lincoln should have attempted to defend it, whether it would not have been better for the cause that he should withdraw his troops and besiege the British from the open country. This was what afterward took place when the conquerors were reduced almost to starvation. An accident which happened to Marion has been esteemed a piece of singular good fortune to the cause in saving him from surrender. He was in command of the small body of light troops outside the city when he was called to aid in the defense. During the first days of the very deliberate investment, he was dining with some friends in the town when, according to a custom not unusual in those hard-drinking times, the door was locked that no one should avoid his share of the conviviality. Determined to escape the infliction, he threw himself from the window into the street. The fall fractured his ankle and incapacitated him from service. In obedience to an order of Lincoln, commanding all officers unfit for duty to retire from the city, he left while the country was still open and took refuge in his native region of St. John. His freedom was thus preserved for the service of his country. Now came the incursions of Tarleton and the devastating warfare of Cornwallis, a policy of savage extermination which would have driven a people with less capability of exertion to despair. But it happened, as it has before, that the very means employed to crush excited the spirit of resistance and deliverers were raised up for the oppressed. It was a peculiar species of warfare which was now entered upon, requiring novel resources both for attack and defense. A thinly inhabited country was the scene of operations, cut up in all directions by rivers and their branches and innumerable swamps. Large bodies of troops could move only with difficulty. It was a service for small parties of cavalry always in movement, making up by rapidity for want of numbers. On the side of the British, Lieutenant Colonel Tarleton, an officer of spirit whose fiery youth has been vividly handed down to us in the portrait by Sir Joshua Reynolds, was the leading representative of this method of warfare, harrying the land with his mounted troops and overcoming by his activity and unscrupulousness. Success added terror to his name as he gained victory after victory and seemed destined to sweep the land of its patriot defenders. He was the right arm of Cornwallis in his movements in the interior and began to be deemed invincible when his course was arrested by Morgan, the Virginian, and his resolute companies of native defenders of the state at the Battle of Cowpens. But it was in Marion that the chief spirit of resistance was incorporated. 
on the arrival of Gates from the north, in command of the southern army, having partially recovered from his lameness, he presented himself before the hero of Saratoga on his march toward the fatal field of Camden. American commanders were accustomed to odd sights of dress and equipment in the Patriot soldiery who enlisted under their banners, and Gates must have been used to appearances with which the eye of Washington himself was but too familiar. The little band of Marion, however, seems to have astonished even their American brethren-in-arms. As for the well-equipped British, they always held the ragged American regiments in contempt till they were soundly flogged by them. An intelligent looker-on at the camp, Colonel Otho Williams, in his narrative of the campaign, speaks of Colonel Marion's arrival, quote, attended by a very few followers, distinguished by small leather caps and the wretchedness of their attire. Their number did not exceed 20 men and boys, some white, some black, and all mounted, but most of them miserably equipped. Their appearance was, in fact, so burlesque that it was with much difficulty the diversion of the regular soldiery was restrained by the officers, and the general himself was glad of an opportunity of detaching Colonel Marion at his own instance toward the interior of South Carolina with orders to watch the motions of the enemy and furnish intelligence. End quote. It was while Marion was engaged on this service that the Battle of Camden was fought, but luckily he had no share in the misadventure. He was employed, in fact, in quite an independent career of his own, organizing his own forces and acting at his own discretion. He was at the head of that system of partisan warfare which, in its developments, was to rid the state of the foreign foe. His present command, Marion's brigade was formed from the hardy-spirited population of Irish descent settled between the Santee and the Pedy in the territory of Williamsburg. They were convinced of the intentions of the British rulers at Charleston to reduce them to political servitude. They knew their rights and, knowing, dared to maintain them. Their movement was voluntary as they gathered their small but resolute force of picked men and called Marion to its command. He had already assumed it and caused the Tories to feel his new authority when the defeat of Gates took place. It roused him at once to a new effort to redeem the fortunes of war. He was already in the neighborhood of the field, and hearing that a British guard was on its way with a considerable body of prisoners, he determined to arrest the party on its march. Two days after the battle, he concerted an attack, and with the loss of but one man, killed and took 22 regulars and two Tories prisoners, and retook 150 Continentals of the Maryland line. He was now a recognized leader in the field, and the British commander-in-chief directed his efforts to his overthrow. I most sincerely hope, wrote Cornwallis to Tarleton, that you will get at Mr. Marion. But Mr. Marion was not so easily to be caught. On the appearance of a superior force under the command of Tarleton, which it would have been vain to resist, the skillful partisan turned his forces in another direction, to the borders of North Carolina, where he overawed the Scotch Tories in that disaffected region. The ruthless conduct of the British, whom he had left behind, now raised the South Carolinians to fresh resistance, when Marion, ever mindful of his opportunity, returned to the state with speed, accomplishing 60 miles in one day, and, in a bold night attack, defeated a large body of Tories on the Black Mingo. Following this up, with some smaller success of the kind, he again attracted the attention of Tarleton, who issued out of Charleston in force for his capture, and when he was fairly on his heels, wearied out and perplexed by the windings of his foe, gave up the chase, it is said, with the exclamation, Come, my boys, let us go back. We will soon find the Gamecock, Marion's brother partisan, Sumter, but... As for this damned swamp fox, the devil himself could not catch him. The tide was now turning as the people felt their strength. 
King's Mountain, in the autumn of this memorable 1780, brought a vast accession of the strength to the popular cause in the proof that the best British troops were not invincible before an aroused yeomanry. But there was much yet to be done before the day of final deliverance was secured. It was a slow, weary, harassing policy which was to be pursued of surprises and escapes, of self-denial and endurance, of the watchful, unyielding virtue of Marion and his men. They took post in an island fortress of a wooded swampland at the junction of the P.D. and Lynch's Creek, known as the Camp of Marion, where he recruited his forces, husbanded his strength, and sallied forth on his raids against the foe. This is the spot where the popular admiration of Marion finds its home and center. His career as a partisan, says his faithful biographer, the novelist Sims, in the thickets and swamps of Carolina is abundantly distinguished by the picturesque. But it was while he held his camp at Snow's Island that it received its highest colors of romance. In this snug and impenetrable fortress, he reminds us very much of the ancient feudal baron of France and Germany, who, perched on a castle eminence, looked down with the complacency of an eagle from his eyrie and marked all below him for his own. The resemblance is good in all respects but one. The plea and justification of Marion are complete. His warfare was legitimate. It is in this place the scene is laid of an interview with the British officer so familiar to the public in popular narratives and pictorial illustration. A flag from the enemy at the neighboring post of Georgetown is received with the design of an exchange of prisoners. The officer is admitted blindfold into the encampment and on the bandage being taken from his eyes is surprised equally at the diminutive size of the general and the simplicity of his quarters. He had expected, it is said, to see some formidable personage of the sons of Anak, of the standard military figure, which, as Mr. Sims remarks, averaged in the opposing generals during the war more than 200 pounds. On the contrary, he saw a swarthy, smoke-dried little man with scarcely enough of threadbare homespun to cover his nakedness, and instead of tall ranks of gay-dressed soldiers, a handful of sunburnt, yellow-legged militiamen, some roasting potatoes and some asleep, with their black firelocks and powder horns lying by them on the logs. This is Weems' narrative, a little colored with his full brush, but true enough as to detail. The improvement which he works up from the plain potato presented as a dinner to the officer is equally sound as a moral, though we will not vouch for the exact expression of the sentiment. As a specimen of Weems, it is characteristic, but certainly Marion never talked in the fashion of this zealous biographer. The Briton, however, entrenched at Charleston and with his double lines of forts encompassing the interior, was not all at once driven out. When he was compelled to leave, it was by the slow process of an exhaustion to which even victory contributed, for every British conquest in that region was as costly as a defeat. Green came with his Fabian policy, acquired in the school of Washington, to repair the errors of Gates. It was a course with which the policy of Marion was quite in agreement, attacking the enemy when they were vulnerable, at other moments retreating before them. Both officers knew well how to drain the vitality of the British army. Green appreciated Marion. I like your plan, he wrote to him, of frequently shifting your ground. We must endeavor to keep up a partisan war. He sent Lieutenant Colonel Lee to his aid, and together they attempted the capture of Georgetown in a night attack, which was but partially successful, in consequence of a loss of time and the want of artillery. Though not fully carried out, it served as a diversion and alarm in the rear of Cornwallis, who now, after the defeat of an important portion of his force under Tarleton, was advancing rapidly through North Carolina at the heels of Green. Lee was recalled to join his commander, and Marion continued his partisan warfare in South Carolina. 
He was, after a while, reinforced by Greene on his return to the state and assisted that general greatly in the movements which resulted in imprisoning the enemy in Charleston. After a brilliant affair with the British in conjunction with Lee and Sumter and other bold spirits, he hastened to Greene in time for the Battle of Utah, in which engagement he commanded the right of the South Carolina militia and gallantly sustained the fierce attack of the enemy. Toward the close of the war, he took his seat in the Legislative Assembly, which met at Jacksonboro as the representative of St. John Berkeley. He was engaged in one or two further conflicts with the enemy, and the struggle which he had so manfully sustained was at an end. He now retired to his plantation to find it broken up by the incursions of the British. While engaged in its restoration, he was sent as representative of the district to the Senate of the state. It is recorded to his credit that he displayed in this situation a regular magnanimity toward Tory offenders in preserving their lands from confiscation. It was war then, he said. It is peace now. God has given us the victory. Let us show our gratitude to heaven, which we shall not do by cruelty to man. In the same lofty spirit, he refused to receive any advantages from a bill exempting the soldiers of the militia from prosecution for acts committed in the service. He felt that his conduct needed no shelter. The legislature rewarded him with thanks and the more substantial appointment of Commandant of the Port of Charleston, a nominal office with a salary of 500 pounds, which were cut down to dollars. A timely marriage, however, with a wealthy lady of Huguenot descent, Miss Mary Vidot, a spinster of 50, who was attracted by the hero, relieved him of pecuniary anxieties, leaving him an old age of ease in agricultural pursuits. He still represented his parish in the state senate and sat in 1790 in the convention for forming the Constitution. In 1794, he resigned his military commission given to him by Rutledge and the following year, yielding to a gradual decline, expired on February 27th at the age of 63. Marion was a true, unflinching patriot, a man of deeds and not of words, a prudent, sagacious soldier, not sudden or quick in quarrel, but resolute to the end, a good disciplinarian and beloved by his men who came at his call. There was no power of coercion such as restrains the hired soldier in his little band. It was held together only by the cohesive force of patriotism and attachment to the leader. We hear of no acts of cruelty to stain the glory of his victories, but much of his magnanimity. End of Section 15. Section 16 of Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mason Lewis. Great Men and Famous Women, Volume 2. By Charles F. Horn. Paul Jones, 1747-1792 to 1792. Paul Jones, the popular naval hero of the Revolution, the son of John Paul, a gardener in Scotland, was born July 6, 1747, at a cottage on the estate of his father's employer, Mr. Crake, at Arbigland, in the parish of Kirkbean. His parents belonged to a respectable class of the population of the country, The boy, as is wont with Scottish boys, however humble, received the elements of education, but could not have advanced very far with his books, since we find him, at the age of twelve, apprenticed to the sea. The situation of Kirkbean, on the shore of the Solway, naturally gave a youth of spirit an inclination to life on the ocean, and he had not far to seek for employment in the trading port of Whitehaven, in the opposite county of Cumberland. Paul's first adventure, the appendix of Jones was an afterthought of his career, was in the service of Mr. Younger, a merchant in the American trade, 
who sent his apprentice on a voyage to Virginia, where an elder brother of Paul had profitably established himself at Fredericksburg. This gave him an early introduction to the country with which the fame of the future soldier of fortune was to be especially identified. The apprenticeship of Paul was of short duration. The failure of his employer threw the youth upon his own resources, but he lost no time in taking care of himself. His studies on shipboard had already qualified him for the higher duties of the mercantile service. The slave trade, the active pursuit of those days, offered him an engagement. He sailed for the African coast in the King George, a vessel engaged in this infamous traffic, out of Whitehaven, and in his nineteenth year was trusted as chief mate of the two friends, another vessel of the trade, belonging to Jamaica. Having carried his human cargo to the island, sickening of the pursuit, he sailed as a passenger to Kirkcudbright in his native district. Opportunities are always presenting themselves to the watchful and the initiated. The chief officers of the vessel died of the fever. Paul took command and carried the ship in safety to the owners. They put him in command of the brig, the John, on another West India voyage. Finally, in 1771, he left Scotland never to return to it, save to carry terror among its population. He proceeded to London, found employment in the West India trade, and in 1773 settled himself for a while in Virginia on the estate of his brother, to whom he had now become heir. This was a grand turning point of his career, and to signalize it properly, Paul, who was somewhat of a fanciful turn, added the name Jones to his proper appellation, John Paul. On the organization of the Infant Navy of the United States in 1775, John Paul Jones, as he is henceforth to be called, received the appointment of first of the first lieutenants in the service, in which, in his station on the flagship Alfred, he claimed the honor of being the foremost on the approach of the commander-in-chief, Commodore Hopkins, to raise the new American flag. This was the old device of a rattlesnake coiled on a yellow ground with the motto, Don't Tread on Me, which is yet partially retained in the seal of the war office. The first service of the new squadron was the attack upon the island of New Providence, in which Jones rendered signal assistance. On the return voyage, the unsatisfactory encounter with the Glasgow occurred which afterward resulted in the dismissal of one of the American officers, and Jones's appointment in his place to the command of the Providence of twelve guns and seventy men. His exploits in this vessel gained him his first laurels. He now received the rank of captain, and sailed on various expeditions, transporting troops, conveying merchantmen, outsailing British frigates, and greatly harassing the enemy's commercial interests. His success in these enterprises induced Commodore Hopkins to put him in command of the Alfred and other vessels on an expedition to the eastward, which resulted in the capture of various important prizes of transport and other ships, and extensive injury to the fisheries at Canso. On his return, he was superseded in the command of the Alfred, his seniority in the service being set aside, a grievance which led to remonstrance on his part and a correspondence with the Committee of Congress, in the course of which Jones made many valuable suggestions as to the service, and gained the friendship of that eminent businessman of the old Confederacy, Robert Mortis. There appear to have been several appointments for him in progress, when his somewhat unsettled position became determined by the resolve of Congress to send him to France for the purpose of taking command of a frigate to be provided for him by the commissioners at Paris. By the resolution of June 14, 1777, he was appointed to the Ranger, newly built at Portsmouth, and, a second instance of the kind, had the honor of hoisting, for the first time, the new flag of the Stars and Stripes. He claimed the distinction, for the bristling vanity of Jones made him punctilious in these accidental matters of personal renown. It took some time to prepare the Ranger for sea, but Jones got off on his adventure in November, made a couple of prizes by the way, and at the end of the month reached Nantes. Disappointed in obtaining the large vessel which he expected, and obliged to be contented with the ranger, 
he employed his time in making acquaintance with the French Navy at Quierbon Bay, and offering valuable suggestions for the employment of D'Estaing's fleet on the American coast. He soon determined to put to sea on an adventure of spirit. On April 10, 1778, he sailed from Brest on a cruise in British waters. Directing his course to the haunts of his youth, he captured a brigantine off Cape Clear and a London ship in the Irish Channel, planned various bold adventures on the Irish coast, which he was not able to carry out from adverse influences of wind and tide, but well nigh succeeded in burning a large fleet of merchantmen in the docks of Whitehaven. In this last adventure, he made a landing at night and advanced to the capture of the town batteries, leaving his officers to fire the ships, of which there were about two hundred in the port. His orders were not obeyed, either from insufficient preparations or the relenting of his agents, when he himself set fire to one of the largest vessels. It was now day, and the people were warned by a deserter from his force, but Jones managed to hold the whole town at bay till he made good his retreat. This daring affair was an impromptu of Jones's genius, justified in his view by similar depredations of the British on the American coast, but it had an ugly look of ingratitude to the place which had sheltered his youth and first given him promotion in the world. Nor was this all. He immediately crossed to his native shore of Scotland with the intention of seizing the Earl of Selkirk at his seat on the promontory of St. Mary's Isle, on the Solway, near Kirkcabright. Landing at the spot, he ascertained that the Earl was from home. Disappointed in his object, he would have returned when the officers in his boat insisted upon a demand for the family plate. Jones demurred, but yielded with the proviso that the thing was to be done in the most delicate manner possible. His lieutenant, Simpson, undertook the business and introduced himself to Lady Selkirk, who was, conveniently enough for his purposes, engaged at breakfast. She had at first taken the party for a press gang and had offered them refreshments. On being informed of the nature of their visit, their request, backed by the armed crew at the door, was complied with. It is said that Jones apologized personally to Lady Selkirk, and we shall presently find him, at the interval of leisure, taking measures to repair the act. For the moment, however, he had more serious work on hand. In his voyage along the Irish coast, he had looked into Belfast Lou, after His Majesty's sloop of war Drake, of twenty guns, which he attempted to board in a night attack by a bold maneuver, which came within an ace of success. Immediately after the affair of St. Mary's, he ran across the channel and had the fortune to meet the drake coming out of Carrickfergus. She was getting to sea to check the exploits of the ranger, which had now alarmed the whole region. Jones desired nothing more than an encounter. As the ship drew up, she hailed the ranger. Jones gave the reply through his sailing master. The American Continental Ship Ranger! We are waiting for you. Come on. The sun is a little more than an hour high, and it is time to begin. A broadside engagement commenced, and it continued at close quarters for an hour, when the Drake surrendered. Her captain and first lieutenant were mortally wounded, her sails and rigging terribly cut up, and the hull much shattered. The loss of the ranger was two killed and six wounded, that of the Drake, forty-two. The Drake had two guns the advantage of her adversary. Action took place on April 24th. On May 8th, Jones, having traversed the channel, carried his prize safely into Brest. His first thought now was to make some amends to Lady Selkirk and his own reputation for the plundering visit of his lieutenant. He therefore addressed to her, the very day of his landing, an extraordinary letter. Jones was very fond of letter writing full of high-sounding phrases and professions of gallantry and esteem, in the midst of which he failed not to recite the splendid victory of the ranger. He drew a picture of the terrors inflicted by the British in America, and in respect to that unfortunate plate, expressed his intention to purchase it, in the sale of the prize, and restore it at his own expense to the family. 
This, after delays and obstacles, he finally accomplished some years later, when we are told it was all returned as it was taken, the very tea leaves of the parting breakfast clinging to the teapot. The affair of the ranger, so brilliantly conducted, the short energetic cruise in narrow seas, so near the British naval stations, gave Jones a great reputation for gallantry in Paris. The delays and difficulties, however, incidental to the wretched state of the American finances abroad, and the imperfect relation of his country with the French court, were well calculated to cool any enthusiasm excited by his conquest. A man of less vivacity and perseverance than Jones might have dropped the service. He persevered. His lieutenant, Simpson, after various refractory proceedings, had sailed home in the Ranger, when an arrangement was finally made with Le Ray de Chamont, the negotiator of the French court, to furnish a jointly equipped and officered fleet, of which Jones was to take command. Five vessels were thus provided including the American frigate Alliance. An old India man, the Duke de Duras, fell to the lot of Jones. In compliment to Dr. Franklin, one of the commissioners, and especially in gratitude for a hint which he had accidentally lighted upon in an odd number of that philosopher's almanac, to the effect that whoever would have his business well done must do it himself, a suggestion by which Jones had greatly profited, in giving a final spur to his protracted negotiations, he changed the name of his vessel, by permission of the French government, to the Bonhomme Richard. Jones at length set sail on August 14th with his squadron. Landais, an incompetent Frenchman in the American service, was in command of the Alliance. It was altogether a weak mongrel affair. The Bonhomme Richard was unseaworthy. Her armament was defective and in her motley crew Englishmen and foreigners outnumbered the Americans. The plan of the cruise was to sail round the British islands from the westward. At Cape Clear the commander parted with two of the smaller vessels of the squadron, which now consisted of his own ship, the Alliance, the Pallas, and the Vengeance. The service was, however, far more impaired by the insubordination of Landais, who evinced great jealousy of his superior. Several prizes were taken, one of them by Jones off Cape Wrath at the extremity of Scotland. Traversing the eastern coast, he arrived with the Paulus and the Vengeance at the Firth of Forth, and entertained the bold idea of attacking the armed vessels at the station, and putting not only Leith, but possibly the capital Edinburgh itself, under contribution. He would certainly have made the attempt. Indeed, it was in full progress when it was defeated by a violent gale of wind. Jones now continued his course southwardly, casting longing eyes upon Hull and Newcastle, when, having been joined by the Alliance, the squadron suddenly, a Flamborough head, fell in with the Baltic cruisers, Therapies, 44, Captain Pearson and the Countess of Scarborough, 20, Captain Piercy convoying a fleet of merchantmen. Jones at once prepared for action, the combat which ensued between the Serapes and the Bonhomme Richard is one of the most remarkable in the annals of naval warfare. For the circumstances under which it was fought, the persistence of the contest, and the well-matched valor of the commanders. The engagement was by moonlight on a tranquil sea within sight of the shore which was crowded with spectators who thronged the promontory of Flamborough Head and the piers of Scarborough. After various preliminary maneuvers on the part of the English commander to shelter the merchantmen, the engagement began at half-past seven in the evening, with a series of attempts of the Bonhomme Richard to come to close quarters with her antagonist. The first broadside of Jones's vessel, two of the old eighteen-pounders mounted in her gunroom burst with fearful destruction to the men. This accident compelled the closing of the lower ports, and produced a still greater inequality between the combatants than at the start. For the Serapes was not only a well-constructed, well-furnished man-of-war, thoroughly equipped, while the Bonhomme Richard had even disadvantage in these respects, but the absolute weight of metal was, at the outset, greatly in favor of the Englishman. 
The Richard then passed to windward of the Serapes, receiving her fire, which did much damage to the rotten hull of the old Indiaman. Jones next attempted a movement to get into position to rake his antagonist from stern to stern, which resulted in a momentary collision. There was an effort to board the Serapes, which was repulsed, when Captain Pearson called out, "'Has your ship struck?' Jones instantly replied, "'I have not yet begun to fight!' The ships then separating were brought again to a broadside encounter, when Jones, feeling the superior force of the Serapes, and her better sailing, was fully prepared to take advantage of the next position, as the ships fell foul of one another, to grapple with his opponent. He himself assisted in lashing the jib-stay of the Serapes, to the mizzen mass of the Richard. The ships became now closely entangled for their full length on their starboard sides. So near were they together that the guns of one touched the sides of the other, and in some places, where the portholes met, the guns were loaded by passing the rammers into the opposite vessel. Every discharge in this position was, of course, most deadly, and told fearfully upon the rotten hole of the Richard. To add to Jones's embarrassment, he was repeatedly fired upon by Landice from the Alliance, which always kept her position with the Richard between her and the enemy. This extraordinary circumstance is only to be accounted for by an entire lack of presence of mind in the confusion, or by absolute treachery. The Serapis poured in her fire below from a full battery, while the Richard was confined to three guns on her deck. She had efficient aid, however, in clearing the deck of the Serapis, from the musketry and hand grenades of her men in the tops. One of these missiles reached the lower gun deck of the Serapis, and there, setting fire to a quantity of exposed cartridges, produced a destruction of life an offset to the fearful loss of the Richard by the bursting of her guns in the opening of the engagement. The injury to the Richard, from the wounds inflicted upon her hull, was at this time so great that she was pronounced to be sinking, and there was a cry among the men of surrender, not, however, from Jones, who was as much himself at this extremity as ever. Seeing the English prisoners who had been released below, more than a hundred in number, rushing upon deck, where in a moment they might have leaped into the Serapes and put themselves under then country's flag, he coolly set them to working the pumps to save the sinking ship. Human courage and resolution have seldom been more severely tried than in the exigencies of this terrible night on board the Richard. Jones continued to ply his feeble cannonade from the deck, leveled at the mainmast of the adversary. Both vessels were on fire, when, at half-past ten, the Serapis struck. The loss in this extraordinary engagement, which outstrips and exaggerates the usual vicissitudes of naval service, was, of course, fearful. The entire loss of the Richard is estimated by Cooper at 150, nearly one half of all the men she had engaged. Captain Pearson reported at least 117 casualties. The Bon Homme Richard was so riddled by the enemy's fire and disemboweled by the gunroom explosion, that she could not be saved from sinking. When the wind freshened the day after the victory, she became no longer tenable. Her living freight was taken from her, and Jones, in the forenoon of the 25th, with inexpressible grief, saw her final plunge into the depths of the ocean. While the engagement of the Richard and Serapis was going on, the Pallas, better officered than the Alliance, captured the other English vessel, the Countess of Scarborough. Two prizes were carried to the Texel, where the squadron enjoyed the uneasy protection of Holland. Jones himself had a more satisfactory reception in an enthusiastic greeting on the exchange at Amsterdam, and a brilliant triumph illuminated by the smiles of the fair sex shortly after in Paris. In October 1780, he left for America in the Ariel, bearing with him a gift from the king, a gold-mounted sword, with the inscription on the blade, Vindicati Maris Ludovicus XVI, Renumerator Strenuo Vindici, Louis XVI Rewarder to the Valiant Defender of a Liberated Sea. The voyage was interrupted at its outset by a severe storm off the harbor, in which Jones displayed his usual heroism. The vessel was refitted, and after a particular action on the high seas with a mysterious stranger, reached Philadelphia in February 1781. 
In 1787, he left America with the intention of serving under Louis. When he reached Paris, he was met by a proposition to enter the service of Catherine of Russia, in which he was induced to engage by prospects of rank and glory. On his journey to St. Petersburg, he had a characteristic adventure in his passage from Stockholm to Ravel, which he made while the navigation was interrupted by ice, traversing the sea with great hardihood in an open boat, extorting the labors of the boatmen by his threats of violence. He was well received by the empress, who forwarded him to Potemkin, then in command on the Black Sea in a war with the Turks. It is not necessary to recount the movements of a small squadron, with a divided command and jealous councils, presided over by a whimsical, despotic court favorite. Many as were the vexations encountered by Jones in the inefficient resources, the shifts and expeditions of foreign allies, and the straits of the American commissioners, were light compared with the stifling restraints of Russian tyranny. Jones did much fighting in his command of the Wolodomer on the Black Sea against the Pasha, but retired with little glory. Persecution followed at St. Petersburg. There was an assault upon his moral character, which was triumphantly disproved. Various projects flitted through his teeming mind. Connection with the country closed after a residence of 15 months. It is sad to watch the last years of Paul Jones, not indeed of age, but of growing weariness and disease, as he renews his broken Russian hopes and revives the old, faded, pecuniary claims on the French court. A gleam of sunshine appears in his aspirations to serve his country, for he still looked across the Atlantic in the removal of the chains from the American sailors imprisoned at Algiers. His country listened to his cry, but he was charged to treat with the regency for their ransom. But before the commission reached him, he had passed to that land where the weary cease from sighing and prisoners are at rest. Here, with mercy bending over the scene, let the curtain fall. Paul Jones died at Paris at the age of 45 of a dropsical affection, July 18, 1792. The person of Paul Jones is well known by the numerous prints devoted to his brilliant exploits. You will see him, a little active man of medium height, not robust, but vigorous, a keen black eye, lighting a dark, weather-beaten visage, compact and determined, with a certain melancholy grace. He was one of nature's self-made men. That is, nature gave the genius and he supplied the industry, for he knew how to labor, and must have often exerted himself to secure the attainments which he possessed. He was a good seaman, as well as a most gallant officer, sagacious in the application of means, vain indeed and expensive, but natural and generous, something of a poet in verse, much more in the quickness and vivacity of his imagination, which led him to plan nobly. Accomplished writer, and as he was found worthy of the warm and unchanging friendship of Franklin, that sage who sought for excellence, while he looked with a kindly eye upon human infirmity, we too may pursue the virtues of the man and smile upon his frailties. End of section 16